Section 1 of Lies of the Queens of England, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Elizabeth, Second Queen Regnant of England and Ireland. Chapter 1, Part 1. We now come to the most distinguished name in the annals of female royalty, that of the great Elizabeth, Second Queen Regnant of England. The romantic circumstances of her birth, the vicissitudes of her childhood, and the lofty spirit with which she bore herself, amidst the storms and perils that darkened over her during her sister's reign, invested her with almost poetic interest as a royal heroine, before her title to the regal succession was ratified by the voice of a generous people, and the brilliant success of her government, during a long reign, surrounded her maiden diadem with a blaze of glory which has rendered her the most popular of our monarchs, and blinded succeeding generations to her faults. It is not, perhaps, the most gracious office in the world to perform, with strict impartiality, the duty of a faithful biographer to a princess so endeared to national pride as Elizabeth, and to examine, by the cold calm light of truth, the flaws which mar the bright ideal of Spencer's Gloriana and Shakespeare's fair vestal throne by the West. Like the wise and popular Augustus Caesar, Elizabeth understood the importance of acquiring the good will of that class, whose friendship or enmity goes far to decide the fortunes of princes. The might of her throne was supported by the pens of the master spirits of the age. Very different might have been the records of her reign, if the reasoning powers of Bacon, the eloquence of Sidney, the poetic talents of Spencer, the wit of Harrington, and the genius of Shakespeare, had been arrayed against her, instead of combining to represent her as the impersonification of all earthly perfection, scarcely, indeed, short of divinity. It has truly been said, however, that no man is a hero to his valet de chambre, and it is impossible to enter into the personal history of England's Elizabeth without showing that she occasionally forgot the dignity of the heroine among her ladies-in-waiting, and indulged in follies which the youngest of her maids of honor would have blushed to imitate. The web of her life was a glittering tissue, in which good and evil were strangely mingled, and as the evidences of friend and foe are woven together, without reference to the prejudices of either, or any object than to show her as she was, the lights and shades must sometimes appear in strong and even painful opposition to each other, for such are the inconsistencies of human nature, such the littlenesses of human greatness. Queen Elizabeth first saw the light at Greenwich Palace, the favorite abode of her royal parents, Henry the Eighth and Anne Boleyn. Her birth was thus quaintly but prettily recorded by the contemporary historian, Hall. On the seventh day of September, being Sunday, between three and four o'clock in the afternoon, the queen was delivered of a fair lady, on which day the Duke of Norfolk came home to the christening. The apartment in which she was born was hung with tapestry representing the history of holy virgins, and was from that circumstance called the Chamber of the Virgins. When the queen, her mother, who had eagerly anticipated a son, was told that she had given birth to a daughter, she endeavored, with ready tact, to attach adventitious importance to her infant, by saying to the ladies in attendance, They may now, with reason, call this room the Chamber of Virgins, for a virgin is now born in it on the vigil of that auspicious day on which the church commemorates the nativity of the Virgin Mary. Haywood, though a zealous eulogist of the Protestant principles of Elizabeth, intimates that she was under the especial patronage of the Blessed Virgin from the hour of her birth, and for that cause, devoted to a maiden life. The Lady Elizabeth, says he, was born on the eve of the Virgin's nativity, and died on the eve of the Virgin's Annunciation, even that she is now in heaven with all those blessed virgins that had oil in their lamps. Notwithstanding the bitter disappointment felt by King Henry at the sex of the infant, a solemn te deum was sung in honor of her birth, and the preparations for her christening were made with no less magnificence 
than if his hopes had been gratified by the birth of a male heir to the crown. The solemnization of that sacred rite was appointed to take place on Wednesday, the 10th of September, the fourth day after the birth of the infant princess. On that day, the Lord Mayor, with the Aldermen and the Council of the City of London, dined together at one o'clock, and then, in obedience to their summons, took boat in their chains and robes, and rode to Greenwich, where many lords, knights, and gentlemen were assembled to witness the royal ceremonial. All the walls between Greenwich Palace and the convent of the Grey Friars were hung with arras and the way strewn with green rushes. The church was likewise hung with arras. Gentlemen with aprons and towels about their necks guarded the font, which stood in the middle of the church. It was of silver and raised to the height of three steps, and over it was a square canopy of crimson satin, fringed with gold. About it, a space railed in, covered with red say. Between the choir and the chancel, a closet with a fire had been prepared lest the infant should take cold in being disrobed for the font. When all these things were ready, the child was brought into the hall of the palace, and the procession set out to the neighboring church of the Grey Friars, of which building no vestige now remains at Greenwich. The procession began with the lowest ranks. The citizens two and two led the way, then gentlemen, esquires, and chaplains, a gradation of precedence, rather decidedly marked, of the three first ranks, whose distinction is by no means definite in the present times. After them the aldermen, and the lord mayor by himself, then the privy council in robes, then the peers and prelates, followed by the earl of Essex, who bore the gilt-covered basins, then the Marquis of Exeter, with the taper of virgin wax. Next the Marquis of Dorset, bearing the salt, and the Lady Mary of Norfolk, the betrothed of the young Duke of Richmond, carrying the chrism, which was very rich, with pearls and gems. Lastly came the royal infant, in the arms of her great-grandmother, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, under a stately canopy which was supported by the uncle of the babe, George Boleyn, Lord Rockford the lords William and Thomas Howard, the maternal kindred of the mother, and Lord Hussey, a newly made lord of the Boleyn blood. The babe was wrapped in a mantle of purple velvet, with a train of regal length, furred with ermine, which was duly supported by the Countess of Kent, assisted by the Earl of Wiltshire, the grandfather of the little princess, and the Earl of Derby. On the right of the infant marched its great-uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, with his martial staff, on the other, the Duke of Suffolk. The Bishop of London, who performed the ceremony, received the infant at the church door of the Grey Friars, assisted by a great company of bishops and mitred abbots, and with all the rites of the Church of Rome, this future great Protestant queen received the name of her grandmother, Elizabeth of York. Cramner, Archbishop of Canterbury, was her godfather, and the Duchess of Norfolk and Marchioness of Dorset, her godmothers. After Elizabeth had received her name, Garter King-at-Arms cried aloud, God of his infinite goodness, send a prosperous life and long to the high and mighty princess of England, Elizabeth. Then a flourish of trumpets sounded, and the royal child was born to the altar. The gospel was read over her, and she was confirmed by Cramner, who, with the other sponsors, presented the christening gifts. He gave her a standing cup of gold, the Duchess of Norfolk, a cup of gold fretted with pearls, being completely unconscious of the chemical antipathy between the acidity of wine and the misplaced pearls. The Marchioness of Dorset gave three gilt bowls, pounced with a cover, and the Marchioness of Exeter, three standing bowls, graven and gilt, with covers. Then were brought in wafers, confits and hippocrats, in such abundance that the company had as much as could be desired. The homeward procession was lighted on its way to the palace, with five hundred staff torches, which were carried by the yeomen of the guard and the king's servants, but the infant herself was surrounded by gentlemen bearing wax flambeaux. The procession returned in the same order that it went out, save that four noble gentlemen carried the sponsor's gifts before the child, with trumpets flourishing all the way preceding them, till they came to the door of the queen's chamber. The king commanded the Duke of Norfolk to thank the Lord Mayor and citizens heartily in his name for their attendance, and after they had powerfully refreshed themselves in the royal cellar, they betook themselves to their barges. 
the queen was desirous of nourishing her infant daughter from her own bosom but henry with his characteristic selfishness forbade it lest the frequent presence of the little princess in the chamber of her royal mother should be attended with inconvenience to himself he appointed for elizabeth's nurse the wife of a gentleman named hocart whom he afterwards ennobled and he invested the duchess dowager of norfolk with the office of state governess to the new-born babe giving her for a residence the fair mansion and all the rich furniture which he had bestowed on anne boleyn when he created her marchioness of pembroke with a salary of six thousand crowns the lady margaret bryan whose husband sir thomas bryan was a kinsman of queen anne boleyn was preferred to the office of governess and ordinary to elizabeth as she had formerly been to the princess mary she was called the lady mistress elizabeth passed the first two months of her life at greenwich palace with the queen her mother and during that period she was frequently taken for an airing to eltham for the benefit of her health on the second of december she was the subject of the following order in council the king's highness hath appointed that the lady princess elizabeth almost three months old shall be taken from hence towards hatfield upon wednesday next week that on wednesday night she is to lie and repose at the house of the earl of rutland at enfield and the next day to be conveyed to hatfield and there to remain with such household as the king's highness has established for the same hertford castle was first named but scratched through and changed to hatfield a few weeks afterwards she became in virtue of the act of parliament which settled the succession in default of heirs male to henry the eighth on the female issue of that monarch by anne boleyn the heiress presumptive to the throne and her disinherited sister the princess mary was compelled to yield precedency to her soon after this change in the prospects of the unconscious babe she was removed to the palace of the bishop of winchester at chelsea on whom the charge of herself and her extensive nursery appointments were thrust when she was thirteen months old she was weaned and the preliminaries for this important business were arranged between the officers of her household and the cabinet ministers of her august sire with as much solemnity as if the fate of empires had been involved in the matter the following passages are extracted from a letter from sir william pollett to cromwell on this subject the king's grace well considering the letter directed to you from my lady brian and other my lady princess's officers his grace with the assent of the queen's grace hath fully determined the weaning of my lady princess to be done with all diligence he proceeds to state that the little princess is to have the whole of any one of the royal residences thought best for her and that consequently he has given orders for langley to be put in order for her and her suite which orders he adds this messenger hath withal a letter from the queen's grace to my lady brian and that his grace and the queen's grace doth well and be merry and all theirs thanks be to god from sarum october ninth scarcely was this nursery affair of state accomplished before henry exerted his paternal care in seeking to provide the royal weanling with a suitable consort by entering into a negotiation with francis i of france for a union between this infant princess and the duke of angoulême the third son of that monarch henry proposed that the young duke should be educated in england and stipulated that he should hold the duchy of angoulême independently of the french crown in the event of his coming to the crown of england through his marriage with elizabeth the project of educating the young french prince who was selected for the husband of the presumptive heiress of england according to the manners and customs of the realm of which she might hereafter become the sovereign was a sagacious idea but henry clogged the matrimonial treaty with conditions which it was out of the power of the king of france to ratify and it proved abortive the tragic events which rendered elizabeth motherless in her third year and degraded her from the lofty position in which she had been placed by the unjust and short-lived paternal fondness of her capricious father have been fully detailed in the memoir of her unhappy mother anne boleyn by the sentence which cranmer had passed on the marriage of her parents and her own birth elizabeth was branded with the stigma of illegitimacy and that she was for a time exposed to the sort of neglect and contempt 
which is too often the lot of children to whom that reproach applies, is evidenced by the following letter from Lady Bryan to Cromwell, imploring for a supply of necessary raiment for the innocent babe who had been so cruelly involved in her mother's fall. My Lord, after my most bounden duty, I recommend me to your good lordship, beseeching you to be good lord to me, now in the greatest need that ever was, for it hath pleased God to take them from me, that was my greatest comfort in this world, to my great heaviness. Yesu have mercy on my soul, and now I am succorless, and as a redless, or without redress, creature, but only from the great trust which I have in the king's grace, and your good lordship, for now in you I put all my whole trust of comfort in this world, beseeching you to, blank, me that I do so. My lord, when your lordship was last here, it pleased you to say that I should not mistrust the king's grace, nor your lordship. Which word was more comfort to me than I can write, as God knoweth? And now it boldeth, or emboldens me, to show you my poor mind. My lord, when my lady Mary's grace was born, it pleased the king's grace to appoint me lady mistress, and made me a baroness, and so I have been governess to the children his grace have had since. Now it is so, my lady Elizabeth is put from that degree she was afore, and what degree she is at of now, I know not, but by hearsay. Therefore I know not how to order her, nor myself, nor none of hers that I have the rule of, that as her women and grooms, I beseech you to be good lord to my lady, and to all hers, and that she may have some raiment. Here Stripe has interpolated a query for mourning. There is nothing of the kind implied in the original. If Stripe had consulted any female on the articles enumerated, he would have found that few indeed of them, indeed were requisite for mourning. The list shows the utter destitution the young princess had been suffered to fall into, in regard to clothes, either by the neglect of her mother, or because Anne Boleyn's power of aiding her child had been circumscribed long before her fall. Let any lady used to the nursery read over the list of the poor child's wants, represented by her faithful governess, and consider that a twelve-month must have elapsed since she had a new supply. She, continues Lady Bryan, hath neither gown nor kirtle or slip, nor petticoat, nor no manner of linen, nor forsmocks or day chemises, nor kerchiefs, nor rails or night-dresses, nor body stitchets or corsets, nor handkerchiefs, nor sleeves, nor mufflers, or mob-caps, nor biggins, or nightcaps. All these her grace must take. I have driven off as long as I can, that by my troth I can drive it off no longer. Beseeching you, my lord, that ye will see that her grace may have that which is needful for her, as my trust is that you will do. Beseeching ye, mine own good lord, that I may know from you, by writing, how I shall order myself, and what is the king's grace's pleasure and yours, and that I shall do in everything? And whatsoever it shall please the king's grace, or your lordship to command me at all times, I shall fulfill it to the best of my power. My lord, Mr. Shelton, a kinsman of Anne Boleyn, said he be master of this house. What fashion that may be, I cannot tell, for I have not seen it afore. My lord, ye be so honourable yourself, and every man reporteth that your lordship loveth honour, that I trust you will see the house honourably ordered, as it ever hath been aforetime. And if it please you that I may know what your order is, and if it be not performed, I shall certify your lordship of it. For I fear me it will be hardly enough performed. But if the head, evidently Shelton, knew what your honour meaneth, it will be the better ordered, if not, it will be hard to bring to pass. My lord, Mr. Shelton would have my lady Elizabeth to dine and sup every day at the board of estate. Alas, my lord, it is not meet for a child of her age to keep such rule yet. I promise you, my lord, I dare not take it upon me to keep her grace in health, and she keep that rule. For there she shall see divers meats and fruits and wine, which it would be hard for me to restrain her grace from. Ye know, my lord, there is no place of correction there, and she is yet too young to correct greatly. I know well, and she be there, I shall neither bring her up to the king's grace's honour, 
nor hers, nor to her health, nor to my poor honesty. Wherefore I shall show your lordship this my desire, beseeching you, my lord, that my lady may have a mess of meat at her own lodging, with a good dish or two that is meat, or fit, for her grace to eat of, and the reversion of the mess shall satisfy all her women, a gentleman usher, and a groom, which be eleven persons on her side. Sure am I it will be as great profit to the king's grace this way, namely, to the economy of the arrangement, as the other way. For if all this should be set abroad, they must have three or four messes of meat, whereas this one mess shall suffice them all, with bread and drink, according as my lady Mary's grace had afore, and to be ordered in all things as her grace was afore. God knoweth my lady Elizabeth, hath great pain with her great teeth, and they come very slowly forth, which causeth me to suffer her grace to have her will more than I would. I trust to God and her teeth were well graft, to have her grace after another fashion than she is yet, so as I trust the king's grace shall have great comfort in her grace. For she is as toward a child, and as gentle of conditions, as ever I knew any in my life. Yes, you preserve her grace." as for a day or two at a high time meaning a high festival or whensoever it shall please the king's grace to have her set abroad or shown in public i trust so to endeavour me that she shall so do as shall be to the king's honour and hers and then after to take her ease again that is notwithstanding the sufferings of the young elizabeth with her teeth if the king wishes to exhibit her for a short time in public Lady Bryan will answer for her discreet behavior, but after the drilling requisite for such ceremonial, it will be necessary for her to revert to the unconstrained playfulness of childhood. Lady Bryan concludes with this remark. I think Mr. Shelton will not be content with this. He need not know it is my desire, but that it is the king's pleasure and yours that it should be so. Good, my lord, have my lady's grace, and us that be her poor servants, in your remembrance, and your lordship shall have our hearty prayers, by the grace of Yesu, who ever preserve your lordship with long life, and as much honor as your noble heart can desire, from Hunsdon, with the evil hand, or bad writing, of her who is your daily bead-woman, Margaret Bryan. I beseech you, mine own good lord, be not miscontent that I am so bold to write thus to your lordship, but I take God to my judge, I do it of true heart, and for my discharge, beseeching you, accept my good mind, endorse to the right noble and my singular good lord, my lord privy seal, be this delivered. This letter affords some insight into the domestic politics of the nursery palace of Hunsdon at this time. It shows that the infant Elizabeth proved a point of controversy between the two principal officials there, Margaret Lady Bryan and Mr. Shelton, both placed in authority by the recently immolated Queen Anne Boleyn, and both related to her family. Her aunt had married the head of the Shelton or Skelton family in Norfolk, and this officer at Hunsdon was probably a son of that lady, and consequently a near kinsman of the infant Elizabeth. He insisted that she should dine and sup at a state table where her infant importunity for wine, fruit, and high-seasoned food could not conveniently be restrained by her sensible governess, Lady Bryan. Shelton probably wished to keep regal state as long as possible round the descendant of the Boleyns, and, in that time of sudden change in royal destinies, had perhaps an eye to ingratiate himself with the infant by appearing in her company twice every day, and indulging her by the gratification of her palate with mischievous dainties. Lady Bryan was likewise connected with the Boleyn family, not so near as the Sheltons, but near enough to possess interest with Queen Anne Boleyn, to whom she owed her office as governess or lady mistress, to the infant Elizabeth. There can scarcely exist a doubt that her lamentations and invocation for the soul of the same person lately departed, by whose death she was left succorless, referred to the recent death of Anne Boleyn. It is evident that if Lady Bryan had not conformed to King Henry's version of the Catholic religion, she would not have been in authority at Hunsdon, where she was abiding not only with her immediate charge, the Princess Elizabeth, but with the disinherited Princess Mary. 
Further, there may be observed a striking harmony between the expressions of this lady and those of the Princess Mary, who appealed to her father's paternal feelings in behalf of her sister, the infant Elizabeth, a few weeks later, almost in the same words used by Lady Bryan in this letter. A coincidence which proves unity of purpose between the governess and the Princess Mary regarding the motherless child. Much of the future greatness of Elizabeth may reasonably be attributed to the judicious training of her sensible and conscientious governess, combined with the salutary adversity, which deprived her of the pernicious pomp and luxury that had surrounded her cradle while she was treated as the heiress of England. The first public action of Elizabeth's life was her carrying the chrism of her infant brother, Edward the Sixth, at the christening solemnity of that prince. She was born in the arms of the Earl of Hertford, brother of the Queen, her stepmother, when the assistants in the ceremonial approached the font. But when they left the chapel, the train of her little grace, just four years old, was supported by Lady Herbert, the sister of Catherine Parr, as, led by the hand of her elder sister, the Princess Mary, she walked with mimic dignity, in the returning procession, to the chamber of the dying queen. At that period, the royal ceremonials of Henry the Eighth's court were blended with circumstances of wonder and tragic excitement, and strange and passing sad it must have been, to see the child of the murdered queen, Anne Boleyn, framing her innocent lips to lisp the name of mother to her, for whose sake she had been rendered motherless, and branded with the stigma of illegitimacy. In all probability, the little Elizabeth knelt to her, as well as to her cruel father, to claim a benediction in her turn, after the royal pair had proudly bestowed their blessing on the newly baptized prince, whose christening was so soon to be followed by the funeral of the queen his mother. It was deemed an especial mark of the favor of her royal father, that Elizabeth was considered worthy of the honor of being admitted to keep company with the young prince, her brother. She was four years older than he, and having been well trained and gently nurtured herself, was better able, says Haywood, to teach and direct him, even from the first of his speech and understanding. Cordial and entire was the affection betwixt this brother and sister, insomuch that he no sooner began to know her, but he seemed to acknowledge her, and she, being of more maturity, as deeply loved him. On the second anniversary of Edward's birth, when the nobles of England presented gifts of silver and gold and jewels to the infant heir of the realm, the Lady Elizabeth's grace gave the simple offering of a shirt of cambric worked by her own hands. She was then six years old. Thus early was this illustrious lady instructed in the feminine accomplishment of needlework and directed to turn her labors in that way to a pleasing account. From her cradle, Elizabeth was a child of the fairest promise and possessed the art of attracting the regard of others. Rodesley, who visited the two princesses when they were together at Hertford Castle, December 17, 1539, was greatly impressed with the precocious understanding of the young Elizabeth, of whom he gives the pretty account. I went then to my lady Elizabeth's grace, and to the same made his majesty's most hearty commendations, declaring that his highness desired to hear of her health, and sent his blessing. She gave humble thanks, inquiring after his majesty's welfare, and that with as great a gravity as she had been forty years old. If she be no worse educated than she now appeareth to me, she will prove of no less honor than beseemeth her father's daughter, whom the Lord long preserve. The feelings of jealous dislike, which the Princess Mary naturally felt towards her infant rival, were gradually subdued by the endearing caresses of the innocent child, when they became sisters in adversity. When Mary again incurred the displeasure of her capricious sire, and was forbidden to come within a certain distance of the court, Elizabeth became once more the associate of her little brother's sports, and afterwards shared his studies. The early predilection of these royal children for their learning was remarkable. As soon as it was light, they called for their books, so welcome, says Haywood, were their ore matunite that they seemed to prevent the nice repose for the entertainment of the morrow's schooling. They took no less delight in the practice of their religious exercises and the study of the scriptures, to which their first hours were exclusively devoted. The rest of the forenoon, continues our author, 
breakfast alone excepted they were instructed in languages and science or moral learning collected out of such authors as did best conduce to the instruction of princes and when he was called out to his more active exercises in the open air she betook herself to her lute or viol and when wearied with that employed her time in needlework on the marriage of the king her father with anne of cleves in fifteen forty the young elizabeth expressed the most ardent desire to see the new queen and to be permitted to pay her the homage of a daughter when her governess made this request in the name of her royal pupil to the king he is said to have replied that she had had a mother so different from the queen that she ought not to wish to see her but she had his permission to write to her majesty on which the following letter probably the first ever written by elizabeth was addressed by her to her new stepmother madam i am struggling between two contending wishes one is my impatient desire to see your majesty the other that of rendering the obedience i owe to the commands of the king my father which prevent me from leaving my house till he has given me full permission to do so but i hope that i shall be able shortly to gratify both these desires in the meantime i entreat your majesty to permit me to show by this billet the zeal with which i devote my respect to you as my queen and my entire obedience to you as my mother i am too young and feeble to have power to do more than to felicitate you with all my heart in this commencement of your marriage i hope that your majesty will have as much good will for me as i have zeal for your service this letter is without date or signature and letty who rarely gives his authorities does not explain the source whence it was derived but there is no reason to dispute its authenticity he tells us that anne of cleves when she saw elizabeth was charmed with her beauty wit and endearing caresses that she conceived the most tender affection for her and when the conditions of her divorce were arranged she requested as a great favor that she might be permitted to see her sometimes adding that to have had that young princess for her daughter would have been greater happiness to her than being queen the paternal pride of henry was gratified at this avowal and he agreed that she should see elizabeth as often as she wished provided that she was only addressed by her as the lady anne of cleves elizabeth found no less favor in the eyes of her new stepmother the young and beautiful catherine howard who being cousin german of her unhappy mother anne boleyn took the young princess under her especial protection and treated her with every mark of tenderness and consideration on the day that she was publicly acknowledged by henry as his queen she directed that the princess elizabeth should be placed opposite to her at table because she was of her own blood and lineage it was also observed that at all the feats and public shows which took place in the honor of her marriage with the king queen catherine gave the lady elizabeth the place of honor nearest to her own person saying that she was her cousin it was supposed that this partial stepmother intended to use her powerful influence with the king for the repeal of the act of parliament which had pronounced elizabeth to be illegitimate and thus she would have been given a second time the preference to her elder sister in the succession notwithstanding the favor which was shown to elizabeth by the howard queen she was always entreating the king her father to allow her to remain with the lady anne of cleves for whom she ever manifested a very sincere regard the attachments formed by elizabeth in childhood and early youth were of an ardent and enduring character as will be hereafter shown after the disgrace and death of queen catherine howard elizabeth resided chiefly with her sister mary at havering bower in the summer of fifteen forty three she was present when mary gave audience to the imperial ambassadors she was then ten years old soon after king henry offered her hand to the earl of arran for his son in order to win his co-operation in his darling project of uniting the crowns of england and scotland by a marriage between the infant queen mary stuart and his son prince edward perhaps the scottish earl did not give henry credit for the sincerity of a proposal so derogatory to the dignity of the princess elizabeth for he paid little attention to this extraordinary offer and espoused the interest of the french court according to marillac henry had previously mentioned his intention of espousing elizabeth to the infant of portugal 
but all henry's matrimonial schemes for his children were doomed to remain unfulfilled and elizabeth instead of being sacrificed in her childhood in some political marriage had the good fortune to complete a most superior education under the auspices of the good and learned catherine parr henry's sixth queen and her fourth stepmother catherine parr was well acquainted with elizabeth before she became queen and greatly admired her wit and manners on her marriage with the king she induced him to send for the young princess to court and to give her an apartment in the palace of whitehall contiguous to her own and bestowed particular attention on all her comforts according to letty elizabeth expressed her acknowledgments in the following letter madam the affection that you have testified in wishing that i should be suffered to be with you in the court and requesting this of the king my father with so much earnestness is a proof of your goodness so great a mark of your tenderness for me obliges me to examine myself a little to see if i can find anything in me that can merit it but i can find nothing but a great zeal and devotion to the service of your majesty but as that zeal has not yet been called into action so as to manifest itself i see that it is only the greatness of soul in your majesty which makes you do me this honor and this redoubles my zeal towards your majesty i can assure you also that my conduct will be such that you shall never have cause to complain of having done me the honor of calling me to you at least i will make it my constant care that i do nothing but with a design to show always my obedience and respect i await with much impatience the orders of the king my father for accomplishment of the happiness for which i sigh and i remain with much submission your majesty's very dear elizabeth there is no date to this letter, and as Elizabeth certainly was present at the nuptials of her royal father with Catherine Parr, it is more probable that it was written after the return of Henry and Catherine from their bridal progress, as she addresses the latter by her regal title. Elizabeth at that time was a child of extraordinary acquirements, to which were added some personal beauty and very graceful manners she had wit at command and sufficient discretion to understand when and where she might display it those who knew her best were accustomed to say of her that god who had endowed her with such rare gifts had certainly destined her to some distinguished employment in the world at the age of twelve she was considerably advanced in sciences which rarely indeed at that era formed part of the education of princesses she understood the principles of geography architecture the mathematics and astronomy and astonished all her instructors by the facility with which she acquired knowledge her handwriting was beautiful and her skill in languages remarkable hensner the german traveller mentions having seen a little volume in the royal library at whitehall written by queen elizabeth when a child in french on vellum it was thus inscribed à très haut et très puissant et redouté prince henri viii de ce nom roi d'angleterre de france et d'irlande défenseur de la foi elisabeth sa très humble fille rend salut et obédience among the royal manuscripts in the british museum is a small volume in an embroidered binding consisting of prayers and meditations selected from different english writers by queen catherine parr and translated and copied by the princess elizabeth in latin french and italian the volume is dedicated to queen catherine parr and her initials r k p are introduced in the binding between those of the savior wrought in blue silk and silver thread by the hand of elizabeth it is dated hertford december twentieth fifteen forty five camden also mentions a godly meditation of the soul concerning love towards christ our lord translated by elizabeth from french her master for the italian language was castiglione like her elder sister the princess mary she was an accomplished latin scholar and astonished some of the most erudite linguists of that age by the ease and grace with which she conversed in that language french italian spanish and flemish she both spoke and wrote with the same facility as her native tongue she was fond of poetry and sometimes made verses that were not devoid of merit but she only regarded this as the amusement of her leisure hours 
bestowing more of her time and attention on the study of history than anything else. To this early predilection, she probably owed her future greatness as a sovereign. Accomplishments may well be dispensed with in the education of princes, but history is the true science for royal students, and they should early be accustomed to reflect and draw moral and philosophical deductions from the rise and fall of nations, and to trace the causes that have led to the calamities of sovereigns in every age, for neither monarchs nor statesmen can be fitted for the purposes of government unless they have acquired the faculty of reading the future by the lamp of the past. Elizabeth was indefatigable in her pursuit of this queenly branch of knowledge, to which she devoted three hours a day, and read works in all languages, that afforded information on the subject. It was, however, in this predilection alone, that she betrayed the ambition which formed the leading trait of her character. While thus fitting herself in her childhood for the throne, which as yet she viewed through a vista far remote, she endeavored to conceal her object by the semblance of the most perfect humility, and affecting a love for the leisure and quiet of private life. End of section one. Section two of Lives of the Queens of England, volume six, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 1, Part 2 In the treaty between Henry the Eighth and the Emperor Charles, in 1545, there was a proposal to unite Elizabeth in marriage to Philip of Spain, who afterwards became the consort of her elder sister Mary. The negotiation came to nothing. The name of Elizabeth was hateful to Charles V as the child of Anne Boleyn. During the last illness of the king, her father, Elizabeth chiefly resided at Hatfield House, with the young prince, her brother, whose especial darling she was. It is said she shared the instruction which he there received from his learned preceptors, Sir John Cheek, Dr. Cox, and Sir Anthony Cook. Elizabeth, after her accession to the throne, made Cox Bishop of Eli, and bestowed great favor on Cook and his learned daughters, Lady Bacon and Lady Burley. They were the companions of her youth, and afterwards the wives of two of her most esteemed ministers of state. The tender love that endeared Edward and Elizabeth to each other in infancy appears to have ripened into a sweeter, holier friendship, as their kindred minds expanded. For, says Sir Robert Naughton, Besides the consideration of blood, there was between these two princes a concurrence and sympathy of their natures and affections, together with the celestial bond, conformity in religion, which made them one. In December 1546, when the brother and sister were separated by the removal of Elizabeth to Enfield and Edward to Hertford, the prince was so much afflicted that she wrote to him, entreating him to be comforted and to correspond to her. He replied in these tender words. The change of place, most dear sister, does not so much vex me as your departure from me, but nothing can now occur to me more grateful than your letters. I particularly feel this because you first began the correspondence and challenged me to write to you. I thank you most cordially both for your kindness and the quickness of its coming, and I will struggle vigorously that if I cannot excel you, I will at least equal you in regard and attention. It is a comfort to my regret that I hope shortly to see you again if no accident intervene. The next time the royal brother and sister met was on the 30th of January, 1547, when the Earl of Hertford and Sir Anthony Brown brought young Edward privately from Hertford to Enfield, and there, in the presence of the Princess Elizabeth, declared to him and her the death of the king their father. Both of them received the intelligence with passionate tears, and they united in such lamentations as moved all present to weep. Never, says Hayward, was sorrow more sweetly set forth, their faces seeming rather to beautify their sorrow than their sorrow to cloud the beauty of their faces. The boy king was conducted the next day to London, preparatory to his inauguration. But neither the grief which he felt for the death of his parent, 
nor the importance of the high vocation to which he had been thus early summoned rendered him forgetful of his sweetest sister as he ever called elizabeth and in reply to the letter of condolence which she addressed to him on the subject of their mutual bereavement he wrote there is very little need of my consoling you most dear sister because from your learning you know what you ought to do and from your prudence and piety you perform what your learning causes you to know in conclusion he compliments her on the elegance of her sentences and adds i perceive you think of our father's death with a calm mind by the conditions of her royal father's will elizabeth was placed the third in the order of the royal succession after himself provided her brother and sister died without lawful issue and neither queen catherine parr nor any future queen bore children to the king in point of fortune she was left on terms of strict equality with her elder sister that is to say with a life annuity of three thousand pounds a year and a marriage portion of ten thousand pounds provided she married with the consent of the king her brother and his council otherwise she was to forfeit that provision more than one historian has asserted that sir thomas seymour made a daring attempt to contract marriage with the youthful princess elizabeth before he renewed his addresses to his old love catherine parr he had probably commenced his addresses to the royal girl before her father's death for her governess catherine ashley positively deposed that it was her opinion that if henry the eighth had lived a little longer she would have been given to him for a wife letty tells us that the admiral offered his hand to elizabeth immediately after king henry's death she was then in her fourteenth year according to sharon turner the ambitious project of the admiral was detected and prevented by the council but letty who by his access to the aylesbury manuscripts appears to have obtained peculiar information on the private history of the reigns of henry the eighth and edward the sixth assures us that the refusal proceeded from elizabeth herself he gives us a truly frenchified version of the correspondence which passed between her and seymour exactly a month after the death of henry the eighth for seymour's letter in which he requests the young princess to consent to ally herself to him in marriage is dated february twenty sixth fifteen forty seven and elizabeth in her reply february twenty seventh tells him that she has neither the years nor the inclination to think of marriage at present and that she would not have any one imagine that such a subject had ever been mentioned to her at a time when she ought to be wholly taken up in weeping for the death of the king her father to whom she owed so many obligations and that she intended to devote at least two years to wearing black for him and mourning for his loss and that even when she shall have arrived at years of discretion she wishes to retain her liberty without entering into any matrimonial engagement four days after the admiral received this negative he was the accepted lover of his former fiancee the queen dowager catherine parr elizabeth who had been on the demise of the king her father consigned by the council of the royal minor her brother to the care and tutelage of queen catherine with whom she was then residing was according to our author much displeased at the conduct of that lady not only on account of the precipitation with which she had entered into a matrimonial engagement which was considered derogatory to the honour due to the late king's memory but because she had induced her to reject the addresses of the admiral by representing to her how unsuitable such an alliance would be to her in every point of view now although the queen dowager only performed her duty as the widow of the deceased majesty of england in giving such counsel to the orphan princess to whom she had undertaken the office of a mother her own proceedings by rendering the motives of her advice questionable excited reflections little to her advantage in the mind of elizabeth and perhaps sowed the first seeds of the fatal jealousy which afterwards divided them according to letty the princess mary who was no less offended than elizabeth at the indecorous haste of their royal stepmother's marriage wrote to elizabeth offering her a residence in her house entreating her to quit that of the queen dowager and come to her that both might unite in testifying their disapproval of this unsuitable alliance 
elizabeth however young as she was had too much self-command to commit herself by putting a public affront on the best-loved uncle of the king her brother who was by no means unlikely to supersede somerset in his office of protector neither did she feel disposed to come to a rupture with the queen dowager whose influence with king edward was considerable therefore in reply to her sister she wrote a very political letter telling her that it behooved them both to submit with patience to that which could not be cured as neither of them were in a position to offer any objection to what had taken place without making their condition worse than it was observing that they had to do with a very powerful party without themselves possessing the slightest credit at court so that the only thing they could do was dissemble the pain they felt at the disrespect with which their father's memory had been treated she excuses herself from accepting mary's invitation because she says the queen had shown her so much friendship that she could not withdraw herself from her protection without appearing ungrateful and concludes in these words i shall always pay the greatest deference to the instructions you may give me and submit to whatsoever your highness shall be pleased to ordain the letter is without date or signature for a year at least after the death of her royal father elizabeth continued to pursue her studies under the able superintendence of her accomplished stepmother with whom she resided either at the dower palace at chelsea or the more sequestered shades of hanworth throckmorton the kinsman of queen catherine parr draws the following graceful portrait of the manners of the youthful princess at this era of her life elizabeth there sojourning for a time gave fruitful hope of blossom blown in prime for as this lady was a princess born so she in princely virtues did excel humble she was and no degree would scorn to talk with poorest souls she liked well the sweetest violets bend nearest to the ground the greatest states in loneliness abound if some of us that waited on the queen did aught for her she passed in thankfulness i wondered at her answers which had been so fitly placed in perfect readiness she was disposed to mirth and company yet still regarding civil modesty the princess elizabeth while residing with queen catherine parr had her own ladies and officers of state and a retinue in all respects suitable to her high rank as sister to the reigning sovereign her governess mrs catherine ashley to whom she was fondly attached was married to a relative of the unfortunate queen her mother anne boleyn and it is to be observed that elizabeth although that mother's name was to her a sealed subject bestowed to the very end of her life her chief favor and confidence on her maternal kindred the learned william grindal was elizabeth's tutor till she was placed under the still more distinguished preceptorship of roger ashcombe the following letter from that great scholar was addressed to mrs catherine ashley before he had obtained the tutelage of her royal charge and both on account of the period at which it was written and its being in english is very curious gentle mrs ashley would god my wit wist what words would express the thanks you have deserved of all true english hearts for that noble imp elizabeth of your labor and wisdom now flourishing in all goodly godliness the fruit whereof doth even now redound to her grace's high honor and profit i wish her grace to come to that end in perfectness with likelihood of her wit and painfulness in her study true trade of her teaching which your diligent overseeing doth most constantly promise and although this one thing be sufficient for me to love you yet the knot which hath knit mr ashley and you together doth so bind me also to you that if my ability would match my good will you should find no friend faster he is a man i loved for his virtue before i knew him through acquaintance whose friendship i account among my chief gains gotten at court your favor to mr grindle and gentleness towards me are matters sufficient enough to deserve more good will than my little power is able to requite my good will hath sent you this pen of silver for a token good missus i would have you in any case to labor and not to give yourself to ease i wish all increase of virtue and honor to that my good lady elizabeth whose wit 
good mrs ashley i beseech you somewhat favor blunt edges be dull and endure much pain to little profit the free edge is soon turned if it be not handled thereafter if you pour much drink at once into a goblet the most part will dash out and run over if ye pour it slowly you may fill it even to the top and so her grace i doubt not by little and little may be increased in learning that at length greater cannot be required and if you think not this gentle mrs ashley yet i trust you will take my words as spoken although not of the greatest wisdom yet not of the least good will i pray commend you to my good lady of troy and all that company of godly gentlewomen i send my lady elizabeth her pen an italian book a book of prayers send the silver pen which is broken and it shall be mended quickly i commit and commend you to all the almighty's merciful protection your ever obliged friend roger ashcombe to his very loving friend mrs ashley on the death of his friend william grindle ashcombe was appointed to the lady elizabeth then about sixteen with whom he read nearly the whole of cicero's works livy the orations of his socrates the tragedies of sophocles and the new testament in greek some disturbances in ashcombe's own family separated him from his royal pupil in fifteen fifty sufficient account has been given in the memoir of queen catherine parr of the rude and improper conduct of the lord admiral sir thomas seymour to the fair young royal student while under the care of his consort the queen dowager at chelsea hanworth and seymour place the boisterous romping to which the queen was at first a party was repeated in her absence and when mrs ashley remonstrated with the admiral on the indecorum of his behavior to the young princess and entreated him to desist he replied with a profane oath that he would not for he meant no harm few girls of fifteen have ever been placed in a situation of greater peril than elizabeth was at this period of her life and if she passed through it without incurring the actual stain of guilt it is certain that she did not escape scandal the queen dowager apparently terrified at the audacious terms of familiarity on which she found her husband endeavouring to establish himself with her royal stepdaughter hastened to prevent further mischief by effecting an immediate separation between them the time of elizabeth's departure from the house and protection of queen catherine parr was a week after whitsuntide fifteen forty eight she then removed with her governess mrs catherine ashley and the rest of her establishment to cheston and afterwards to hatfield and ashridge that catherine parr spoke with some degree of severity to elizabeth on the levity of her conduct there can be no doubt from the allusions made by the latter in the following letter to the expressions used by her majesty when they parted nothing however can be more meek and conciliatory than the tone in which elizabeth writes although the workings of a wounded mind are perceptible throughout the penmanship of the letter is exquisitely beautiful the princess elizabeth to catherine parr although i could not be plentiful in giving thanks for the manifold kindnesses received at your highness's hand at my departure yet i am something to be borne withal for truly i was replete with sorrow to depart from your highness especially seeing you undoubtful of health and albeit i answered little i waited more deeply when you said you would warn me of all evilnesses that you should hear of me for if your grace had not a good opinion of me you would not have offered friendship to me that way at all meaning the contrary but what may i more say than thank god for providing such friends for me desiring god to enrich me with their long life and me grace to be in heart no less thankful to receive it than i am now made glad in writing to show it and although i have plenty of matter here i will stay for i know you are not quick to recede from cheston this present saturday your highness's humble daughter elizabeth superscribed to the queen's highness from another letter addressed by elizabeth to her royal stepmother which has been printed in the memoir of that queen there is every reason to believe that they continue to write to each other on very friendly and affectionate terms queen catherine even sanctioned a correspondence between her husband and the princess 
and the following elegant but cautious letter was written by elizabeth in reply to an apology which he had addressed to her for not having been able to render her some little service which he had promised the lady elizabeth to the lord admiral my lord you need not send an excuse to me for i could not mistrust the not fulfilling your promise to proceed from want of good will but only that opportunity serve not wherefore i shall desire you to think that a greater matter than this could not make me impute any unkindness in you for i am a friend not one with trifles nor loss with the like thus i commit you and your affairs into god's hands who keep you from all evil i pray you to make my humble commendations to the queen's highness your assured friend to my little power elizabeth catherine parr during her last illness wished much to see elizabeth and left her in her will half her jewels and a rich chain of gold she had often said to her god has given you great qualities cultivate them always and labor to improve them for i believe that you are destined by heaven to be queen of england one of the admiral's servants named edward came to cheston or chesent where the lady elizabeth was then residing with her governess and train and brought the news of queen catherine's death he told the officers of elizabeth's household that his lord was a heavy that is to say a sorrowful man for the loss of the queen his wife elizabeth did not give seymour much credit for his grief for when her governess mrs ashley advised her as he had been her friend in the lifetime of the late queen to write a letter of condolence to comfort him in his sorrow she replied i will not do it for he needs it not then said mrs ashley if your grace will not then i will she did and showed the letter to her royal pupil who without committing herself in any way tacitly permitted it to be sent lady turwit soon after told mrs ashley that it was the opinion of many that the lord admiral kept the late queen's maidens together to wait on the lady elizabeth whom he intended shortly to marry mrs ashley also talked with mr turwit about the marriage who bade her take heed for it were but undoing if it were done without the council's leave at christmas the report became general that the lady elizabeth should marry the admiral but mrs ashley sent word to sir henry parker when he sent his servant to ask her what truth were in this rumour that he should in no wise credit it for it was nay thought nay meant mrs ashley however by her own account frequently talked with elizabeth on the subject wishing that she and the admiral were married elizabeth who had only completed her fifteenth year two days after the death of queen catherine parr had no maternal friend to direct and watch over her there was not even a married lady of noble birth or alliance in her household a household comprising upwards of one hundred and twenty persons so that she was left entirely to her own discretion and the counsels of her intriguing governess mrs catherine ashley and the unprincipled cofferer or treasurer of her house thomas perry in whom as well as in mrs ashley she reposed unbounded confidence these persons were in the interest of the lord admiral and did everything in their power to further his presumptuous designs on their royal mistress letty who from his reference to the aylesbury manuscripts had certainly the best information on the subject gives elizabeth credit for acting with singular prudence under these circumstances he tells us that very soon after the death of queen catherine the lord admiral presented himself before elizabeth clad in all the external panoply of mourning but having as she suspected very little grief in his heart he came as a wooer to the royal maid from whom he received no encouragement but he endeavoured to recommend his cause to her through her female attendants one of her bedchamber women of the name of montjoy took the liberty of speaking openly to her youthful mistress in favour of a marriage between her and the admiral enlarging at the same time on his qualifications in such unguarded language that elizabeth after trying in vain to silence her told her at last that she would have her thrust out of her presence if she did not desist there can however be little doubt that a powerful impression was made on elizabeth by the addresses of seymour 
seconded, as they were, by the importunity of her governess, and all who possessed her confidence. The difference of nearly twenty years in their ages was probably compensated by the personal graces which had rendered him the Adonis of her father's court, and she was accustomed to blush when his name was mentioned, and could not conceal her pleasure when she heard him commended. In a word, he was the first, and perhaps the only man, whom Elizabeth loved, and for whom she felt disposed to make a sacrifice. She acknowledged that she would have married him, provided he could have obtained the consent of the council. To have contracted wedlock with him, in defiance of that despotic junta, by which the sovereign power of the crown was then exercised, would have involved them both in ruin, and even if passion had so far prevailed over Elizabeth's characteristic caution, and keen regard to her own interest, Seymour's feelings were not of that romantic nature, which would have led him to sacrifice either wealth or ambition on the shrine of love. My Lord Admiral had a prudential eye to the main chance, and no modern fortune hunter could have made more particular inquiries into the actual state of any lady's finances than he did into those of the fair and young sister of his sovereign, to whose hand he, the younger son of a country knight, presumed to aspire. The sordid spirit of the man is sufficiently unveiled in the following conversation between him and Thomas Perry, the cofferer of the Princess Elizabeth, as deposed by the latter before the council. When I went unto my Lord Admiral the third and fourth time, says Perry, after he had asked me how her grace did, and such things, he had large communications with me of her, and he questioned me of many things, and of the state of her grace's house, and how many servants she kept, and I told him, a hundred and twenty or a hundred and forty or thereabouts. Then he asked me what houses she had and what lands. I told him where the lands lay as near as I could, in Northamptonshire, in Berkshire, Lincoln, and elsewhere. Then he asked me if they were good lands or no, and I told him they were out on lease, for the most part, and therefore the worse. He asked me also whether she had the lands for term of life or how, and I said, I could not perfectly tell, but I thought it was such, as she was appointed by her father's will and testament, the king's majesty that then was. The admiral proceeded to inquire if she had had her letters patent out, and Perry replied, no, for there were some things in them that could not be assured to her grace yet, probably till she was of age, and that a friend of her grace would help her to an exchange of lands that would be more commodious to her. The admiral asked, what friend? And Perry replied, Morrison, who would help her to have you elm for Apethorpe. On which, the admiral proposed making an exchange with the princess himself for some of their lands, and spake much of his three fair houses, Bewdley, Sudley, and Bromham, and fell to comparing his housekeeping with that of the princess, and that he could do it with less expense than she was at, and offered his house in London for her use. At last he said, when her grace came to Ashridge, it was not far out of his way, and he might come to see her in his way up and down, and would be glad to see her there. Perry told him, he could not go to see her grace till he knew what her pleasure was. Why, said the admiral, it is no matter now, for there hath been a talk of late that I shall marry my lady Jane, adding, I tell you this merrily, I tell you this merrily. When these communications had been made to the Lady Elizabeth, she caused Mrs. Ashley to write two letters to the Admiral, one declaring her good will, but requesting him not to come without the Council's permission for that purpose, the other declaring her acceptation of his gentleness, and that he would be welcome, but if he came not, she prayed God to speed his journey. Concluding in these words from Ashley herself, No more hereof until I see my Lord myself, for my lady is not to seek his gentleness or good will. There is no absolute evidence to prove that Seymour availed himself of this implied permission to visit the princess, but every reason to suppose he did, and that by the connivance of her governess and state officers, he had clandestine interviews with the royal girl, at times and places, not in accordance with the restraints and reserves with which a maiden princess of her tender years ought to have been surrounded. 
reports of a startling nature reached the court, and the Duchess of Somerset severely censured Catherine Ashley, because she had permitted my Lady Elizabeth's grace to go one night on the Thames in a barge, and for other light parts, saying, that she was not worthy to have the governance of the king's daughter. When Elizabeth was preparing to pay her Christmas visit to court, she was at a loss for a town residence, Durham House, which had formerly been granted to her mother, Queen Anne Boleyn, before her marriage with King Henry, and to which Elizabeth considered she had a right, having been appropriated by King Edward's council to the purpose of a mint. Elizabeth made application by her cofferer, Thomas Perry, to the Lord Admiral for his assistance in this matter, on which he very courteously offered to give up his own town house for her accommodation and that of her train, adding, that he would come and see her grace. Which declaration, says Perry, she seemed to take very gladly, and to accept it joyfully, on which, continues he, casting in my mind the reports which I had heard of a marriage between them, and observing that at all times when, by any chance, talk should be had of the Lord Admiral, she showed such countenance, that it should appear she was very glad to hear of him, and especially would show countenance of gladness when he was well spoken of, I took occasion to ask her whether, if the council would like it, she would marry with him? To which she replied, When that comes to pass, I will do as God shall put into my mind. I remember well, continues Perry, that when I told her grace how the Lord Admiral would gladly, she should sue out her letters patent, she asked me, whether he was so desirous or no, indeed. I said, yes, in earnest he was desirous of it, and I told her farther, how he would have had her have lands in Gloucester, called Prisley, as in parcel of exchange, and in Wales. And she asked me, what I thought he meant thereby, and I said, I cannot tell, unless he go about to have you also, for he wished your lands, and would have them that way. This broad hint Elizabeth received, as it appears, in silence. But when Perry proceeded to inform her that the Admiral wished her to go to the Duchess of Somerset, and by that means to make suit to the protector for the exchange of the lands, and for the grant of a house, instead of Durham House, for herself, and so to entertain the Duchess for her good offices in this affair, the spirit of the royal tutor stirred within her, and she said, I dare say he did not say so, or would. Yes, by my faith, replied the cofferer. Well, quoth she, indignantly, I will not do so, and so tell him. She expressed anger that she should be driven to make such suits, and said, In faith I will not come there, nor begin to flatter now. Shortly after, the Lady Elizabeth asked Perry, whether he had told Kate Ashley of the Lord Admiral's gentleness and kind offers, and those words and things that had been told to her. I told her no, said Perry. Well, said Elizabeth, in any wise go tell it her, for I will know nothing, but she shall know it. In faith, I cannot be quiet until ye have told her of it. When Perry told the governess, she said, that she knew it well enough, and Perry rejoined, that it seemed to him that there was good will between the Lord Admiral and her grace, and that he gathered both by him and her grace. Oh, said Mrs. Ashley, it is true, but I had such a charge in this, that I dared nothing say in it, but I would wish her his wife of all men living. I wis, quoth she, he might bring the matter to pass at the council's hand well enough. The long gossiping conversation between the cofferer and the governess then followed, in which Mrs. Ashley, after adverting to some passages in the early stage of the princess's acquaintance with the admiral, and the jealousy Queen Catherine Parr had conceived of her, suddenly recollected herself, and told Perry she repented of having disclosed so many particulars to him, especially of the late queen finding her husband, with his arms about the young princess, and besought the cofferer not to repeat it, for if he did, so that it got abroad, her grace should be dishonored for ever, and she likewise undone. Perry replied, that he would rather be pulled with horses than he would disclose it. Yet it is from his confession that this scandalous story has become matter of history. 
while the admiral was proceeding with this sinister courtship of elizabeth and before his plans were sufficiently matured to permit him to become a declared suitor for her hand russell the lord privy seal surprised him by saying to him as they were riding together after the protector somerset to the parliament house my lord admiral there are certain rumours brooded of you which i am very sorry to hear when seymour demanded his meaning russell told him that he was informed that he made means to marry either the lady mary or else with the lady elizabeth adding my lord if ye go about any such thing ye seek the means to undo yourself and all those that shall come of you seymour replied that he had no thought of such an enterprise and so the conversation ended at that time a few days afterwards seymour renewed the subject in these words father russell you are very suspicious of me i pray you tell me who showed you of the marriage that i should attempt it whereof ye break with me the other day russell replied that he would not tell him the authors of that tale but that they were his very good friends and he advised him to make no suit of marriage that way though no names were mentioned seymour who well knew the allusion was to the sisters of the sovereign replied significantly it is convenient for them to marry and better it were that they were married within the realm than in any foreign place without the realm and why continued he might not i or another man raised by the king their father marry one of them then said russell my lord if either you or any other within this realm shall match himself in marriage either with my lady mary or my lady elizabeth he shall undoubtedly whatsoever he be procure unto himself the occasion of his utter undoing and you especially above all others being so near alliance to the king's majesty and after explaining to the admiral the perilous jealousies which would be excited by his marrying either of the heirs of the crown he asked this home question and pray you my lord what shall you have with either of them he who marries one of them shall have three thousand a year replied seymour my lord it is not so said russell for ye may well be assured that he shall have no more than ten thousand pounds in money plate and goods and no land and what is that to maintain his charges and estate who matches himself there they must have the three thousand pounds a year also rejoined seymour russell with a tremendous oath protested that they should not and seymour with another asserted that they should and that none should dare to say nay to it russell with a second oath swore that he would say nay to it for it was clean against the king's will and the admiral profligate as he was finding himself outsworn by the hoary-headed old statesman desisted from bandying oaths with him on the subject the most remarkable feature in this curious dialogue is however the anxiety displayed by seymour on the pecuniary prospects of his royal love he sent one of his servants about this time to lady brown celebrated by surrey under the poetic name of fair geraldine who appears to have been a very intimate friend and ally of his advising her to break up housekeeping and to take up her abode with the lady elizabeth's grace to save charges lady brown replied that she verily purposed to go to the lady elizabeth's house that next morning but she appears to have been prevented by the sickness and death of her old husband it was suspected that seymour meant to have employed her in furthering some of his intrigues the protector and his council meantime kept a jealous watch on the proceedings of the admiral not only with regard to his clandestine addresses with the lady elizabeth but his daring intrigues to overthrow the established regency and get the power into his own hands there was an attempt on the part of somerset to avert the mischief by sending the admiral on a mission to boulogne and the last interview the princess elizabeth's confidential servant perry had with him in his chamber at court where he was preparing for this unwelcome voyage the following conversation then took place the admiral asked how doth her grace and when will she be here perry replied that the lord protector had not determined on the day no said the admiral bitterly that shall be when i am gone to boulogne perry presented mrs ashley's commendations and said it was her earnest wish that the lady elizabeth should be his wife 
Oh, replied the admiral, it will not be, adding, that his brother would never consent to it. End of section two. Section three of Lives of the Queens of England, volume six, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, chapter one, part three. On the 16th of January, the Admiral was arrested on a charge of high treason, having boasted that he had 10,000 men at his command, and suborned Sherrington, the master of the mint at Bristol, to coin a large sum of false money to support him in his wild projects. He was committed to the tower, and not only his servants, but the principal persons in the household of the Princess Elizabeth, were also arrested, and subjected to very strict examination by the council, in order to ascertain the nature of the admiral's connection with the princess, and how far she was implicated in his intrigues against the government. In fact, Elizabeth herself seems to have been treated as a prisoner of state, while these momentous investigations were proceeding, for, though she made earnest supplication to be admitted to the presence of the king her brother, or even to that of the protector, in order to justify herself, she was detained at her house at Hatfield, under the especial charge of Sir Thomas Turwitt, who certainly was empowered by the council to put her and her household under restraint. Very distressing must this crisis have been, to a girl in her sixteenth year, who had no maternal friend to counsel and support her under circumstances that were the more painful, because of the previous scandal in which she had been involved, at the time of her separation from her royal stepmother, on account of the free conduct of the admiral. All the particulars of his coarse familiarity and indelicate romping with Elizabeth had been cruelly tattled by her governess, Mrs. Catherine Ashley, to Perry the Cofferer, and were by him disclosed to the council, and confirmed by the admissions of Mrs. Ashley. The fact, that notwithstanding those things, Elizabeth was receiving the clandestine addresses of this bold bad man, almost before Queen Catherine was cold in her grave, was injurious to her reputation, and caused her to be treated with less respect and consideration from the council, than ought to have been shown to a royal lady, of her tender age, and the sister of the sovereign. Sir Robert Turwitt first announced to her the alarming tidings that Mrs. Ashley and her husband, with Perry, had all been committed to the tower on her account, on which he says, Her grace was marvelously abashed, and did weep, very tenderly, a long time, demanding whether they had confessed anything. Turwitt assured her, that they had confessed everything, and urged her to do the same. Elizabeth was not to be thus easily outwitted, and Turwitt then endeavored to terrify her by requiring her to remember her honor and the peril that might ensue, for she was but a subject. An innuendo that might have been somewhat alarming to so young a girl, considering her mother, though a queen, had died by the sword of the executioner. But the lofty spirit of Elizabeth was not to be thus intimidated, and Turwitt told Somerset, that he was not able to get anything from her, but by gentle persuasion, whereby he began to grow with her in credit. For I do assure your grace, continues he, she hath a good wit, and nothing is to be gotten from her, but by great policy. She was, however, greatly disturbed when he told her that Perry and Mrs. Ashley had both confessed, and in confirmation showed her the signatures to their depositions, on which she called Perry, false wretch. Turwitt told her what sort of woman Mrs. Ashley was, and assured her that if she would open all things, that all the evil and shame should be ascribed to them, and her youth taken into consideration by his majesty, the protector, and the whole council. But in no way, continues he, will she confess any practice by Mrs. Ashley, or the cofferer, concerning my lord admiral, and yet I do see it in her face, that she is guilty, and yet perceive that she will abide more storms, ere she will accuse Mrs. Ashley. On the 28th of January, Turwitt informs the protector, that he has, in obedience to his letter of the 26th, 
practiced with her grace, by all means and policy, to induce her to confess more than she had already done, in a letter which she had just written to the duke, with her own hand, which contained all that she was willing to admit. And Turwitt expresses his conviction that a secret pact had been made by the princess, Mrs. Ashley, and Perry, never to confess anything to the crimination of each other. And if so, continues he, it will never be drawn from her grace, unless by the king, her brother, or the protector. The following is the letter written by Elizabeth to Somerset, which tallies, as Turwitt very shrewdly observes, most remarkably with the depositions of Ashley and Perry, and induces him to think that they had all three agreed in their story, in case of being questioned, or, to use his own expression, set the note before. The Lady Elizabeth to the Lord Protector. My Lord, your great gentleness and good will towards me, as well in this thing as in other things, I do understand, for the which even as I ought, so I do give you humble thanks. And whereas your lordship willeth and counseleth me, as an earnest friend, to declare what I know in this matter, and also to write what I have declared to Master Turwitt, I shall most willingly do it. I declared unto him first, that after the cofferer had declared unto me what my lord admiral answered, for Allen's matter, and for Durham Place, that it was appointed to be a mint, he told me that my lord admiral did offer me his house, for my time being, with the king's majesty, and further said and asked me, if the council did consent that I should have my lord admiral, whether I would consent to it or no. I answered, that I would not tell him what my mind was, and I further inquired of him, what he meant by asking me that question, or who bade him say so. He answered me and said, Nobody bade him say so, but that he perceived, as he thought, by my lord admiral inquiring whether my patent were sealed or no, and debating what he spent in his house, and inquiring what was spent in my house, that he was given that way rather than otherwise. And as concerning Cat Ashley, by which familiar name Elizabeth always speaks of her governess, she never advised me to it, but said always, when any talked of my marriage, that she would never have me marry, neither in England nor out of England, without the consent of the King's Majesty, your graces, and the councils. And after the Queen was departed, a cool way, by the by, of alluding to the death of Queen Catherine Parr, from whom Elizabeth had in her tender childhood received the most essential offices of friendship and maternal kindness. When I asked of her, what news she heard from London? She answered merrily, they say, your grace shall have my Lord Admiral, and that he will shortly come to woo you. And moreover, I said unto him, that the cofferer sent a letter hither, that my Lord said that he would come this way as he went down into the country. Then I bade her write as she thought best, and bade her show it to me when she had done. So she wrote, that she thought it not best, that the admiral should come, for fear of suspicion. And so it went forth, that is, the letter was sent. And the Lord Admiral, after he had heard that, asked the cofferer, why he might not come to me as well as to my sister. And then I desired Cat Ashley to write again, lest my Lord might think that she knew more in it than he that she knew nothing, but only suspected. And I also told Master Turwitt that, to the effect of the matter. Here Elizabeth evidently alludes to the report of his intended courtship. I never consented to any such thing, without the council's consent thereto. And as for Cat Ashley and the cofferer, they never told me that they would practice it, for example, compass the marriage. These be the things which I declared to Master Turwitt, and also, whereof my conscience beareth me witness, which I would not for all earthly things offend in any thing. For I know I have a soul to be saved as well as other folks have, wherefore I will, above all things, have respect unto this same. If there be any more things which I can remember, I will either write it myself, or cause Mr. Turwitt to write it. Master Turwitt and others have told me that there goeth rumors abroad, which be greatly both against my honor and honesty, which, above all other things, I esteem, which be these, that I am in the tower, and with child by my Lord Admiral. 
My lord, these are shameful slanders, for the which, besides the great desire I have to see the king's majesty, I shall most heartily desire your lordship that I may come to the court, after your first determination that I may show myself there as I am. Written in haste, from Hatfield, this 28th of January. Your assured friend to my little power, Elizabeth. This letter, which is in the Haynes edition of the Burley State Papers, entitled, The Confession of the Lady Elizabeth's Grace, is one of the most interesting documents connected with her personal history. There is a curious mixture of childlike simplicity and diplomatic skill in her admissions, with that affectation of candor which often veils the most profound dissimulation. Her endeavors to screen her governess are, however, truly generous, and the lofty spirit with which she adverts to the scandalous reports that were in circulation against her reputation is worthy of the daughter of a king, and conveys a direct conviction of her innocence. There is no affectation of delicacy or mock modesty in her language. She comes to the point at once, like an honest woman, and in plain English, tells the protector of what she had been accused, and declares that it is a shameful slander, and demands that she may be brought to court, that her appearance may prove her innocence. It is to be remembered that Elizabeth was little turned of fifteen when this letter was penned. On the 7th of February, Turwitz succeeded in drawing a few more particulars from Elizabeth, which he forwarded to the Duke of Somerset, enclosed in the following note to his grace. I do send all the articles I received from your grace, and also the Lady Elizabeth's confession withal, which is not so full of matter as I would it were, nor yet so much as I did procure her too, but in no way will she confess that either Mrs. Ashley or Perry willed her to any practices with my Lord Admiral, either by messages or writing. They all sing one song, and so I think they would not, unless they had set the note before. February 7th, Hatfield. In Elizabeth's hand. Cat Ashley told me, that after the Lord Admiral was married to the Queen, if he had had his own will, he would have had me afore the Queen. Then I asked her, how she knew that? She said, I knew it well enough, both by himself and others. The place where she said this I have forgotten, but she spoke to me of him many times. Then Turwit wrote the rest of the confession, but under the inspection of the princess, as follows. Another time, after the queen was dead, Cat Ashley would have had me to have written a letter to my lord admiral, to have comforted him in his sorrow, because he had been my friend in the queen's lifetime, and would think great kindness therein. Then I said, I would not, for he needs it not. Then said Cat Ashley, If your grace will not, then I will. I remember I did see it. For example, the consolatory letter Elizabeth thought so superfluous to the widower. But what the effect of it was, I do not remember. Another time I asked her, What news was at London? And she said, The voice went there that my Lord Admiral Seymour should marry me. I smiled at this and replied, It was but a London news. One day she said, He that fain would have had you before he married the queen will come now to woo you. I answered her, Though peradventure he himself would have me, yet I think the privy council will not consent, but I think by what you said, if he had had his own will, he would have had me. I think there was no let or hindrance of his part, but only on that of the council. Howbeit, she said another time, that she did not wish me to have him, because she who had him was so unfortunate. Elizabeth then informs the Duke that Perry asked her, if the council consented, whether she would have the Lord Admiral or no. I asked him, pursues she, what he meant by that question, and who bade him ask me. He replied, no one, but he gathered by questions asked by the Lord Admiral before, that he meant some such thing. I told him it was but his foolish gathering. She says, Perry brought a message from the Lord Admiral, advising her, first to get her patent sealed and sure, and then he would apply to the council for leave to marry her. Likewise that the Lord Admiral wished her to reside at Ashridge, because it was in his way, when he went into the country, to call and see her. 
Elizabeth signed this confession with her own hand, and very blandly concludes the paper with an assurance to Somerset, that if she remembered any more, she would be sure to forward the items to him. It was, doubtless, for the purpose of shaking Elizabeth's confidence in Mrs. Ashley, that Turwitt showed her the deposition of the trusty official, which revealed all the particulars of the liberties the admiral had presumed to offer to her, while she was under the care of his late consort, Queen Catherine. Elizabeth appeared greatly abashed and half breathless, while reading the needlessly minute details, which had been made before the council, of scenes in which she had been only a passive actor, but as Mrs. Ashley had abstained from disclosures of any consequence, touching her more recent intercourse with Seymour, she expressed no displeasure, but when she had read to the end, carefully examined the signatures, both of Catherine Ashley and Perry, as if she had suspected Turwitt of practicing an imposition. Though it was plain, observes he, that she knew both at half a glance. In one of Turwitt's letters to Somerset, he says, that Master Beverly and himself had been examining the cofferer's accounts, which they find very incorrect, and the books so indiscreetly kept, that he appears little fit for his office, that her grace's expenses are at present more than she can afford, and therefore she must perforce make entrenchments. She was desirous that the protector should not appoint any one to be her cofferer, till she had spoken to him herself, for she thought an officer of less importance would serve for that department, and save in her purse a hundred pounds a year. This proved to be only an excuse, on the part of the young lady, to keep the office open for Perry, whom she took the first opportunity of reinstating in his post, although she had been given full proof of his defalcations, and so far was she from resenting the nature of his disclosures, with regard to the improper confidence that had been reposed in him by her tattling governess, that she afterwards, on her accession to the throne, appointed him the comptroller of her royal household, and continued her preferment to him and his daughter to the end of their lives, conduct which naturally induces a suspicion that secrets of greater moment had been confided to him, secrets that probably would have touched not only the maiden fame of his royal mistress, but placed her life in jeopardy, and that he had preserved these inviolate. The same may be supposed with respect to Mrs. Ashley, to whom Elizabeth clung with unshaken tenacity through every storm, even when the council dismissed her from her office, and addressed a stern note to her grace the Lady Elizabeth, apprising her that they had, in consequence of the misconduct of Mrs. Catherine Ashley, removed her from her post, and appointed the Lady Turwitt to take her place as governess to her grace, and requiring her to receive her as such. The disdainful manner in which the young lioness of the Tudor Plantagenet line received the new duenna, who had been contumaciously put in authority over her by her royal brother's counsel, is best related in the words of Sir Robert Turwitt himself, who, in his twofold capacity of spy and jailer, seems to have peculiar satisfaction in telling tales of the defenseless orphan of Anne Boleyn, to the powerful brother of her murdered mother's rival, Jane Seymour. Pleaseth your grace to be advertised, he writes, that after my wife's repair hither, she declared to the Lady Elizabeth's grace, that she was called before your grace and the council, and had a rebuke, that she had not taken upon herself the office to see her well governed in the lieu of Mrs. Ashley. This reproof to Lady Turwitt, must have had reference to the time when all the parties concerned were living under the roof of Queen Catherine Parr, whose lady-in-waiting Lady Turwitt was. The Lady Elizabeth replied, that Mrs. Ashley was her mistress, and that she had not so demeaned herself, that the council should now need to put any more mistresses unto her. Whereunto, pursues Turwitt, my wife answered, seeing she did allow Mrs. Ashley to be her mistress, she need not to be ashamed to have any honest woman to be in that place. She took the matter so heavily that she wept all that night, and lured all the next day till she received your letter, and then she sent for me and asked me whether she were best to write to you again or not. I said, if she would follow the effect of your letter, meaning if she would comply with the injunctions contained in it. I thought it best that she should write, but in the end of the matter, 
I perceived that she was very loath to have a governor, and to avoid the same, she said, that the world would note her to be a great offender, having so hastily a governor appointed over her. And all is no more than that she fully hopes to recover her old mistress again. The love she yet beareth her is to be wondered at. I told her, Elizabeth, that if she would consider her honor, and the sequel thereof, she would, considering her years, make suit to your grace to have one, rather than to be without one a single hour. She cannot digest such advice in no way, continues Sir Robert, dryly. But if I should say my fantasy, it were more meet she should have two than one. He then complains, that although he favoured her grace with his advice, as to the manner in which she should frame her reply to Somerset, she would in no wise follow it, but writ her own fantasy. And in the right of it too, we should say, considering the treacherous nature of the counsellor, who, serpent-like, was trying to beguile her into criminating herself, for the sake of employing her evidence against the luckless admiral, who was at that very time struggling in the toils of his foes, and vainly demanding the privilege of a fair trial. That Elizabeth did not contemplate his fall, and the plunder of his property without pain, Turwood bears witness. She beginneth now to droop a little, writes that watchful observer, by reason that she heareth, my lord admiral's houses be dispersed, and my wife telleth me now, that she cannot hear him discommended, but she is ready to make answer, which, continues Turwit, she hath not been accustomed to do, unless Mrs. Ashley were touched, whereunto she was ever ready to make answer, vehemently in her defence. The following is the letter which Elizabeth addressed to Somerset, instead of that which his creature, Turwit, had endeavoured to beguile her into writing. It is marked with all the caution that characterized her diplomatic correspondence, after the lessons of worldcraft, in which she finally became an adept, were grown familiar to her. She, however, very properly assumes the tone of an injured person, with regard to the scandalous reports that were in circulation against her, and demands that he and the council should take the requisite steps for putting a stop to those injurious rumors. Letter from the Lady Elizabeth to the Protector Somerset. My Lord, having received your Lordship's letters, I perceive in them your good will towards me, because you declare to me plainly your mind in this thing, and again for that, you would not wish that I should do anything that should not seem good unto the council, for the which thing I give you most hearty thanks. And whereas, I do understand, that you do take an evil part, the letters that I did write unto your lordship. I am very sorry that you should take them so, for my mind was to declare unto you plainly, as I thought, in that thing which I did, also the more willingly, because as I write to you, you desired me to be plain with you in all things. And as concerning that point that you write, that I seem to stand in my own wit, and being so well assured of mine own self, I did assure me of myself, no more than I trust the truth shall try, and to say that which I know of myself, I did not think should have displeased the counsel or your grace. And surely, the cause why that I was sorry, that there should be any such thing about me, was because that I thought the people will say that I deserved, through my lewd demeanor, to have such a one, and not that I mislike anything that your lordship, or the council, shall think good. For I know that you and the council are charged with me, and that I take upon me to rule myself, for I know that they are most deceived, that trusteth most in themselves, wherefore I trust you shall never find that fault in me, to the which thing I do not see that your grace has made any direct answer at this time, and seeing that they make so evil reports already, shall be but an increasing of these evil tongues. Howbeit you did write, that if I would bring forth any that had reported it, you and the council would see it redressed, which thing, though I can easily do it, I would be loath to do, because it is mine own cause, and again, that it should be but a bridging of an evil name of me, that am glad to punish them, and so get the evil will of the people, which thing I would be loath to have. But if it might seem good to your lordship, and the rest of the council, to send forth a proclamation into the countries, that they refrain their tongues, declaring how the tales be but lies, 
it should make both the people think that you and the council have great regard that no such rumors should be spread of any of the king's majesty's sisters as i am though unworthy and also that i should think myself to receive such friendship at your hands as you have promised me although your lordship hath shown me great already howbeit i am ashamed to ask it any more because i see you are not so well minded thereunto and as concerning that you say that i give folks occasion to think in refusing the good to uphold the evil i am not so simple understanding nor would that your grace should have so evil an opinion of me that i have so little respect of my own honesty that i would maintain it if i had sufficient promise of the same and so your grace shall prove me when it comes to the point and thus i bid you farewell desiring god always to assist you in all your affairs written in haste from hatfield this twenty first of february your assured friend to my little power elizabeth superscribed to my very good lord my lord protector to such a horrible extent had the scandals to which elizabeth adverts in this letter proceeded that not only was it said that she had been seduced by seymour and was about to become a mother but that she had actually borne him a child from the manuscript life of jane dormer duchess of feria who had been in the service of her sister the princess mary we learn that there was a report of a child born and miserably destroyed but that it could not be discovered whose it was a midwife testified that she was brought from her house blindfold to a house where she did her office and returned in like manner she saw nothing in the house but candlelight and only said it was the child of a very fair young lady this wild story was but a modern version of an ancient legend which is to be met with among the local traditions of every county in england in border minstrelsy and ballad lore and even in oriental tales and it had certainly been revived by some of the court gossips of edward the sixth reign who thought proper to make the youthful sister of that prince the heroine of the adventure the council had offered to punish any one whom elizabeth could point out as the author of the injurious rumours against her character and her observation in her letter to somerset in reply to this offer that she should but gain an evil name as if she were glad to punish and thus incur the ill-will of the people which she should be loath to have is indicative of the profound policy which throughout life enabled this great queen to win and retain the affections of the men of england popularity was a leading object with elizabeth from her childhood to the grave and well had nature fitted her to play her part with eclat in the splendid drama of royalty on the fourth of march fifteen forty nine the bill of attainer against thomas seymour baron sudley lord admiral of england was read for the third time in the house of lords and though his courtship of elizabeth formed one of the numerous articles against him and it must have been a season replete with anxious alarm and anguish to herself she generously ventured to write an earnest appeal to somerset in behalf of her imprisoned governess mrs ashley and her husband who were as she had every reason to suppose involved in the same peril that impended over her rash lover with whom they had been confederate her letter is written in a noble spirit and does equal credit to her head and heart and is a beautiful specimen of special pleading in a girl of fifteen letter from elizabeth to the protector somerset my lord i have a request to make unto your grace which fear has made me omit till this time for two causes the one because i saw that my request for the rumours which were spread abroad of me took so little place which thing when i considered i thought i should little profit in any other suit howbeit now i understand that there is a proclamation for them for the which i give your grace and the rest of the council most humble thanks i am the bolder to speak for another thing and the other was because peradventure your lordship and the rest of the council will think that i favour her evil doing for whom i shall speak which is catherine ashley that it would please your grace and the rest of the council to be good unto her which thing i do not to favour her in any evil for that i would be sorry to do but for these considerations that follow the which hope doth teach me in saying that i ought not to doubt but that your grace and the rest of the council will think that i do it for other considerations 
first because she hath been with me a long time and many years and hath taken great labor and pain in bringing me up in learning and honesty and therefore i ought of very duty speak for her for saint gregory saith that we are more bound to them that bringeth us up well than to our parents for our parents do that which is natural for them, that bring us us into this world, but our bringers up are a cause to make us live well in it. The second is, because I think that whatsoever she hath done in my Lord Admiral's matter, as concerning the marrying of me, she did it because knowing him to be one of the council, she thought he would not go about any such thing, without he had the council's consent thereunto. For I have heard her many times say, that she would never have me marry in any place without your graces and the council's consent the third cause is because that it shall and doth make men think that i am not clear of the deed myself but that it is pardoned to me because of my youth because that she i love so well is in such a place thus hope prevailing more with me than fear hath won the battle and i have at this time gone forth with it which i pray god be taken no otherwise than it is meant written in haste from hatfield this seventh day of march also if i may be so bold not offending i beseech your grace and the rest of the council to be good to master ashley her husband which because he is my kinsman i would be glad he should do well your assured friend to my little power elizabeth to my very good lord my lord protector there is something truly magnanimous in the manner in which Elizabeth notices her relationship to the prisoner Ashley, at the time when he was under so dark a cloud, and it proves that the natural impulses of her heart were generous and good. The constitutional levity which she inherited from her mother appears at that period of her life to have been her worst fault, and though afterwards she acquired the art of veiling this, under an affectation of extreme prudery, her natural inclination was perpetually breaking out, and betraying her into follies which remind one of the conduct of the cat in the fable, who was turned into a lady, but never could resist her native penchant for catching mice. On the 20th of March, Seymour was brought to the block. He had employed the last evening of his life in writing letters to Elizabeth and her sister, with the point of an aglet, which he plucked from his hose, being denied the use of pen and ink these letters which he concealed within the sole of a velvet shoe were discovered by the emissaries of the council and opened no copies of these interesting documents have apparently been preserved but bishop latimer in his sermon in justification of the execution of the unhappy writer describes them to be of a wicked and dangerous nature tending to excite the jealousy of the king's sisters against the protector somerset as their great enemy when Elizabeth was informed of the execution of the admiral, she had the presence of mind to disappoint the malignant curiosity of the official spies, who were watching to report every symptom of emotion she might betray on that occasion, and merely said, This day died a man, with much wit, and very little judgment. Although this extraordinary instance of self-command might, by some, be regarded as a mark of apathy in so young a woman, there can be no doubt that Elizabeth had been entangled in the snares of a deep and enduring passion for Seymour, passion that had rendered her regardless of every consideration of pride, caution, and ambition, and forgetful of the obstacle which nature itself had opposed, to a union between the daughter of Anne Boleyn and a brother of Jane Seymour. That Elizabeth continued to cherish the memory of this unsuitable lover with tenderness, not only after she had been deprived of him by the acts of the executioner, but for long years afterwards, may be inferred from the favor which she always bestowed on his faithful follower, Sir John Harrington the Elder, and the fact that when she was actually the sovereign of England, and had rejected the addresses of many of the princes of Europe, Harrington ventured to present her with a portrait of his deceased lord, the admiral, with the following descriptive sonnet. Of person rare, strong limbs and manly shape, by nature framed to serve on sea or land, in friendship firm, in good state or ill hap, in peace headwise, in war skill great bold hand, on horse or foot, in peril or in play, none could excel, though many did assay, a subject true to king, a servant great, friend to God's truth, and foe to Rome's deceit, 
sumptuous abroad for honor of the land temperate at home yet kept great state with stay and noble house that fed more mouths with meat than some advanced on higher steps to stand yet against nature reason and just laws his blood was spilt guiltless without just cause the gift was accepted and no reproof addressed to the donor elizabeth had six ladies of honor in her household at hatfield whose names were celebrated by sir john harrington in a complimentary poem which he addresses to that princess early in mary's reign the poem commences the great diana chaste in forest late i met did me command in haste to hatfield for to get and to you six a row her pleasure to declare thus meaning to bestow on each a gift most rare first she doth give to gray the falcon's courteous kind her lord for to obey with most obedient mind he proceeds to praise isabella markham for her modesty and beauty mrs norwich for goodness and gravity mrs st lo for stability mrs willoughby for being a laurel instead of a willow and mrs shipwith for prudence elizabeth chose to personate diana or paulus all her life End of section three. Section four of the Lives of the Queens of England, Volume six by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter two, Part one the disastrous termination of elizabeth's first love affair appears to have had the salutary effect of inclining her to habits of a studious and reflective character she was for a time under a cloud and during the profound retirement in which she was doomed to remain for at least a year after the execution of the lord admiral the energies of her active mind found employment and solace in the pursuits of learning she assumed a grave and sedate demeanor withal and bestowed much attention on theology which the polemic spirit of the times rendered a subject of powerful interest her new governess lady turwit had been the friend of the late queen catherine parr and was one of the learned females who had supported the doctrines of the reformation and narrowly escaped the fiery crown of martyrdom and though elizabeth had in the first instance defied her authority there is reason to believe that she was reconciled to her after the first effervescence of her high spirit had subsided and the assimilation of their religious feelings produced sympathy and good will between them a curious little devotional volume is mentioned by anthony a wood as having once belonged to queen elizabeth which was compiled by this lady for her use when acting as her preceptress it was of miniature size bound in solid gold and entitled lady elizabeth turwitz morning and evening prayers with divers hymns and meditations it was probably about this period that elizabeth translated an italian sermon of ochinus which she transcribed in a hand of great beauty and sent to her royal brother as a new year's gift the dedication is dated enfield december thirtieth but the year is not specified the manuscript is now in the bodleian library not in vain did elizabeth labor to efface the memory of her early indiscretion by establishing a reputation for learning and piety the learned roger ashcom under whom she perfected herself in the study of the classics in his letters to sturmius the rector of the protestant university at strasburg is enthusiastic in his enconiums on his royal pupil of whose scholastic attainments he is justly proud numberless honorable ladies of the present time says he surpass the daughters of sir thomas more in every kind of learning but amongst them all my illustrious mistress the lady elizabeth shines like a star excelling them more by the splendor of her virtues than by the glory of her royal birth in the variety of her commendable qualities i am less perplexed to find matter for the highest panegyric than to circumscribe that panegyric within just bounds yet i shall mention nothing respecting her but what has come under my own observation for two years she pursued the study of greek and latin under my tuition 
but the foundations of her knowledge in both languages were laid by the diligent instruction of William Grindal, my late beloved friend, and seven years my pupil in classical learning at Cambridge. From this university he was summoned by John Cheek to court, where he soon after received the appointment of tutor to this lady. After some years, when through her native genius, aided by the efforts of so excellent a master, she had made a great progress in learning, and Grindal, by his merit and favor of his mistress, might have aspired to high dignities, he was snatched away by a sudden illness. I was appointed to succeed him in his office, and the work which he had so happily begun, without my assistance indeed, but not without some counsels of mine, I diligently labored to complete. Now, however, released from the throng of a court, and restored to the felicity of my former learned leisure, I enjoy, through the bounty of the king, an honorable appointment in this university. The Lady Elizabeth has completed her sixteenth year, and so much solidity of understanding, such courtesy united with dignity, have never been observed at so early an age. She has the most ardent love of true religion, and the best kind of literature. The constitution of her mind is exempt from female weakness, and she is endued with masculine power of application. No apprehension can be quicker than hers, no memory more retentive. French and Italian she speaks like English, latin with fluency propriety and judgment she also spoke greek with me frequently willingly and moderately well nothing can be more elegant than her handwriting whether in the greek or the roman character in music she is very skilful but does not greatly delight with respect to her personal decoration she greatly prefers a simple elegance to show and splendor so despising the outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold that in the whole manner of her life she rather resembles Hippolyta than Phaedra. She read with me almost the whole of Cicero and a great part of Livy. From those two authors her knowledge of the Latin language has been almost exclusively derived. The beginning of the day was always devoted by her to the New Testament in Greek, after which she read select orations of Isocrates and the tragedies of Sophocles, which I judge best adapted to supply her tongue with the purest diction, her mind with the most excellent precepts, and her exalted station with a defense against the utmost power of fortune. For her religious instruction, she drew first from the fountains of scripture, and afterwards from St. Cyprian, the commonplaces of Melanchthon, and similar works, which convey pure doctrine in elegant language. In every kind of writing, she easily detected any ill-adapted or far-fetched expression. She could not bear those feeble imitators of Erasmus, who bind the Latin language in the fetters of miserable proverbs. On the other hand, she approved a style, chaste in propriety, and beautiful in perspicuity, and she greatly admired metaphors when not too violent, and antithesis when just, and happily opposed by a diligent attention to these particulars her ear became so practised and so nice that there was nothing in greek latin or english prose or verse which according to its merits or defects she did not either reject with disgust or receive with the highest delight the letters from which these passages have been extracted were written by ashcombe in latin in the year fifteen fifty when he had for some reason been compelled to withdraw from his situation in Elizabeth's household. The commendations of this great scholar had probably some share in restoring her to the favor of the learned young king, her brother, whose early affection for the dearly loved companion of his infancy appears to have been revived after a time, and though the jealousy of the selfish statesman who held him in thrall prevented the princely boy from gratifying his yearnings for her presence, he wrote to her to send him her portrait. Elizabeth, in her reverential and somewhat pedantic epistle, in reply certainly gives abundant evidence of the taste for metaphors to which Ashcombe adverts in his letters to Sturmius. Letter from the Princess Elizabeth to King Edward the Sixth with a present of her portrait. Like as the rich man that daily gathereth riches to riches, and to one bag of money layeth a great sort, till it come to infinite, 
so methinks your majesty not being sufficed with many benefits and gentlenesses showed to me afore this time doth now increase them in asking and desiring where you may bid and command requiring a thing not worthy the desiring for itself but made worthy for your highness's request my picture i mean in which if the inward good mind towards your grace might as well be declared as the outward face and countenance shall be seen i would not have tarried the commandment but prevented it nor have been the last to grant but the first to offer it for the face i grant i might well blush to offer but the mind i shall never be ashamed to present for though from the grace of the picture the colors may fade by time may give by weather may be spotted by chance yet the other nor time with her swift wings shall overtake nor the misty clouds with their lowerings may darken nor chance with her slippery foot may overthrow of this although yet the proof could not be great because the occasions hath been but small notwithstanding as a dog hath a day so may i perchance have time to declare it in deeds where now i do write them but in words and further i shall most humbly beseech your majesty that when you shall look on my picture you will vouchsafe to think that as you have put the outward shadow of the body afore you so my inward mind wisheth that the body itself were oftener in your presence howbeit because both my so being i think i could do your majesty little pleasure though myself great good and again because i see as yet not the time agreeing thereunto i shall learn to follow the saying of oris or horus ferus non culpes quad vitare non potest and thus i will troubling your majesty i fear and with my most humble thanks beseeching god long to preserve you to his honour to your comfort to the realm's profit and to my joy from hatfield this fifteenth day of may your majesty's most humble sister elizabeth in the summer of fifteen fifty elizabeth had succeeded in reinstating her trusty cofferer thomas perry in his old office and she employed him to write to the newly appointed secretary of state william cecil afterwards lord burleigh to solicit him to bestow the parsonage of harptree in the county of somerset on john kenyon the yeoman of her robes a lamentable instance of an unqualified layman through the patronage of the great devouring that property which was destined for the support of efficient ministers of the church such persons employed incompetent curates as their substitutes at a starving salary to the great injury and dissatisfaction of the congregation perry's letter is dated september twenty second from ashridge her grace he says hath been long troubled with rheums or rheumatism but now thanks be to the lord is nearly well again and shortly ye shall hear from her grace again a good understanding appears to have been early established between elizabeth and cecil which possibly might be one of the undercurrents that led to her recall to court where however she did not return till after the first disgrace of the duke of somerset on the seventeenth of march fifteen fifty one she emerged from the profound retirement in which she had remained since her disgrace in fifteen forty nine and came in state to visit the king her brother she rode on horseback through london to st james's palace attended by a great company of lords knights and gentlemen and after her about two hundred ladies on the nineteenth she came from st james's through the park to the court the way from the park gate to the court was spread with fine sand she was attended by a very honourable confluence of noble and worshipful persons of both sexes and was received with much ceremony at the court gate that wily politician the earl of warwick afterwards duke of northumberland had considered elizabeth young and neglected as she was of sufficient political importance to send her a duplicate of the curious letter addressed by the new council jointly to her and her sister the lady mary in which a statement is given of the asserted misdemeanors of somerset and their proceedings against him the council were now at issue with mary on the grounds of her adherence to the ancient doctrines and as a conference had been appointed between her and her opponents on the eighteenth of march it might be to divert popular attention from her and her cause 
that the younger and fairer sister of the sovereign was permitted to make her public entrance into london on the preceding day and that she was treated with so many marks of unwonted respect thus we see mary makes her public entry on the eighteenth with her train all decorated with black rosaries and crosses and on the nineteenth elizabeth is again shown to the people as if to obliterate any interest that might have been excited by the appearance of the elder princess the love of edward the sixth for elizabeth was so very great according to camden that he never spoke of her by any other title than his dearest sister or his sweet sister temperance elizabeth at this period affected extreme simplicity of dress in conformity to the mode which the rigid rules of the calvinist church of geneva was rendering general among the stricter portion of those noble ladies who professed the doctrines of the reformation the king her father says dr aylmer left her rich clothes and jewels and i know it to be true that in seven years after his death she never in all that time looked upon that rich attire and precious jewels but once and that against her will and that there never came gold or stone upon her head till her sister forced her to lay off her former soberness and bear her company in her glittering gayness and then she so wore it that all men might see that her body carried that which her heart misliked i am sure that her maidenly apparel which she used in king edward's time made the noblemen's wives and daughters ashamed to be dressed and painted like peacocks being more moved with her more virtuous example than with all that ever paul or peter wrote touching that matter the first opening charms of youth elizabeth well knew required no extraneous adornments and her classic tastes taught her that the elaborate magnificence of the costumes of her brother's court tended to obscure rather than enhance those graces which belong to the morning bloom of life the plainness and modesty of the princess elizabeth's costume was particularly noticed during the splendid festivities that took place on the occasion of the visit of the queen dowager of scotland mary of lorraine to the court of edward the sixth in october fifteen fifty one the advent of the beautiful regent of the sister kingdom and her french ladies of honor fresh from the gay and gallant louvre produced no slight excitement among the noble belles of king edward's court and it seems that a sudden and complete revolution in dress took place in consequence of the new fashions that were then imported by queen mary and her brilliant cortege so that all the ladies went with their hair frounced curled and double curled except the princess elizabeth who altered nothing says aylmer but kept her old maiden shamefacedness at a later period of life elizabeth made up in the exuberance of her ornaments and the fantastic extravagance of her dress for the simplicity of her attire when in the bloom of sweet seventeen what would her reverend eulogist have said if while penning these passages in her honor the vision of her three thousand gowns and the eighty wigs of divers colored hair in which his royal heroine finally rejoiced could have arisen in array before his mental eye to mark the difference between the elizabeth of seventeen and the elizabeth of seventy the elizabeth of seventeen had however a purpose to answer and a part to play neither of which were compatible with the indulgence of her natural vanity and the inordinate love of dress which the popular preachers of her brother's court were perpetually denouncing from the pulpit her purpose was the re-establishment of that fair fame which had been sullied by the cruel implication of her name by the protector somerset and his creatures in the proceedings against the lord admiral and in this she had by the circumspection of her conduct the unremitting manner in which she had since that mortifying period devoted herself to the pursuits of learning and theology so fully succeeded that she was now regarded as a pattern for all the youthful ladies of the court the part which she was ambitious of performing was that of the heroine of the reform party in england even as her sister mary was of the catholic portion of the people that elizabeth was already so considered and that the royal sisters were early placed in incipient rivalry to each other by the respective partisans of the warring creeds which divided the land may be gathered from the observations of their youthful cousin lady jane grey when urged to wear the costly dress that had been presented to her by mary nay that were a shame to follow my lady mary who leaveth god's word 
and leave my lady Elizabeth, who followeth God's word. Elizabeth wisely took no visible part in the struggle between the Dudley and Seymour factions, though there is reason to believe that Somerset tried to enlist her on his side. The following interrogatory was put to him on one of his examinations. Whether he did not consent that Vane should labor the Lady Elizabeth to be offended with the Duke of Northumberland, then Earl of Warwick, the Earl of Pembroke, and others of his council? The answer to this query has not been found, or it might possibly throw some light on the history of Elizabeth at this period. She certainly had no cause to cherish the slightest friendship for Somerset, for though it appears, from her letter to her sister Mary, that he had succeeded in persuading her that he was not guilty of his brother's death, yet, by bringing all the particulars of the indiscretions that had taken place between her and the admiral before the council, he had acted with the utmost cruelty towards herself, and cast a blight on her morning flower of life. If we may believe Letty, Somerset sent a piteous supplication to Elizabeth from the tower, imploring her to go to the king and exert her powerful influence to obtain his pardon, and she wrote to him in reply, that being so young a woman, she had no power to do anything in his behalf, and assured him that the king was surrounded by those who took good care to prevent her from approaching too near the court, and she had no more opportunity of access to his majesty than himself. The fall of Somerset made, at first, no other difference to Elizabeth than the transfer of her applications to the restoration of Durham House from him to the Duke of Northumberland, who had obtained the grant of that portion of Somerset's illegally acquired property. Elizabeth persisted in asserting her claims to this demisne, and that with a high hand, for she addressed an appeal to the Lord Chancellor on the subject. She openly expressed her displeasure, that Northumberland should have asked it of the king, without first ascertaining her disposition touching it. She made a peremptory demand that the house should be delivered up to her, and sent word to Northumberland, that she was determined to come and see the king at Candlemas, and request that she might have the use of St. James's Palace, for her abode, pro tempore, because she could not have her things so soon ready at the Strand House. But, concludes Northumberland, after relating these energetic proceedings of the young lady, I am sure her grace would have done no less, though she had kept Durham House. This observation certainly refers to her wish of occupying St. James's Palace. It was, however, no part of Northumberland's policy to allow either of the sisters of the young king to enjoy the opportunity of personal intercourse with him, and least of all, Elizabeth, whom, from the tender friendship that had ever united them, and more than all, the conformity of her profession with Edward's religious opinions, he might have naturally been desirous of appointing as his successor, when his brief term of royalty was drawing to a close that Elizabeth made an attempt to visit her royal brother in his sickness, at what period is uncertain, and that she was circumvented in her intention, and intercepted on her approach to the metropolis, by the agents of the faction that had possession of his person. She herself informs him in the following letter, in which she evinces a truly sisterly solicitude for his health. Letter from the Princess Elizabeth to King Edward the Sixth like as a shipman in stormy weather plucks down the sails tarrying for better winds so did i most noble king in my unfortunate chance on thursday pluck down the high sails of my joy and comfort and do trust one day that as troublesome waves have repulsed me backward so a gentle wind will bring me forward to my haven two chief occasions moved me much and grieved me greatly the one for that i doubted your majesty's health the other, because for all my long tarrying, I went without that I came for. Of the first, I am relieved in a part, both that I understood of your health, and that also your majesty's lodging is not far from my lord marquis's chamber. Of my other grief, I am not eased, but the best is, that whatsoever other folks will suspect, I intend not to fear your grace's good will, which I know that I never deserve to forfeit, so I trust will still stick by me. For if your grace's advice that I should return, whose will is a commandment, had not been, I would not have made the half of my way the end of my journey, and thus, as one desirous to hear of your majesty's health, 
though unfortunate to see it, I shall pray God forever to preserve you. From Hatfield, this present Saturday, your majesty's humble sister, to commandment, Elizabeth, to the king's most excellent majesty. The same power that employed to prevent the visit of Elizabeth to her sick, perhaps dying brother, probably deprived him of the satisfaction of receiving the letter which informed him that such had been her intention. It was the interest of those unprincipled statesmen to instill feelings of bitterness into the heart of the poor young king, against those to whom the fond ties of natural affection had once so strongly united him. The tenor of Edward the Sixth's will, and the testimony of the persons who were about him at the time of his death, proved that he was at last no less estranged from Elizabeth, his sweetest sister Temperance, as he was formerly wont to call her, than from Mary, whose recusancy had been urged against her as a reasonable ground for exclusion from the throne. Both were alike excluded from their natural places in the succession, and deprived of the benefit of their father's nomination in the act for settling the royal succession in the year 1544, and subsequently in his will. Mary first, because of her papistry, and secondly, because she had been declared illegitimate. The reproach of papistry could not, with any consistency, be objected to Elizabeth, for had not the Lady Jane Grey herself, the innocent rival for her title, declared that the Lady Elizabeth was a follower of God's word? And as to the second objection of their declaring Mary illegitimate, the direct contrary had been the result, for the establishment of the legitimacy of either of these sisters, no matter which, must infallibly have stigmatized the birth of the other. The next objection to Mary and Elizabeth was, that being only sisters to Edward by the half-blood, they could not be his lawful heirs. But this was indeed a fallacy, for their title was derived from the same royal father, from whom Edward inherited the throne, and would in no respect have been strengthened by the comparatively mean blood of Jane Seymour, even if they had been her daughters by the late king. The third reason given for the exclusion of Edward's sisters was, that they might marry foreign princes, and thus be the means of bringing papistry into England again, which Lady Jane Grey could not do, as she was already married to the son of the Duke of Northumberland. Latimer preached in favor of the exclusion of Elizabeth, as well as Mary, declaring that it was better that God should take away the ladies Mary and Elizabeth, than that, by marrying foreign princes, they should endanger the existence of the Reformed Church. Ridley set forth the same doctrine, although it was well known that Elizabeth had rejected the offer of one foreign prince, and had evinced a disinclination to marriage altogether. Nothing, therefore, could be more unfair than rejecting her, for fear of a contingency that never might, and in fact, never did happen. The name of conscience was, however, the watchword under which Northumberland and his accomplices had carried their point with their pious young sovereign, when they induced him to set aside the rightful heirs and bequeath the crown to Lady Jane Grey. Elizabeth kept her state at Hatfield House during the last few months of Edward's reign. The expenses of her household amounted to an average of £3,938, according to one of her household books, from October 1st, 5th of Edward the Sixth, to the last day of September in the sixth year of that prince, in the possession of Lord Strangford. It is entitled, The Account of Thomas Perry, Esquire, Cofferer to the Right Excellent Princess, the Lady Elizabeth, Her Grace, the King's Majesty's Most Honorable Sister. The above was the style and title used by Elizabeth during her royal brother's reign. Every page of the book is signed at the bottom by her own hand. Her cellar appears to have been well stocked with beer, sweet wine, Rhenish and Gascon wines. Lamprey pies were once entered as a present. The wages of her household servants for a quarter of a year amounted to 82 pounds, 17 shillings, 8 pence. The liveries for velvet coats for thirteen gentlemen, at forty shillings the coat, amounted to twenty-six pounds. The liveries of her yeomen, to seventy-eight pounds, eighteen shillings. She paid for the making of her turnspits coats, nine shillings and two pence. Given in alms at sundry times, to poor men and women, seven pounds, fifteen shillings, eight pence. Among the entries for the chamber and robes are the following. Paid to John Spithonius, 
the seventeenth of may for books and to mr allen for a bible twenty seven shillings four pence paid to edmund allen for a bible twenty shillings third of november to the keeper of hertford jail for fees of john wingfield being in ward thirteen shillings four pence paid fourteenth of december to blanche perry for her half year's annuity a hundred shillings and to blanche courtney for the like sixty six shillings eight pence paid december fourteenth at the christening of mr pendred's child by warrant doth appear one shilling paid in reward unto sundry persons at st james's her grace then being there namely the king's footman eleven shillings the underkeeper of st james's ten shillings the gardener five shillings to one russell groom of the king's great chamber ten shillings to the wardrobe eleven shillings the violins ten shillings a frenchman that gave a book to her grace ten shillings the keeper of the park gate at st james's ten shillings from another of elizabeth's account books in the possession of gustavus brander esq the antiquarian reparatory quotes the following additional items two french hoods two pounds nine shillings nine pence half a yard and two nails of velvet four partlets eighteen shillings nine pence paid to edward allen for a bible one pound paid to the kings edward the sixth droner or bagpiper and pfeiffer twenty shillings to mr haywood thirty shillings and to sebastian towards the charge of the children with the carriage of the players garments four pounds nineteen shillings paid to sundry persons at st james's her grace being there nine pounds fifteen shillings to beaumont the king's servant for his boys that played before her grace ten shillings in reward to certain persons on the tenth of august this was after mary's accession to former who played on the lute to mr ashfield's servant for two prize oxen and ten muttons twenty shillings more the harper thirty shillings to him that made her grace a table of walnut tree forty four shillings nine pence to mr caucus's servant that brought her grace a sturgeon six shillings eight pence to my lord russell's minstrels twenty shillings accounts of thomas perry cofferer of her household till october fifteen fifty three the last documentary record of elizabeth in the reign of edward the sixth is a letter addressed by her to the lords of the council relating to some of her landed property concerning which there was a dispute between her tenant smith and my lord privy seal the earl of bedford she complains of having been evilly handled by the minister though she denies taking part with smith in the controversy against him all she wishes is she says to enjoy her own right in quietness she requests in conclusion her humble commendations to the king's majesty for whose health she says i pray daily and daily and evermore shall so do during my life at hatfield the last day of may fifteen fifty three End of section 4。section 5 of the lives of the queens of England, volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, chapter 2, part 2 on the morning of the sixth of july edward expired at greenwich but his death was kept secret for the purpose of securing the persons of his sisters to both of whom deceitful letters were written in his name by order of northumberland requiring them to hasten to england to visit him in his sickness the effect of this treacherous missive on mary her narrow escape and subsequent proceedings have been related in her memoir in the preceding volume of the lives of the queens of england elizabeth more wary or better informed of what was in agitation by some secret friend at court supposed to be cecil instead of obeying the guileful summons remained quietly at hatfield to watch the event this was presently certified to her by the arrival of commissioners from the duke of northumberland who after announcing the death of the young king and his appointment of lady jane grey for his successor 
offered her a large sum of money and a considerable grant of lands, as the price of her acquiescence, if she would make a voluntary secession of her own rights in the succession, which she was in no condition to assert. Elizabeth, with equal wisdom and courage, replied, that they must first make their agreement with her elder sister, during whose lifetime she had no claim or title to resign. Letty assures us that she also wrote a letter of indignant expostulation to Northumberland on the wrong that had been done to her sister and herself by proclaiming his daughter-in-law queen. A fit of sickness, real, or as some have insinuated, feigned, preserved Elizabeth from the peril of taking any share in the contest for the crown. Her defenseless position and her proximity to the metropolis placed her in a critical predicament, and if by feigning illness she avoided being conducted to the tower by Northumberland's partisans, she acted as a wise woman, seeing that discretion is the better part of valor. But, sick or well, she preserved her integrity, and as soon as the news of her sister's successes reached her, she forgot her indisposition, and hastened to give public demonstrations of her loyalty and affection to her person, by going in state to meet and welcome her, on her triumphant progress to the metropolis. The general assertion of historians, that Elizabeth raised a military force for the support of Queen Mary, is erroneous, she was powerless in the first instance, and the popular outburst in favor of Mary rendered it needless after the first week's reign of the nine days queen was over. On the 29th of July, according to the Cottonian manuscript, quoted by Stripe, Elizabeth came riding from her seat in the country along Fleet Street to Somerset House, which now belonged to her, attended by 2,000 horse armed with spears, bows, and guns. In this retinue appeared Sir John Williams and Sir John Bridges, and her chamberlain, all being dressed in green, but their coats were faced with velvet, satin, taffeta, silk or cloth, according to their quality. This retinue of Elizabeth assumed a less warlike character on the morrow, when it appears that Mary had disbanded her armed militia. When Elizabeth rode through Aldgate next day, on her road to meet her sister, she was accompanied by a thousand persons on horseback, a great number of whom were ladies of rank. The royal sisters met at Wainstead, where Elizabeth and her train paid their first homage to Queen Mary, who received them very graciously, and kissed every lady presented by Elizabeth. On the occasion of Mary's triumphant entrance into London, the royal sisters rode side by side, in the grand equestrian procession, the youthful charms of Elizabeth, then in her twentieth year, the majestic grace of her tall and finely proportioned figure, attracted every eye, and formed a contrast, disadvantageous to Mary, who was nearly double her age, small in person, and faded prematurely by early sorrow, sickness, and anxiety. The pride and reserve of Mary's character would not allow her to condescend to the practice of any of those arts of courting popularity, in which Elizabeth, who rendered everything subservient to the master passion of her soul, ambition, was a practice adept. In every look, word, and action, Elizabeth studied effect, and on this occasion it was noticed that she took every opportunity of displaying the beauty of her hand, of which she was not a little vain. Within one little month after their public entrance into London, the evil spirits of the times had succeeded in rekindling the sparks of jealousy between the Catholic Queen and the Protestant heiress of the throne. That Mary, after all the mortifications that had been inflicted upon her at Elizabeth's birth, had had the magnanimity to regard her with sisterly feelings, is a fact that renders the divisions that were effected between them the more deeply to be regretted. When Mary, who had never dissembled her religious opinions, made known her intentions of restoring the Mass and all the ancient ceremonials that had been abolished by King Edward's council, the Protestants naturally took alarm. Symptoms of disaffection towards their new sovereign betrayed themselves, in the enthusiastic regard which they lavished on Elizabeth, who became the beacon of hope, to which the champions of the Reformation turned, as the horizon darkened around them. 
but it was not only on those to whom a sympathy in religious opinions endeared her that elizabeth had succeeded in making a favorable impression for she was already so completely established as the darling of the people of england that pope julius the third in one of his letters adverting to the report made by his envoy commendioni on the state of queen mary's government says that heretic and schismatic sister formally substituted for her queen mary in the succession by their father is in the heart and mouth of every one the refusal of elizabeth to attend mass while it excited the most lively feelings of admiration for her sincerity and courage among the protestants gave great offence to the queen and her council and the princess was sternly enjoined to conform to the catholic rites elizabeth was resolute in her refusal she even declined under pretext of indisposition being present at the ceremonial of making her kinsman courtney an earl this was construed into disrespect for the queen some of the more headlong zealots by whom mary was surrounded recommended that she should be put under arrest mary refused to consent to a measure at once unpopular and unjustified but endeavored by alternate threats persuasions and promises to prevail on her sister to accompany her to the chapel royal the progress of the contest between the queen and her sister on this case of conscience is thus detailed by the french ambassador noel in a letter dated september sixth elizabeth will not hear mass nor accompany her sister to the chapel whatever remonstrance either the queen or the lords on her side have been able to make to her on this subject it is feared that she is counselled in her obstinacy by some of the magnates who are disposed to stir up fresh troubles last saturday and sunday continues he the queen caused her to be preached to and entreated by all the great men of the council one after the other but their importunity only elicited from her at last a very rude reply the queen was greatly annoyed by the firmness of elizabeth which promised to prove a serious obstacle to the restoration of papacy in england the faction that had attempted to sacrifice the rights of both the daughters of henry the eighth by proclaiming lady jane grey queen gathered hopes from the dissension between the royal sisters elizabeth however who had no intention of unsettling the recently established government of the sickly sovereign to whom she was heir presumptive when she found that it was suspected that her nonconformity proceeded from disaffection demanded an audience with queen mary and throwing herself on her knees before her she told her weeping at the same time that she saw plainly how little affection her majesty appeared to have for her and that she knew she had done nothing to offend her except in the article of religion in which she was excusable having been brought up in the creed she at present professed without having ever heard any doctor who could have instructed her in the other she entreated the queen therefore to let her have some books explanatory of doctrine contrary to that set forth in the protestant books she had hitherto read and she would commence a course of study from works composed expressly in defence of the catholic creed which perhaps might lead her to adopt other sentiments she also requested to have some learned man appointed for her instructor the queen received these overtures in a conciliatory spirit and elizabeth appeared with her at the celebration of mass on the eighth of september a festival by which the church of rome commemorates the nativity of the blessed virgin griffith affirms that elizabeth did this with a bad grace and gave evident tokens of repugnance but she voluntarily wrote to the emperor charles v requesting him to send a cross chalices and other ecclesiastical ornaments for a chapel which she intended she said to open in her own house by these condescensions to expediency elizabeth succeeded for a time in maintaining her footing at court and securing her proper place in the approaching ceremonials of the coronation as next in rank to her sister the queen in the splendid pageant of the royal cavalcade from the tower to westminster on the preceding day elizabeth wore a french dress of white and silver tissue and was seated with anne of cleves her sometime stepmother in a chariot drawn by six horses trapped also with white and silver 
which followed immediately after the gold canopied litter in which the sovereign was born. At the coronation, Elizabeth was again paired with the Lady Anne of Cleves, who had precedency over every other lady in court. These two princesses also dined at the same table with the queen at the banquet, an honor which was not vouchsafed to any other person there. During all the festivities and royal pageants that succeeded the coronation, Mary gave public testimonials of respect and sisterly regard for Elizabeth, by holding her by the hand, and placing her next to herself at table. This Noel notices that she did, in particular, at the great banquet given to the Spanish ambassador and his suite. Elizabeth was also prayed for, as the queen's sister, by Dr. Harpsfield, at the opening of the convocation at Westminster, immediately after the coronation. Stripe, who honestly narrates the fact, complains that nothing was added in her commendation, but this, as she was opposed to the doctrines of the Church of Rome, was scarcely to be expected from other divines, neither were the deceitful terms of flattery, which were conventionally used towards the members of the royal family, of such importance to Elizabeth, as her public recognition, by her sister's hierarchy and divines, as the heiress presumptive to the throne. This was of the greater moment to Elizabeth, because, by the act which passed immediately after the meeting of Mary's first parliament, confirming the marriage of Henry the Eighth and Catherine of Aragon, and establishing the legitimacy of the queen, the subsequent marriage of Henry with Anne Boleyn was rendered null and void, and the birth of Elizabeth illegitimate in point of law, although, from motives of decency, as well as sound policy, it was not declared so. Elizabeth was the darling of the people, and as long as her reversionary claims to the regal succession were recognized by the reigning sovereign, she stood beside the throne, as a check to the plots of the aspiring House of Suffolk, on the one hand, and the designs of the French party on the other. Lady Jane Grey was still living and unforgotten, and Henry the Second of France treated his daughter-in-law, the young Queen of Scots, as the rightful sovereign of England, on the plea that neither of the daughters of Henry the Eighth were legitimate. Their father had stigmatized the birth of both Mary and Elizabeth, and the subservient Parliament of June, 1536, had, in obedience to his unjust intention, of preferring any future daughters, that might be born to him by Jane Seymour or her successors, to the issue of Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn, formally declared the royal sisters illegitimate, and incapable of succeeding to the throne. The act for settling the succession in 1545, and the will of Henry the Eighth had indeed taken away the latter clause, but the declaration of illegitimacy remained unrepealed, and had been further insisted upon, in the will of the late king, Edward the Sixth, by the exclusion of both princesses, in favor of the granddaughter of the youngest sister of Henry the Eighth. The experiment of placing a juvenile scion, from a collateral branch of the royal family, on the throne, had been displeasing to the nation in general. Not only Catholics, but Protestants had united, in opposing so flagrant a violation of the old established laws of the regal succession in England. The miseries caused by the Wars of the Roses had proved a salutary lesson on the danger of permitting a temporary alienation of the crown from the direct line of primogeniture, and a mighty majority of the people had vested the sovereignty in the person of Mary Tudor, according to the letter of her father's will, the conditions of which she never violated with regard to Elizabeth's reversionary claim to the succession. So far, the interests of Elizabeth were united with those of her sister, but when the act which established the legitimacy of the queen passed, she and her friends took umbrage, because it tacitly implied the fact that she was not born in lawful wedlock. If Elizabeth had acted with profound policy, which marked her subsequent conduct, she would not have called attention to this delicate point, by evincing her displeasure, but her pride was piqued, and she demanded permission to withdraw from court. It was refused, and a temporary estrangement took place between her and the queen. Noel, the French ambassador, whose business it was to pave the way for the succession of the young queen of Scots to the throne of England, by the destruction of the present heiress presumptive, 
fomented the differences between the royal sisters with fiend-like subtlety and satisfaction henry the second made the most liberal offers of money and advice to elizabeth while in fancy he exalted the idea of her disgrace and death and the recognition of his royal daughter-in-law as the future sovereign of the britannic isles from sea to sea under the matrimonial dominion of his eldest son the brilliancy of such a prospect rendered the french monarch and his ministers reckless of the restraints of honor conscience and humanity which might tend to impede its realization and elizabeth was marked out first as their puppet and finally as the victim of a plot which might possibly end in the destruction not only of one sister but both the protestant party alarmed at the zeal of queen mary for the re-establishment of the old catholic institutions and detesting the idea of her spanish marriage were easily excited to enter into any project for averting the evils they foresaw a plot was devised for raising the standard of revolt against queen mary's government in the joint names of the princess elizabeth and courtney earl of devonshire to whom they proposed to unite her in marriage that courtney who had been piqued at mary's decline to accept him for her husband entered into a confederacy which promised him a younger and more attractive royal bride with the prospect of a crown for her dowry there is no doubt though the romantic tales in which some modern historians have indulged touching his passion for elizabeth are somewhat apocryphal the assertion that he refused the proffered hand of mary on account of his disinterested preference for elizabeth is decidedly untrue it was not till convinced of the hopelessness of his suit to the queen that he allowed himself to be implicated in a political engagement to marry elizabeth who if consenting to the scheme appears to have been wholly a passive agent cautiously avoiding any personal participation in the confederacy till she saw how it was likely to end it is therefore difficult to say how far her heart was touched by the external graces of her handsome but weak-minded kinsman the difficulties of her position at this crisis were extreme distrusted by the queen watched and calumniated by the spanish ambassador renaud assailed by the misjudging enthusiasm of the protestant party with spiritual adulation and entreated to stand forth as the heroine of their cause and tempted by the persuasions and treacherous promises of the subtle noel it required caution and strength of mind seldom found in a girl of twenty not to fall into some of the snares which so thickly beset her path noel made his house a rendezvous for the discontented protestants and the disaffected of every description midnight conferences were held there at which courtney was a prominent person though the pusillanimity of his character rendered it difficult to stir him up to anything like open enterprise noel informed his court that though elizabeth and courtney were proper instruments for the purpose of exciting a popular rising courtney was so timorous that he would suffer himself to be taken before he would act the event proved the accuracy of this judgment by the dint however of great nursing the infant conspiracy began to assume a more decided form and as elizabeth could not be induced to unite herself openly with the confederates noel affirms that they intended to surprise and carry her away to marry her to courtney and conduct them into devonshire and cornwall where courtney had powerful friends they imagined that a general rising would take place in their favor in the west of england with a simultaneous revolt of the suffolk faction in the east and other parts where they greatly miscalculated the popular feeling against the queen elizabeth meantime perceiving the perils that beset her on the one hand from the folly of her injudicious friends and on the other from the malignity of her foes and alarmed at the altered manner of the queen towards her reiterated her entreaties to be permitted to retire to one of her houses in the country the leave was granted and the day for her departure actually fixed but the representations of the spanish minister that she was deeply engaged in plots against her majesty's government and that she only wished to escape from observation by withdrawing herself into the country in order to have the better opportunity of carrying on her intrigues with the disaffected caused queen mary to forbid her to quit the palace 
so much incensed was the queen at the reports that were daily brought to her of the disloyalty of elizabeth that she would not admit her to her presence and inflicted upon her the severe mortification of allowing the countess of lennox and the duchess of suffolk to take precedency of her elizabeth then absented herself from the chapel royal and confined herself to her own chamber on which the queen forbade any of her ladies to visit her there without a special permission so considerable however was the influence elizabeth had already acquired among the female aristocracy of england and so powerful was the sympathy excited for her at this period that in defiance of the royal mandate all the young gentlewomen of the court visited her daily and all day long in her chamber and united in manifesting the most ardent affection for her elizabeth received these flattering tokens of regard with answering warmth in the vain hope that the strength of her party would place her on a more independent footing but of course it only rendered her case worse by exciting jealousy and provoking anger she was sedulously watched by the council spies in her own household made almost hourly reports of all her movements and every visit she received by one of these traitors information was conveyed to mary's ministers that a refugee french preacher had secret interviews with her on which the spanish ambassador advised that she should be sent to the tower renaud also charged noel the french ambassador with holding private nocturnal conferences with the princess in her own chamber this noel angrily denied and a violent altercation took place between the two diplomatists on the subject two of the queen's ministers paget and arundel then waited on elizabeth and informed her of the accusation she found no difficulty in disproving a charge of which she was really innocent and with some emotion expressed her gratitude for not having been condemned unheard and entreated them never to give credit to the calumnies that might hereafter be circulated against her without allowing her an opportunity of justifying herself the queen after this explanation as a pledge of her reconciliation with elizabeth presented her with a double set of large and valuable pearls and having granted her permission to retire into the country dismissed her with tokens of respect and affection it was in the beginning of december that elizabeth obtained the long-delayed leave from her royal sister to retire to her own house at ashridge in buckinghamshire but even there a jealous watch was kept on all her movements and those of her servants never had captive bird panted more to burst from the thraldom of a cage than she to escape from the painful restraints and restless intrigues of the court where she was one day threatened with a prison and the next flattered with the prospect of a crown but the repose for which she sighed was far remote instead of enjoying the peaceful pursuits of learning or sylvan sports in her country abode she was harassed with a matrimonial proposal which had been suggested to mary by the spanish cabinet in behalf of the prince of piedmont it was not being considered expedient for the queen to solemnize her unpopular nuptials with philip of spain till elizabeth was wedded to a foreign husband elizabeth resolutely refused to listen to the pretensions of the prince of piedmont and she also declined the overtures that were privately renewed to her by the king of denmark in favor of his son whom she had refused during her brother's reign in all the trials mortifications and perplexities which surrounded her she kept her eyes steadily fixed on the bright reversion of the crown of england and positively refused to marry out of the realm even when the only alternative appeared to be a foreign husband or a scaffold the sarcastic proverb defend me from my friends and i will take care of my foes was never more fully exemplified in the case of elizabeth during the first year of her sister's reign for an army of declared enemies would have been less perilous to her than the insidious caresses of the king of france and his ambassador henry wrote to her letters with unbounded offers of assistance and protection and he advanced just enough money to the conspirators to involve them in the odium of receiving bribes from france without bearing the slightest proportion to their wants he endeavored to persuade elizabeth to take refuge in his dominions but if she had fallen into such a snare she would have found herself in much the same situation as mary queen of scots was 
when she sought an asylum in her realm. The only result of this correspondence was, that it involved Elizabeth in the greatest peril, when letters in cipher, supposed to be from her in reply to Henry, were intercepted. On the 21st of January, 1553-54, to 54, Gardiner drew from the weak or treacherous Courtney the secrets of the Confederacy, of which he was to have been the leader and the hero. The conspirators on the following day learned that they had been betrayed, and found themselves under the fatal necessity of anticipating their plans by taking up arms. Wyatt immediately sent to Elizabeth an earnest recommendation to retire from the vicinity of the metropolis. Young Russell, the son of the Earl of Bedford, who was a secret member of the Confederacy, was the bearer of the letter, and it seems that he was the agent through whom all communications between Wyatt and her were carried on. Sir James Crofts also saw and urged her to adopt this plan. Elizabeth perceived her peril, and determined not to take any step, that might be construed into an overt act of treason. She knew the weak and unsteady elements of which the Confederacy was composed. Courtney had proven a broken reed, and of all people in the world, she had the least reason to place confidence in either the wisdom, the firmness, or the integrity of the Duke of Suffolk, who would, of course, if successful, endeavor to replace his daughter, Lady Jane Grey, on the throne. Common sense must have convinced Elizabeth that he could have no other motive for his participation in the revolt. It was probably her very apprehension of such a result that led this suspicious princess into an incipient acquiescence in the conspiracy, that she might obtain positive information as to the real nature of their projects, so that if she found them hostile to her own interests, the power of denouncing the whole affair to the queen would be in her own hands. Under any circumstances, Elizabeth would have found a straightforward path the safest. Letters addressed to her by the French ambassador, and also by Wyatt, were intercepted by Queen Mary's ministers. Russell was placed under arrest, and confessed that he had been the medium of secret correspondence with the leaders of the Confederacy and Elizabeth. Wyatt unfurled the standard of revolt on the 25th of January, and the Queen sent her royal mandate to Elizabeth on the 26th, enjoining her immediate return to court, where, however she assured her, she would be heartily welcome. Elizabeth mistrusted the invitation and took to her bed, sending a verbal message to the queen, that she was too ill at present to travel, that as soon as she was able she would come, and prayed her majesty's forbearance for a few days. After the lapse of several days, the officers of Elizabeth's household addressed a letter to her majesty's council, to explain, that increased indisposition on the part of their mistress was the sole cause that prevented her from repairing to the queen's highness, and though they continued in hope of her amendment, they saw no appearance of it, and therefore they considered it their duty, considering the perilous attempts of the rebels, to apprise their lordships of her state. Mary received this excuse, and waited for the coming of Elizabeth till the 10th of February. During that eventful fortnight, a formidable insurrection had broken out, of which the ostensible object was the dethronement of the queen, and the elevation of Elizabeth to the regal office. The French and Venetian ambassadors had both intrigued with the disaffected, and supplied them with money and arms. Mary had been attacked in her own palace by Wyatt's army of insurgents. She had quelled the insurrection, and proceeded to measures of great severity, to deter her factious subjects from further attempts to disturb the public peace. Terror was stricken into every heart when it was known that a warrant was issued for the immediate execution of Lady Jane Grey and her husband. Wyatt and others of the Confederates, with the view of escaping the penalty of their own rash attempts, basely denounced Elizabeth and Courtney as the exciters of the treasonable designs, that had deluged the metropolis with blood, and shaken the throne of Mary. Elizabeth had fortified her house meantime, and introduced an armed force within her walls, probably for a defense against the partisans of Lady Jane Grey, but of course, her enemies and the Spanish party insisted that it was intended as a defiance of the royal authority. The queen, who had every reason to distrust her loyalty, then dispatched Lord William Howard, 
Sir Edward Hastings, and Sir Thomas Cornwallis, to bring her to court. With these gentlemen, she sent her own physicians, Dr. Owen and Dr. Wendy, to ascertain whether Elizabeth was really able to bear the journey. Now Dr. Wendy, to his honor be it remembered, was instrumental in the preservation of Queen Catherine Parr's life, by the prudent counsel he gave her at the time of her extreme peril, and also, as it has been supposed, by acting as a mediator between her and King Henry. He had known Elizabeth from her childhood, and his appearance would rather have had the effect of inspiring her with hope and confidence than terror. Be that as it may, he and his coadjutor decided that she might be removed without peril of her life. Their three commissioners then required an audience of the princess, who, guessing their errand, no doubt, refused to see them, and when they entered the chamber, it being past ten o'clock at night, she said, Is the haste such, that it might not have pleased you to come in the morning? They made answer, That they were sorry to see her grace in such a state. And I, replied she, am not glad to see you at this time of night. This little dialogue, which rests on the authority of Hollingshed, is characteristic, and likely enough to have taken place, although it is not mentioned in the following letter of the commissioners to the Queen. We are, however, to bear in mind that Elizabeth's great-uncle, Lord William Howard, who appears to have been the leading man on the occasion, would scarcely have related any speech on the part of his young kinswoman, likely to have been construed by the queen and her council as an act of contumacy. On the contrary, he describes Elizabeth as using the most dutiful and compliant expressions, only fearful of encountering the fatigue of a journey in her weak state. Any one, from his report, would have imagined her to be the meekest and gentlest of all invalids. The Lord Admiral, Lord William Howard, Sir Edward Hastings, and Sir Thomas Cornwallis, to the Queen. In our humble wives, it may please your Highness to be advertised, that yesterday, immediately upon our arrival at Ashridge, we required to have access unto my Lady Elizabeth's grace, which obtained, we delivered unto her your Highness's letter, and I, the Lord Admiral, declared the effect of your highness's pleasure, according to the credence given to us, being before advertised of her state, by your highness's physicians, by whom we did perceive the state of her body to be such, that, without danger to her person, we might well proceed to require her, in your majesty's name, all excuses set apart, to repair to your highness, with all convenient speed and diligence." whereunto we found her grace very willing and conformable save only that she much feared her weakness to be so great that she should not be able to travel and to endure the journey without peril of life and therefore desired some longer respite until she had better recovered her strength but in conclusion upon the persuasion as much of us as of her own counsel and servants whom we assure your highness we have found very ready and forward to the accomplishment of your highness's pleasure in this behalf she is resolved to remove hence to-morrow towards your highness with such journeys as by a paper herein enclosed your highness shall perceive further declaring to your highness that her grace much desireth if it might stand with your highness's pleasure that she might have a lodging at her coming to court somewhat further from the water that is the Thames, than she had at her last being there, which your physicians, considering the state of her body, thinketh very meet, who have travailed, or taken great pains, very earnestly with her grace, both before our coming and after, in this matter. And after her first day's journey, one of us shall await upon your highness, so declare more at large, the whole state of our proceedings here, and even so, we shall most humbly beseech Christ, long to preserve your highness in honor, health, and the contentation of your godly heart's desire. From Ashridge, the 11th of February, at four of the clock in the afternoon, your highness's most humble and bounden servants and subjects, W. Howard, Edward Hastings, T. Cornwallis. The paper enclosed, sketching the plan of their progress to London, a document of no slight importance, considering the falsified statement which has been embodied in history, is as follows. 
the order of my lady elizabeth's grace's voyage to the court monday in primus to mr cook's six miles tuesday item to mr pope's eight miles wednesday to mr stamford's seven miles thursday to highgate mr comely's house seven miles friday to westminster five miles such is the official report of elizabeth's maternal kinsman lord william howard attested by the signatures of two other noble gentlemen motives of worldly interest to say nothing of the tithes of nature would have inclined lord william howard to cherish and support as far as he could with safety to himself an heiress presumptive to the crown so nearly connected in blood with his own illustrious house he was the brother of her grandmother lady elizabeth howard and in the probable event of queen mary's death without issue it was only reasonable for this veteran statesman to calculate on directing the counsels of his youthful niece and exercising the executive power of the crown he was a man whom elizabeth both loved and honored and she testified her grateful remembrance of his kindness after her accession to the crown if mary had intended elizabeth to be treated as barbarously as fox has represented she would have selected some other agent for the minister of her cruelty end of section five Section 6 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 2, Part 3. The letter of the commissioners to the Queen is dated February 11th, which was a Sunday, contrary to the assertions of Fox and Hollingshed. They remained at Ashridge the whole of that day and night, and it was not till monday morning the twelfth that they proceeded to remove elizabeth it was the day appointed for the execution of the lady jane gray and lord guilford dudley and even the strong mind and lion-like spirit of elizabeth must have quailed at the appalling nature of her own summons to the metropolis and the idea of commencing her journey in so ominous an hour thrice she was near fainting as she was led between two of her escort to the royal litter which the queen had sent for her accommodation her bodily weakness or some other cause appears to have caused a deviation from the original program of the journey for the places where she halted were not the same as those specified by the commissioners in their letter to the queen she reached redburn in a feeble condition the first night on the second she rested at sir ralph rollett's house at st albans on the third at mr dodd's at memes on the fourth at highgate where she remained at mr cholmley's house a night and day according to hollinshed but most probably it was longer as she did not enter london till the twenty third of february and noel in a letter dated the twenty first makes the following report of her condition to his own court while the city is covered with gibbets and the public buildings crowded with the heads of the bravest men in the kingdom who by the by had given but an indifferent sample of their valor the princess elizabeth for whom no better fate is foreseen is lying ill about seven or eight miles from hence so swollen and disfigured that her death is expected he expresses doubts whether she would reach london alive notwithstanding this piteous description of her sufferings and prospects his excellency in another place calls the indisposition of elizabeth a favorable illness and the phrase has led some persons into the notion that her sickness was feigned for the purpose of exciting popular sympathy but he certainly means merely to intimate that it occurred at a seasonable time for her and was probably the means of saving her from the same punishment that had just been inflicted on her youthful kinswoman lady jane gray that elizabeth was suffering severely both in mind and body at this terrific crisis there can be no doubt and if she made the most of her illness to gain time and delay her approach to the dreaded scene of blood and horror which the metropolis presented in consequence of the recent executions no one can blame her but when the moment came for her public entrance into london as a prisoner of state 
her firmness returned and the spirit of the royal heroine triumphed over the weakness of the invalid and the terrors of the woman her deportment on that occasion is thus finely described by an eyewitness who thirsted for her blood simon renaud the spanish ambassador in a letter to her great enemy the emperor charles v dated february twenty fourth fifteen fifty four the lady elizabeth says he arrived here yesterday dressed all in white surrounded with a great company of the queen's people besides her own attendants she made them uncover the litter in which she rode that she might be seen by the people her countenance was pale and stern her mien proud lofty and disdainful by which she endeavoured to conceal her trouble a hundred gentlemen in velvet coats formed a sort of guard of honour for elizabeth on this occasion next her person and they were followed by a hundred more in coats of fine red cloth guarded with black velvet this was probably the royal livery the road on both sides the way from highgate to london was thronged with gazing crowds some of whom wept and bewailed her it must indeed have been a pageant of most tragic interest considering the excited state of the public mind for suffolk had been executed that morning and it was only eleven days since the young lovely and interesting lady jane grey had been brought to the block many persons in that crowd remembered the execution of elizabeth's mother queen anne boleyn not quite seventeen years ago and scarcely anticipated a better fate for her whom they now saw conducted through their streets a guarded captive having arrayed herself in white robes emblematic of innocence her youth her pallid cheek and searching glance appealed to them for sympathy and it might be for succour but neither arm nor voice was raised in her defence in all that multitude and this accounts for the haughty and scornful expression which renaud observed in her countenance as she gazed upon them perhaps she thought with sarcastic bitterness of the familiar proverb a little help is worth a deal of pity the cavalcade passed through smithfield and fleet street to whitehall between four and five in the afternoon and entered the palace through the garden whatever might be her inward alarm elizabeth assumed an intrepid bearing her cheek was pale but resolved and high were the words of her lip and the glance of her eye she boldly protested her innocence and demanded an interview with her sister the queen on the plea of mary's previous promise never to condemn her unheard mary declined seeing her and she was conducted to a quarter of the palace at westminster from which neither she nor her servants could go out without passing through the guards six ladies two gentlemen and four servants of her own retinue were permitted to remain in attendance on her person the rest of her train were sent into the city of london and lodged there it was on the fidelity and moral courage of these persons that the life of elizabeth depended and it is certain that several of them were implicated in the conspiracy courtney her affianced husband had been arrested on the twelfth of february in the house of the earl of sussex and was safely lodged in the bell tower and subjected to daily examinations he had previously given tokens of weakness and want of principle sufficient to fill every one with whom he had been politically connected with apprehension yet he seems to have acted honourably with regard to elizabeth for none of his admissions tended to implicate her nothing could be more agonizing than the state of suspense in which for three weeks elizabeth remained at whitehall while her fate was debated by her sister's privy council fortunately for her this body was agitated with jealousies and divided interests one party relentlessly urged the expediency of putting her to death and argued against the folly of sparing a traitoress who had entered into plots with foreign powers against her queen and country lord arundel and lord paget were the advocates of these ruthless counsels which however really emanated from the emperor charles v who considered elizabeth in the light of a powerful rival to the title of the bride-elect of his son philip and he laboured for her destruction in the same spirit that his grandfather ferdinand had made the execution of the unfortunate earl of warwick one of the secret articles of the marriage treaty of catherine of aragon and arthur prince of wales 
Besides this political animosity, Charles entertained a personal hatred to Elizabeth, because she was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, whose fatal charms had been the cause of so much evil to his beloved aunt. Bishop Gardiner, who was at that time opposed to the Spanish party, acted in this instance as the friend of Elizabeth and Courtney. He contended that there was no proof of a treasonable correspondence between them during the late insurrections, alleging the residence of Courtney in the Queen's household at St. James's Palace, and Elizabeth's dangerous sickness at Ashridge, as reasons why they were not, and could not have been, actually engaged in acts of treason, whatever might have been their intentions. In this matter, Gardner acted in the true spirit of a modern politician. He threw all the weight of his powerful talents and influence into the scale of mercy and justice, not for the sake of the good cause he advocated, but because it afforded him an opportunity of contending with his rivals on vantage ground. The murderous policy of Spain is thus shamelessly avowed by Renaud in one of his letters to his imperial master. The queen, he says, is advised to send her, Elizabeth, to the tower, since she is accused by Wyatt, named in the letters of the French ambassador, and suspected by her own counsel, and it is certain that the enterprise was undertaken in her favor. Assuredly, sire, if they do not punish her and Courtney, now that the occasion offers, the queen will never be secure, for I doubt that if she leaves her in the tower, when she goes to meet the parliament, some treasonable means will be found to deliver her or Courtney, or perhaps both, and then the last error will be worse than the first. The council was in possession of two notes addressed to Elizabeth by Wyatt, the first advising her to remove to Donnington, which was close to their headquarters. The second, after her neglecting to obey the queen's summons to court, informing her of his victorious entry into Southwark. Three dispatches of Noel to his own government had been intercepted and deciphered, which revealed all the plans of the conspirators in her favor. Noel, too, and that made the matter worse, had married one of her maids of honor, which circumstance, of course, afforded a direct facility for more familiar intercourse than otherwise could publicly have taken place between the disaffected heiress of the crown and the representative of a foreign power. In addition to these presumptive evidences, a letter, supposed to have been written by her to the King of France, had fallen into the hands of the Queen. The Duke of Suffolk, doubtless with a view to the preservation of his own daughter, Lady Jane Grey, had declared that the object of the conspiracy was the dethronement of the queen and the elevation of elizabeth to her place wyatt acknowledged that he had written more than one letter to elizabeth and charged courtney face to face with having first suggested the rebellion sir james crofts confessed that he had conferred with elizabeth and solicited her to retire to donnington lord russell that he had privately conveyed letters to her from wyatt and another prisoner that he had been privy to a correspondence between Carew and Courtney respecting the intended marriage between the nobleman and the princess. In short, a more disgusting series of treachery and cowardice never was exhibited than on this occasion, and if it be true that there is honor among thieves, that is to say, an observance of good faith towards each other in time of peril, it is certain nothing of the kind was to be found among these confederates, who respectively endeavored, by the denunciation of their associates, to shift the penalty of their mutual offenses to their fellows in misfortune. Wyatt's first confession was, that the Sieur Diossi, when he passed through England into Scotland, with the French ambassador to that country, spoke to Sir James Crofts, to persuade him to prevent the marriage of Queen Mary, with the heir of Spain, to raise Elizabeth to the throne, marry her to Courtney, and put the queen to death. He also confessed the promised aid that was guaranteed by the King of France to the Confederates, and the projected invasions from France and Scotland. We have this morning, writes Mr. Secretary Bourne, travailed with Sir Thomas Wyatt, touching the Lady Elizabeth and her servant, Sir William St. Lo, and your Lordship shall understand that Wyatt affirmeth his former sayings, or depositions, and says further, that Sir James Crofts knoweth more, if he be sent for and examined. Whereupon, Crofts had been called before us and examined, and confesseth with Wyatt, 
charging St. Lowe with like matter, and further, as we shall declare unto your said lordships. Wherefore, under your correction, we think necessary, and beseech you to send for Mr. St. Lowe, and to examine him, or cause him to be sent hither by us to be examined. Crofts is plain, and will tell all. The Spanish ambassador in his report to the emperor, dated March 1st, affirms that Crofts had confessed the truth in a written deposition, and admitted, in plain terms, the intrigues of the French ambassador with the heretics and rebels. But this deposition has been vainly sought for in the state paper office. Great pains were taken by the Spanish faction to incense the queen, to the death against Elizabeth. Renaud even presumed to intimate that her betrothed husband, Don Philip, would not venture his person in England till Elizabeth and Courtney were executed, and endeavored, by every sort of argument, to tempt her to hasten her own marriage by the sacrifice of their lives. Irritated as Mary was against both, she could not resolve on shedding her sister's blood. She told the subtle statesman that she should act as the law decided, on the evidences of their guilt, but that the prisoners, whose guilt had actually been proved, should be executed before she left her metropolis, to open her parliament, which was summoned to meet at Oxford. She was in great perplexity in what manner to dispose of Elizabeth, for her own security, before she herself departed from London, and she asked the lords of her council, one by one, if either of them would take charge of that lady. They all declined the perilous responsibility, and then the stern resolution was adopted of sending her to the tower, after a stormy debate in council, on the justifiableness of such a measure. The truth was, Gardiner, finding himself likely to be left in a minority by his powerful rivals in the cabinet, succumbed to their wishes, and instead of opposing the motion, supported it, and kept his chancellorship, for a temporary reconciliation was then effected between him and the leaders of the Spanish faction, Arundel, Paget, and Petre, of which the blood of Elizabeth was the intended cement. From the moment this trimming statesman abandoned the liberal policy he had for a brief few months advocated, he shamed not to become the most relentless and determined of those who sought to bring the royal maiden to the block. On the Friday before Palm Sunday, he, with nine more of the council, came into her presence and there charged her, both with Wyatt's conspiracy and the rising lately made in the west by Sir Peter Carew and others, and told her it was the queen's pleasure that she should be removed to the tower. The name of this doleful prison, which her own mother, and more recently, her cousin Lady Jane Grey, had found their next step to the scaffold, filled her with dismay. I trust, said she, that her majesty will be far more gracious than to commit to that place a true and most innocent woman that never has offended her in thought, word, or deed. She then entreated the lords to intercede for her with the queen, which some of them compassionately promised to do, and testified much pity for her case. About an hour after, four of them, namely Gardiner, the Lord Steward, the Lord Treasurer, and the Earl of Sussex, returned with an order to discharge all her attendants, except her gentleman Usher, three gentlewomen, and two grooms of her chamber. Hitherto Elizabeth had been in the honourable keeping of the Lord Chamberlain, no other than her uncle, Lord William Howard, and Sir John Gage, but now that a sterner policy was adopted, a guard was placed in the two ante-rooms leading to her chamber, two lords with an armed force in the hall, and two hundred northern white coats in the garden, to prevent all possibility of rescue or escape. The next day the Earl of Sussex and another lord of the council announced to her, that a barge was in readiness to convey her to the tower, and she must prepare to go as the tide served, which would tarry for no one. This intimation seems to have inspired Elizabeth with a determination to outstay it, since the delay of every hour was important to her, whose fate hung on a balance so nicely poised. She implored to see the queen her sister, and that request being denied, she then entreated for permission to write to her, this was peremptorily refused by one of the noblemen, who told her, that he durst not suffer it, neither in his opinion, was it convenient. But the Earl of Sussex, whose generous nature was touched with manly compassion, bent his knee before her, and told her, she should have liberty to write her mind, and swore, 
as he was a true man he would himself deliver it to the queen whatsoever came of it and bring her back the answer elizabeth then addressed with the earnest eloquence of despair the following moving letter to her royal sister taking good care not to bring it to a conclusion till the tide had ebbed so far as it rendered it impossible to shoot the bridge with a barge that turn the lady elizabeth to the queen if ever did try this old saying that a king's word was more than another man's oath i must humbly beseech your majesty to verify it in me and to remember your last promise and my last demand that i be not condemned without answer and due proof which it seems that i now am for without cause proved i am by your counsel from you commanded to go to the tower a place more wanted for a false traitor than a true subject which though i know i deserve it not yet in the face of all this realm it appears proved i pray to god i may die the shamefulest death that any ever died if i may mean any such thing and to this present hour i protest before god who shall judge my truth whatsoever malice shall devise that i never practised counselled nor consented to anything that might be prejudicial to your person any way or dangerous to the state by any means and therefore i humbly beseech your majesty to let me answer afore yourself and not suffer me to trust your counsellors yea and that afore i go to the tower if it be possible if not before i be further condemned howbeit i trust assuredly that your highness will give me leave to do it afore i go that thus shamefully i may not be cried out on as i shall now be and yea that without cause let conscience move your highness to pardon this my boldness which innocency procures me to do together with hope of your natural kindness which i trust will not see me cast away without desert which what it is her desert i would desire no more of god but that i truly knew but which thing i think and believe you shall never by report know unless by yourself you hear i have heard of many in my time cast away for want of coming to the presence of their prince and in late days i heard my lord of somerset say that if his brother had been suffered to speak with him he had never suffered but persuasions were made to him so great that he was brought in belief that he could not safely live if the admiral lord thomas seymour lived and that made him give consent to his death though these persons are not to be compared to your majesty yet i pray god the like evil persuasions persuade not one sister against the other and all for that they have heard false report and the truth not known therefore once again kneeling with humbleness of heart because i am not suffered to bow the knees of my body i humbly crave to speak with your highness which i would not be so bold as to desire if i knew not myself most clear as i know myself most true and as for the traitor wyatt he might perventure write me a letter but on my faith i never received any from him and as for the copy of the letter sent to the french king i pray god confound me eternally if ever i sent him word message token or letter by any means and this truth i will stand in till my death your highness's most faithful subject that hath been from the beginning and will be to my end elizabeth i humbly crave but only one word of answer from yourself this letter written as has been shown on the spur of the moment possesses more perspicuity and power than any other composition from the pen of elizabeth she had not time to hammer out artificial sentences so completely entangled with far-fetched metaphors and pedantic quotations that a commentator is required to construe every one of her ambiguous paragraphs no such ambiguity is used here where she pleads for her life in good earnest and in unequivocal language appeals boldly from the inimical privy council to her sister's natural affection and the event proved in the end that she did not appeal in vain yet her majesty showed no symptoms of relenting at the time it was delivered being exceedingly angry with sussex for having lost the tide and according to renaud she rated her counsel soundly for having presumed to deviate from the instructions she had issued the next tide did not serve till midnight misgivings were felt lest some project were in agitation among her friends and confederates to effect a rescue under cover of the darkness and so it was decided that they would defer her removal till the following day 
This was Palm Sunday, and the council considered that it would be the safest plan to have the princess conveyed to the tower by water during the time of morning service, and on that account the people were strictly enjoined to carry their palms to church. Sussex and the Lord Treasurer were with Elizabeth soon after nine o'clock that morning, and informed her that the time was now come, that her grace must away with them to the tower. She replied, The Lord's will be done, I am contented, seeing as it is the Queen's pleasure. Yet as she was conducted through the garden to the barge, she turned her eyes towards every window in the lingering hope, as it was thought, of seeing someone who would espouse her cause, and finding herself disappointed in this, she passionately exclaimed, I marvel what the nobles mean by suffering me, a prince, to be led into captivity. The Lord knoweth wherefore, for myself I do not. Her escort hurried her to the barge, being anxious to pass the shores of London at a time when they would be least likely to attract attention. But in their efforts, not to be too late, they were too early, for the tide had not risen sufficiently high to allow the barge to shoot the bridge, where the fall of the water was so great that the experienced boatmen declined attempting it. The peers urged them to proceed, and they lay hovering upon the water in extreme danger for a time, and at length their caution was overpowered by the imperative orders of the two noblemen, who insisted on their passing the arch. They reluctantly essayed to do so, and struck the stern of the barge against the starling, and not without great difficulty and much peril, succeeded in clearing it. Not one, perhaps, of the anxious spectators, who from the houses which at that time overhung the bridge, beheld the jeopardy of that boat's company, suspected the quality of the pale girl, whose escape from a watery grave must have elicited an ejaculation of thanksgiving from many a kindly heart. Elizabeth objected to being landed at the traitor's gate. Neither well could she, unless she should step into the water over her shoe, she said. One of the lords told her, she must not choose, and as it was then raining, offered her his cloak. She dashed it from her with a good dash, says our author, and as she set her foot on the stairs, exclaimed, here lands as true a subject, being prisoner, as ever landed at these stairs, before thee, O God, I speak it, having no other friend but thee alone. To which the nobles who escorted her replied, If it were so, it was the better for her. When she came to the gate, a number of the warders and servants belonging to the tower were drawn up in rank, and some of them, as she passed, knelt and prayed God to preserve her grace, for which they were afterwards reprimanded. Instead of passing through the gates to which she had been thus conducted, Elizabeth seated herself on a cold damp stone, with the evident intention of not entering a prison which had proved so fatal to her race. Bridges, the lieutenant of the tower, said to her, Madam, you had best come out of the rain, for you sit unwholesomely. Better sit here than in a worse place, she replied, for God knoweth, not I, whither you will bring me. On hearing these words, her gentleman usher burst into a passion of weeping, which she perceiving, chid him for his weakness in thus giving way to his feelings, and discouraging her, whom he ought rather to comfort and support, especially knowing her truth to be such that no man had any cause to weep for her. When, however, she was inducted into the apartment appointed for her confinement, and the doors made fast upon her with locks and bolts, she was sore dismayed, but called for her book, and gathering the sorrowful remnant of her servants round her, begged them to unite with her in prayer for the divine protection and succor. Meantime, the lords of the council who had brought her to the tower proceeded to deliver their instructions to the authorities, there for her safe keeping. But when some measure of unnecessary rigor was suggested by one of the commissioners, the Earl of Sussex, who appears to have been thoroughly disgusted with the ungracious office that had been put upon him and the unmanly conduct of his associates, sternly admonished them in these words. Let us take heed, my lords, that we go not beyond our commission, for she was our king's daughter, and is, we know, the prince next in blood. Wherefore let us so deal with her now, that we have not, if it so happen, to answer for our dealings hereafter. End of section 6
Section 7 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 3, Part 1. It was on the 18th of March that Elizabeth was lodged in the tower, and she was soon afterwards subjected to a rigorous examination by the Lord Chancellor Gardiner, with nine other of the Lords of the Council. They questioned her on her motives for her projected remove to Donington Castle during the late insurrection. Elizabeth, being taken by surprise, allowed her natural propensity for dissimulation to betray her into the childish evocation of affecting to be unconscious that she had such a house as Donington. When Sir James Crofts was brought in and confronted with her, she recollected herself and said, as touching my remove to Donington, my officers and you, Sir James Crofts, being then present, can well testify whether any rash or unbeseeming word did then pass my lips, which might not have well become a faithful and loyal subject. Thus adjured, Sir James Crofts knelt to her and said, He was heartily sorry to be brought in that day to be a witness against her grace, but he took God to record that he never knew anything of her worthy the least suspicion. My lords, said Elizabeth, methinks you do me wrong to examine every mean prisoner against me. If they have done evil, let them answer for it. I pray you, join me not with such offenders. Touching my remove from Ashridge to Donnington, I do remember me that Mr. Hobie, mine officers, and you, Sir James Crofts, had some talk about it, but what is that to the purpose? Might I not, my lords, go to mine own houses at all times? Whereupon the Lord of Arundel, kneeling down, observed, that her grace said the truth, and that himself was sorry to see her troubled about such vain matters. Well, my lords, rejoined she, you sift me narrowly, but you can do no more than God hath appointed, unto whom I pray to forgive you all. This generous burst of feeling on the part of the Earl of Arundel must have had a startling effect on all present, for he had been foremost in the death cry against Elizabeth, and had urged the Queen to bring her to trial and execution. Blinded by the malignant excitement of party feeling, he had doubtless, so far deceived himself as to regard such a measure as a stern duty to the nation at large, in order to prevent future insurrections, by sacrificing one person for the security of Mary's government. But when he saw and heard the young defenseless woman, whom he and his colleagues had visited in her lonely prison room, to browbeat and to entangle in her talk, his heart smote him for the cruel part he had taken, and he yielded to the generous impulse which prompted him to express his conviction of her innocence, and his remorse for the injurious treatment to which she was subjected. So powerful was the reaction of his feelings on this occasion, that he not only labored as strenuously for the preservation of Elizabeth, as he had hitherto done for her destruction, but even went so far as to offer his heir to her for a husband, and subsequently made her a tender of his own hand, and became one of the most persevering of her wooers. It is to be feared that Elizabeth, then in the bloom of youth, and very fairly endowed by nature, exerted all her fascinations to entangle the heart of this stern pillar of her sister's throne, in the perplexities of a delusive passion for herself, that the royal coquette indulged the stately old earl with deceitful hopes, appears evident by the tone he assumed towards her after her accession to the throne, and his jealousy of his handsome, audacious rival, Robert Dudley, but of this hereafter. Elizabeth's confinement in the tower was, at first, so rigorous that she was not permitted to see any one but the servants who had been selected by the council to wait upon her, a service fraught with danger even to those who were permitted to perform it. As for the other members of her household, several were in prison, and one of these, Edmund Tremaine, was subjected to the infliction of torture in the vain attempt to extort evidence against her. Before Elizabeth had been two days in the tower, the use of English prayers and Protestant rites was prohibited, and she was required to hear Mass. One of her ladies, Mrs. Elizabeth Sands, refused to attend that service. 
on which her father brought abbot feckenham to persuade her to it but as she continued firm in her resistance she was dismissed from her office and another lady mrs coldburn appointed in her stead another of elizabeth's ladies the beautiful isabella markham who was just married to sir john harrington was also sequestered from her service on account of her heretical opinions and committed to a prison lodging in the tower with her husband whose offence was having conveyed a letter to the princess this misdemeanor however appears to have been committed as far back as the second year of edward the sixth if we may judge from the allusions harrington makes to his former master the lord admiral thomas seymour in the spirited letter of remonstrance which he addressed to gardiner on the subject of his imprisonment and that of his wife nothing can afford a more beautiful picture of the attachment subsisting between the captive princess and these faithful adherents than this letter which is written in the fearless spirit of a true knight and noble-minded gentleman my lord this mine humble prayer doth come with much sorrow for any deed of evil that have been done to your lordship but alas i know of none save such duty to the lady elizabeth as i am bounden to pay her at all times and if this matter breedeth in you such wrath towards her and me i shall not in this mine imprisonment repent thereof my wife is her servant and doth but rejoice in this our misery when we look with whom we are holden in bondage our gracious king henry did ever advance our family's good estate as did his pious father aforetime wherefore our service is in remembrance of such good kindness albeit there needeth none other cause to render our tendance sith the lady elizabeth beareth such piety and godly affection to all virtue consider that your lordship aforetime hath combated with much like affliction why then should not our state cause you to recount the same and breed pity to usward mine poor lady hath greater cause to wail than we of such small degree but her rare example affordeth comfort to us and shameth our complaint why then my lord must i be thus annoyed for one deed of special good will to the lady elizabeth in bearing a letter sent from one that had such right to give me his commands and to one who had such right to all mine hearty service may god incline you to amend all this cruelty and ever and anon turn our prayer in good and merciful consideration my lord admiral seymour did truly win my love amidst this hard and deadly annoyance now may the same like pity touch your heart and deal us better usage his service was ever joyful and why must this be afflicting mine ancient kindred have ever held their duty and liege obeisance nor will i do them such dishonor as may blot out their worthy deeds but will ever abide in all honesty and love if you should give ear to my complaint it will bind me to thankfully repay this kindness but if not we will continue to suffer and rest ourselves in god whose mercy is sure and safe and all true love to her the princess elizabeth who doth honor us in tender sort and scorneth not to shed her tears with ours i commend your lordship to god's appointment and rest sorely afflicted john harrington from the tower fifteen fifty four the above interesting letter is the more valuable because it affords the testimony of the accomplished writer as to the personal deportment of elizabeth among her own immediate friends during their mutual imprisonment in the tower sir john harrington the younger says that his parents had not any comfort to beguile their affliction but the sweet words and sweeter deeds of their mistress and fellow prisoner the princess elizabeth in after years elizabeth herself told castanot the french ambassador when adverting to this period that she was in great danger of losing her life from the displeasure her sister had conceived against her in consequence of the accusations that were fabricated on the subject of her correspondence with the king of france and having no hope of escaping she desired to make her sister only one request which was that she might have her head cut off with a sword as in france and not with an axe after the present fashion adopted in england and therefore desired that an executioner might be sent for out of france if it were so determined what frightful visions connected with the last act of her unfortunate mother's tragedy must have haunted the prison musings of the royal captive 
who having recently recovered from a long and severe malady, was probably suffering from physical depression of spirits at this time. The traditions of the Tower of London affirm that the lodging of the Princess Elizabeth was immediately under the great alarm bell, which in case of any attempt being made for her escape, was to have raised its clamorous toxin to summon assistance and the hue and cry for pursuit. It seems scarcely probable, however, that she had been placed in such close contiguity with Courtney, unless the proximity were artfully contrived, as a snare to lure them into a stolen intercourse, or attempts at correspondence, for the purpose of furnishing a fresh mass of evidence against them. In a letter of the 3rd of April, Renaud relates the particulars of two successive interviews, which he had had with the Queen and some of the members of her council, on the measures necessary to be adopted for the security of Don Philip's person, before he would venture himself in England. His Excellency states, that he had assured the Queen, that it was of the utmost importance, that the trials and executions of the criminals, especially those of Courtney and Elizabeth, should be concluded before the arrival of the Prince. The Queen evasively replied, that she had neither rest nor sleep for the anxiety she took for the security of his highness at his coming. Gardiner then remarked, that as long as Elizabeth was alive, there was no hope that the kingdom could be tranquil, but if every one went to work as roundly as he did, in providing remedies, things would go on better. As touching Courtney, pursues Renaud, there is matter sufficient against him to make his punishment certain, but for Elizabeth, they had not yet been able to obtain matter sufficient for her conviction, because those persons with whom she was in communication have fled. Nevertheless, her majesty tells me, that from day to day they are finding more proofs against her, that especially they had several witnesses, who deposed as to the preparation of arms and provisions, which she made for the purpose of rebelling with the others, and of maintaining herself in strength in a house to which she sent the supplies. This was, of course, Donington Castle, to which allusion has so often been made. Renaud then proceeds to relate the substance of a conversation he had had with Paget on the subject of Elizabeth, in which he says that Paget told him that if they could not procure sufficient evidence to enable them to put her to death, the best way of disposing of her would be to send her out of the kingdom through the medium of a foreign marriage and the Prince of Piedmont was named as the most eligible person on whom to bestow her. Great advantages were offered to all parties. Paget considered if this convenient union could be effected, it would obviate all the dangers and difficulties involved in the unpopular marriage between Queen Mary and Philip of Spain, and if Elizabeth could be induced to consent to such an alliance, her own rights in the succession were to be secured to her consort, in the event of the queen having no children, for the minister added, he could see no way by which she could at present be excluded or deprived of the right which the parliament had given her. If we may rely on Hollingshed, whose testimony as a contemporary is at any rate deserving of attention, Elizabeth's table, while she was a prisoner in the tower, was supplied at her own cost. He gives a curious account of the disputes that took place daily between the authorities of the tower and the servants of the princess, who were appointed to purvey for her. These, when they brought her daily diet to the outer gate of the tower, were required to deliver it, says our chronicler, to the common rascal soldiers, and they considering it unmeet that it should pass through such hands, requested the vice-chamberlain, Sir John Gage who had personal charge and control over the royal captive, that they might be permitted to deliver it within the tower themselves. This he refused, on the plea that the Lady Elizabeth was a prisoner, and should be treated as such, and when they remonstrated with him, he threatened that, if they did either frown or shrug at him, he would set them where they should neither see sun nor moon. Either they or their mistress had the boldness to appeal to the lords of the council, by whom ten of the princess's own servants were appointed to superintend the purveyances and cooking department, and to serve her at table, namely, two yeomen of her chamber, two of her robes, two of her pantry and ewry, one of her buttery, 
one of her cellar, another of her larder, and two of her kitchen. At first the chamberlain was much displeased, and continued to annoy them by various means, though he afterwards behaved more courteously, and good cause why, as the chronicler. For he had good cheer, and fared of the best, and her grace paid for it. From a letter of Renaud to the emperor, dated the 7th of April, we find there were high words between Elizabeth's kinsman, the admiral, Lord William Howard, and Sir John Gage, about a letter full of seditious expressions in her favor, which had been found in the street. In what manner Lord William Howard identified Sir John Gage with this attempt to ascertain the state of public feeling towards Elizabeth, or whether he suspected it of being a device for accusing her friends, it is difficult to judge, but he passionately told Gage that she would be the cause of cutting off so many heads that both he and others would repent it. On the 13th of April, Wyatt was brought to the block, and on the scaffold, publicly retracted all that he had formerly said, in the vain hope of escaping the penalty of his own treason, to criminate Elizabeth and Courtney. Up to this period, the imprisonment of Elizabeth had been so extremely rigorous, that she had not been permitted to cross the threshold of her own apartments, and now, her health beginning to give way again, she entreated permission to take a little air and exercise. Lord Chandos, the constable of the tower, expressed his regret at being compelled to refuse her, as it was contrary to his orders. She then asked leave to walk only in the suite of apartments called the Queen's Lodgings. He applied to the council for instructions, and after some discussion, the indulgence was granted, but only on condition that he himself, the Lord Chamberlain, and three of the Queen's ladies, who were selected for that purpose, accompanied her, and that she should not be permitted to show herself at the windows, which were ordered to be kept shut. A few days afterwards, as Elizabeth evidently required air as well as exercise, she was allowed to walk in a little garden that was enclosed with high pails, but the other prisoners were strictly enjoined, not so much as to look in that direction while her grace remained therein. The powerful interest that was excited for the captive princess at this fearful crisis may be conjectured by the lively sympathy manifested towards her by the children of the officers and servants of the royal fortress, who brought her offerings of flowers. One of these tender-hearted little ones was the child of Martin, the keeper of the queen's robes. Another was called Susanna, a babe not above three years old. There was also another infant girl, who having one day found some little keys, carried them to the princess when she was walking in the garden, and innocently told her. She had brought her the keys now, so she need not always stay there, but might unlock the gates and go abroad. Elizabeth was all her life remarkable for her love of children, and her natural affection for them was doubtless greatly increased by the artless traits of generous feeling and sympathy, which she experienced in her time of trouble from her infant partisans in the tower. How jealous a watch was kept on her and them may be gathered from the following passage in one of Renaud's letters to the Emperor Charles V. It is asserted that Courtney has sent his regards to the Lady Elizabeth by a child of five years old, who is in the tower, the son of one of the soldiers there. This passage authenticates the pretty incident related in the life of Elizabeth in Fox's appendix, where we are told that at the hour she was accustomed to walk in the garden in the tower, there usually repaired unto her a little boy about four years old, the child of one of the people of the tower, in whose pretty prattling she took great pleasure. He was accustomed to bring her flowers, and to receive at her hands such things as commonly please children, which bred a great suspicion in the Chancellor, that by this child letters were exchanged between the Princess Elizabeth and Courtney, and so thoroughly was the matter sifted, that the innocent little creature was examined by the lords of the council, and plied with alternative promises of rewards, if he would tell the truth and confess, who sent him to the Lady Elizabeth with letters, and to whom he carried tokens from her, and threats of punishment if he persisted in denying it. Nothing, however, could be extracted from the child, and he was dismissed with threats, and his father, who was severely reprimanded, was enjoined not to suffer his boy to resort any more to her grace, which nevertheless he attempted the next day to do, but finding the door locked, he peeped through a hole, 
and called to the princess who was walking in the garden, Mistress, I can bring you no more flowers now. The tower was at that time crowded with prisoners of state, among whom, besides Elizabeth's kinsman and political lover Courtney, were Sir James Crofts, Sir William St. Low, Edmund Tremaine, Harrington, and others of her own household, and last not least, Lord Robert Dudley, who was afterwards her great favorite, the celebrated Earl of Leicester. This nobleman was born on the same day and in the same hour with Elizabeth, and had been one of her playfellows in childhood, having, as he afterwards said, known her intimately from her eighth year. Considering the intriguing temper of both, it is probable that, notwithstanding the jealous precautions of their respective jailers, some sort of secret understanding was established between them, even at this period, possibly through the medium of the child, who brought the daily offerings of flowers to the princess, although the timid Courtney was the person suspected of carrying on a correspondence by the agency of this infant Mercury. The signal favor that Elizabeth lavished on Robert Dudley, by appointing him her master of horse, and loading him with honors within the first week of her accession to the crown, must have originated from some powerful motive which does not appear on the surface of history. His imprisonment in the tower was for aiding and abetting his ambitious father, the Duke of Northumberland, and his faction, in raising Lady Jane Grey, the wife of his brother, Lord Guilford Dudley, to the throne, to the prejudice of Elizabeth, no less than her sister Mary. Therefore he must by some means have succeeded, not only in winning Elizabeth's pardon for this offense, but in exciting an interest in her bosom of no common nature, while they were both imprisoned in the tower, since being immediately after his liberation, employed in the wars in France, he had no other opportunity of ingratiating himself with that princess. On the 17th of April, Noel writes, Madam Elizabeth, having since her imprisonment been very closely confined, is now more free. She has the liberty of going all over the tower, but without daring to speak to any one but those appointed to guard her. As they cannot prove her implication with the recent insurrection, it is thought she will not die. Great agitation pervaded Mary's privy council at this time, according to the reports of Renaud to his imperial master, on the subject of Elizabeth and Courtney. What one counsels, says he, another contradicts. One advises to save Courtney, another Elizabeth, and such confusion prevails that all we expect is to see their disputes end in war and tumult. He then notices that the Chancellor Gardiner headed one party, and the Earl of Arundel, Pembroke, Sussex, the Master of the Horse, Paget, Petrie, and the Admiral another. These were now the protectors of Elizabeth, and Renaud adds, that the Queen is irresolute about what should be done with her and Courtney, but that he can see that she is inclined to set him at liberty, through the intercession of her comptroller, Sir Robert Rochester, and his friends, who have formed a compact for his marriage with that lady. As for Elizabeth, pursues he, the lawyers can find no matter for her condemnation, Already she has liberty to walk in the tower garden, and even if they had proof, they would not dare to proceed against her, for the love of the admiral, her kinsman, who espouses her quarrel, and has at present all the force of England in his power. If, however, they release her, it appears evident that the heretics will proclaim her queen. The part taken by Arundel in favor of Elizabeth was so decided that the queen was advised to send him to the tower. Paget appears to have played a double game, first plotting with one side and then with the other, sometimes urging the immediate execution of Elizabeth and then intriguing with her partisans. In the midst of these agitations, the queen was stricken with a sudden illness, and it must have been at that time that Gardiner, on his own responsibility, sent a privy council warrant to the lieutenant of the tower for the immediate execution of Elizabeth. He knew the temper of that princess, and probably considered that in the event of the queen's death, he had sinned too deeply against her to be forgiven, and therefore ventured a bold stroke to prevent the possibility of the sword of vengeance passing into her hand, by her succeeding to the royal office. Bridges, the honest lieutenant of the tower, observing the queen's signature was not affixed to this illegal instrument for the destruction of the heiress of the realm, 
and being sore grieved for the charge it contained, refused to execute it till he had ascertained the queen's pleasure by a direct communication on the subject with her majesty. The delay caused by this caution preserved Elizabeth from the machinations of her foes. The queen was much displeased when she found such a plot was in agitation, and sent Sir Henry Bedingfeld, a stern Norfolk knight, in whose courage and probity she knew she could confide, with a hundred of her guard, to take the command of the tower, till she could form some plan for the removal of her sister to one of the royal residences further from the metropolis. Notwithstanding all that had been done by friends, foes, and designing foreign potentates, to inflame the queen's mind against Elizabeth, the voice of nature was suffered to plead in behalf of the oppressed captive. Early in May it was noticed that her majesty began, when speaking of Elizabeth, to call her sister, which she had not done before since her imprisonment, and that she had caused her portrait to be replaced next to her own in her gallery. She had positively given up the idea of bringing either her or Courtney to trial for their alleged offenses, and had negatived the suspicious proposal of the emperor that Elizabeth should be sent into a sort of honorable banishment to the court of his sister, the Queen of Hungary, or his own court at Brussels. It was then suggested in council that she should be imprisoned in the Pontefract Castle, but that ill-omened place, stained with the blood of princes, was rejected for the royal bowers of Woodstock, where it was finally determined to send her, under the charge of Sir Henry Bedingfeld and Lord Williams of Tame, who were both staunch Catholics. Elizabeth, who naturally regarded every unwanted movement and change with apprehension, when she first saw Sir Henry Bedingfeld and the hundred men-at-arms in blue coats under his command, enter the inner court of the tower, supposing it to be a prelude to her execution, demanded in terror, if the Lady Jane's scaffold were removed. She then sent for Lord Chandos, and fearfully inquired the meaning of what she saw. He endeavored to calm her mind by telling her, that she had no cause for alarm, but that his orders were to consign her into the charge of Sir Henry Bedingfeld, to be conveyed, he believed, to Woodstock. Elizabeth then declared that she knew not what manner of man Bedingfeld was, and inquired, whether he were a person who made conscience of murder, if such an order were entrusted to him. Her mind evidently recurred on this occasion to the appointment of Sir James Tyrrell by Richard the Third for the midnight murder of the youthful brethren of her grandmother, Elizabeth of York, as a parallel circumstance. And when it is remembered that seventy years had not elapsed since the perpetration of this mysterious tragedy, it is not to be wondered that the stout heart of Elizabeth Tudor occasionally vibrated with a thrill of terror during her incarceration as a state prisoner within those gloomy walls. The 19th of May is generally mentioned as the date of Elizabeth's removal from the tower. We find this notice in a contemporary record. The 20th day of May, my lady Elizabeth, the queen's sister, came out of the tower and took her barge at the tower wharf and so to Richmond. Elizabeth was attended on this occasion by the Lord Treasurer, Marquis of Winchester, and the Chamberlain. She performed the voyage to Richmond without once landing, till she arrived there. It is affirmed that she was then conducted to the palace, where she had an interview with the Queen, her sister, who offered her pardon and liberty, on condition of her accepting the hand of Philibert of Savoy, Prince of Piedmont, in marriage, and that she firmly refused to contract matrimony with him, or any other foreign prince whatsoever, alleging her preference of a single life. The harsh measures that were adopted that evening at Richmond, in removing all her own servants from their attendance on her person, were probably resorted to on account of the inflexibility of her determination on this point. She evidently considered herself in great peril, for she required the prayers of her departing servants with mournful earnestness. For this night, said she, I think I must die. Which sorrowful words drew fountains of tears from their eyes, and her gentlemen ushers went to the Lord Tame in the court, and conjured him to tell him, whether the princess his mistress were in danger of death that night, that if so, he and his fellows might take such part as God would appoint. Mary, God forbid, exclaimed Lord Tame, 
that any such wickedness should be intended, which rather than it should be wrought, I and my men will die at her feet. All night, however, a strict guard of soldiers kept watch and ward about the house where she lay to prevent escape or rescue. The next morning, in crossing the river at Richmond, to proceed on her melancholy journey towards Woodstock, she found her disbanded servants lingering on the banks of the Thames to take a last look of her. Go to them, said she, to one of the gentlemen in her escort, and tell them from me, tanquam ovis, like a sheep to the slaughter, for so, added she, am I led. No one was, however, permitted to have access to her, and the most rigorous scrutiny was used towards every one who endeavored to open the slightest communication, either direct or indirect, with the royal captive. Noel, the French ambassador, no sooner understood that Elizabeth was removed from the tower, than he commenced his old tricks, by sending a spy with a present of apples, to her on her journey. A very unwelcome mark of attention from such a quarter, considering the troubles and dangers in which the unfortunate girl had already been involved, in consequence of that unprincipled diplomat's previous intercourse with her, and her household. The guards, as a matter of course, stopped and examined the messenger, whom they stripped to the shirt, but found nothing except the apples, which from the season of the year might appear an acceptable offering, but certainly an ill-judged one under the present circumstances, and doubtless it had an unfavorable effect on the mind of Elizabeth's stern guardian, Sir Henry Bedingfeld. The sympathy of the people for the distressed heiress of the realm was manifested by their assembling to meet her by the way, and greeting her with tearful prayers and loving words. But when they pressed nearer to obtain a sight of her, they were driven back, and angrily reviled by the names of rebels and traitors to the queen, and whereas pursues the chronicler. In certain villages, the bells were rung for joy for her supposed deliverance as she passed. Sir Henry Bedingfeld took the matter so distastefully that he commanded the bells to be stopped and set the ringers in the stocks. The second day's journey brought Elizabeth to Windsor, where she spent the night, and lodged in the dean's house near St. George's Chapel. The next resting place was Rycote in Oxfordshire, which being the seat of Lord Williams of Tame, she there received every princely and hospitable entertainment from that amiable nobleman, who had invited a noble company of knights and ladies to meet his royal charge at dinner, and treated her with all the marks of respect that were due to her exalted rank as the sister of his sovereign. This seasonable kindness greatly revived the drooping spirits of the princess, though it was considered rather de trop by Sir Richard Bedingfeld, who significantly asked his fellow commissioner if he were aware of the consequences of thus entertaining the queen's prisoner. The generous Williams replied, with manly spirit, that let what would befall, her grace might and should be merry in his house. It is said that when Elizabeth expressed a wish to Sir Henry Bedingfeld to delay her departure till she had seen a game of chess, in which Lord Williams and another gentleman were engaged, played out, he would not permit it. Probably Sir Henry suspected that she intended to outwit him by means of a secret understanding between the friendly antagonists in order to gain time, for it is well known that a game of chess may be prolonged for days, and in fact, to any length of time. It is also related that as they were proceeding towards Woodstock, a violent storm of wind and rain, which they encountered, greatly disordered the princess's dress, insomuch that her hood and veil were twice or thrice blown off, on which she begged to retire to a gentleman's house near the road. This, we are told, Sir Henry Bedingfeld, who, perhaps, had some reason for his caution, would not permit, and it is added that the royal prisoner was fain to retire behind the shelter of a hedge by the wayside to replace her headgear and bind up her disordered tresses. End of section 7「Section 8 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 3, Part 2. When she arrived at Woodstock, 
instead of being placed in the royal apartments, she was lodged in the gatehouse of the palace, in a room which retained the name of the Princess Elizabeth's Chamber, till it was demolished in the year 1714. Hollingshed has preserved the rude couplet, which she wrote with a diamond on a pane of glass, in the window of this room. Much suspected, of me, nothing proved can be, quoth Elizabeth, prisoner. Her confinement at Woodstock was no less rigorous than when she was in the tower. Sixty soldiers were on guard all day, both within and without the quarter of the palace where she was in ward, and forty kept watch within the walls all night, and though she obtained permission to walk in the gardens, it was under very strict regulations, and five or six locks were made fast after her whenever she came within the appointed bounds of her joyless recreation. Although Sir Henry Bedingfeld has been very severely censured on account of these restraints, and other passages of his conduct, with regard to the captive princess, there is reason to believe that his harshness has been exaggerated, and that he had great cause to suspect that the ruthless party, who thirsted for Elizabeth's blood, having been foiled in their eagerly expressed wish of seeing her brought to the block, were conspiring to take her off by murder. This he was determined should not be done while she was in his charge. It is said that once, having locked the garden gates, when Elizabeth was walking, she passionately upbraided him for it, and called him her jailer, on which he knelt to her, beseeching her, not to give him that harsh name, for he was one of her officers appointed to serve her, and guard her from the dangers by which she was beset. Among the incidents of Elizabeth's imprisonment, a mysterious tale is told of an attempt made by one Bassett, a creature of Gardiner, against her life, during the temporary absence of Sir Henry Bedingfeld. This Bassett, it seems, had been, with five and twenty disguised ruffians, loitering with evil intentions at Bladenbridge, seeking to obtain access to the Lady Elizabeth, on secret and important business, as he pretended. But Sir Henry had given such strict cautions to his brother, whom he left as deputy castellan in his absence, that no one should approach the royal prisoner, that the project was defeated. Once, a dangerous fire broke out in the quarter of the palace where she was confined, which was kindled, apparently not by accident, between the ceiling of the room under her chamber and her chamber floor, by which her life would have been greatly endangered, had it not been providentially discovered before she retired to rest. The lofty spirit of Elizabeth, though unsubdued, was saddened by the perils and trials to which she was daily exposed, and in the bitterness of her heart, she once expressed a wish to change fortunes with the milkmaid, whom she saw singing merrily over her pail, while milking the cows in Woodstock Park, for she said, that milkmaid's lot was better than hers, and her life merrier. It was doubtless while in this melancholy frame of mind that the following touching lines were composed by the royal captive, which have been preserved by Hensner, with the interesting tradition that she wrote them on a shutter with a piece of charcoal, no doubt at a period when she was entirely deprived of pen and ink. O oh, fortune, how thy restless wavering state hath fraught with cares my troubled wit. Witness this present prison, whither fate could bear me, and the joys I quit. Thou cost the guilty to be loosed, from bands wherein are innocence enclosed, causing the guiltless to be straight reserved, and freeing those that death had well deserved. By her envy can be nothing wrought, so God send to my foes all they have wrought. Quoth Elizabeth, prisoner. She also composed some elegant Latin lines on the same subject, and when in a more heavenly frame of mind, inscribed the following quaint but beautiful sentence in the blank leaf of a black letter edition of the epistles of st paul which she used during her lonely imprisonment at woodstock august i walk many times into the pleasant fields of the holy scriptures where i pluck up the goodly some herbs of sentences by pruning eat them by reading chew them by musing and lay them up at length in the high seat of memory by gathering them together, that so having tasted their sweetness, I may the less perceive the bitterness of this miserable life. The volume is covered with devices in needlework, embroidered by the royal maiden, who was then drinking deeply of the cup of adversity, and thus solacing her weary hours in holy and feminine employments. 
This interesting relic is preserved in the Bodleian Library at Oxford. Needlework, in which, like her accomplished stepmother, Queen Catherine Parr, and many other illustrious ladies, Elizabeth greatly excelled, was one of the resources with which she whiled away the weary hours of her imprisonment at Woodstock, as we learn both by the existing devices wrought by her hand, in gold thread on the cover of the volume, which has just been described, and also from the following verses by Taylor, in his poem in praise of the needle. When this great queen, whose memory shall not, by any terms of time, be overcast, for when the world and all therein shall rot, yet shall her glorious fame for ever last. When she a maid had many troubles passed, from jail to jail, by Marie's angry spleen, and Woodstock in the tower imprisoned fast, and after all was England's peerless queen. Yet howsoever sorrow came and went, she made the needle her companion still, and in that exercise her time she spent, as many living yet do know her skill. Thus she was still a captive, or else crowned, a needlewoman royal and renowned. The fate of Elizabeth was long a subject of discussion at the council board of her royal sister, after her removal to the sequestered bowers of Woodstock. The base pageant had dared to assert that there would be no peace in England till her head were smitten from her shoulders. Yet Courtney, who had been removed from the tower to Fotheringay Castle, confessed to a person named Sillier, who conducted him to his new prison, that Paget had importuned him to marry the Lady Elizabeth, adding, that if he did not, the son of the Earl of Arundel would, and that Hobie and Morrison both, at the instigation of Paget, had practiced with him touching that marriage. On the 8th of June, Elizabeth was so ill, that an express was sent to the court, for two physicians to come to her assistance. They were sent, and continued in attendance upon her for several days, when youth and a naturally fine constitution enabled her to triumph over a malady that had, in all probability, been brought on by anxiety of mind. The physicians on their return made a friendly report of the loyal feelings of the princess towards the queen, which appears to have had a favorable effect on Mary's mind. And now, says Camden, the Princess Elizabeth, guiding herself like a ship in tempestuous weather, her divine service after the Romanish manner, was frequently confessed, and at the pressing instances of Cardinal Pole, and for fear of death, professed herself to be of the Roman Catholic religion. The Queen, doubting her sincerity, caused her to be questioned as to her belief in transubstantiation, on which Elizabeth, being pressed to declare her opinion as to the real presence of the Saviour in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, replied in the following extempore lines. Christ was the word that spake it, he took the bread and brake it, and what his word did make it, that I believe and take it. It was impossible for either Catholic or Protestant to impugn the orthodoxy of this simple scriptural explanation of one of the sublimest mysteries of the Christian faith. It silenced the most subtle of her foes, at least they forbore to harass her, with questions on theological subjects. Dr. Story, however, in one of his fierce declamations against heretics, declared that it was of little avail destroying the branches, as long as the root of all heresies, meaning the Princess Elizabeth, were suffered to remain. The delusive hopes which Queen Mary entertained in the autumn of that year of bringing an heir to England appears to have altered Elizabeth's position, even with her own party, for a time, and Philip, being desirous of pleasing the people of England, is supposed to have interceded with his consort for the liberation of all the prisoners in the tower, also that he requested that his sister-in-law, the Princess Elizabeth, might be admitted to share in the Christmas festivities at Hampton Court. She travelled from Woodstock under the charge of Sir Henry Bedingfeld, and rested the first night at Rycote. The next she passed at the house of Mr. Dormer at Winge, in Buckinghamshire, and from thence to an inn at Colnbrook, where she slept. At this place she was met by the gentlemen and yeomen of her own household, to the number of sixty, much to all their comforts, who had not seen her for several months. They were not, however, permitted to approach near enough to speak to her, but were all commanded to return to London. 
The next day she reached Hampton Court, and was ushered into the prince's lodgings, but the doors were closed upon her and guarded, so that she had reason to suppose she was still to be treated a prisoner. Soon after her arrival, she was visited by Gardiner, and three other of the queen's cabinet, whom, without waiting to hear their errand, she addressed in the following words. My lords, I am glad to see you, for methinks I have been kept a great while from you, desolately alone. Wherefore I would entreat you to be a means to the king's and queen's majesties, that I may be delivered from my imprisonment, in which I have been kept a long time, as to you, my lords, is not unknown. Gardiner, in reply, told her, she must then confess her fault, and put herself on the queen's mercy. She replied, that rather than she would do so, she would lie in prison all her life, that she had never offended against the queen, in thought, word, or deed, that she craved no mercy at her majesty's hand, but rather desired to put herself on the law. The next day Gardiner and his colleagues came to her again, and Gardiner told her on his knee, that the queen marveled at her boldness in refusing to confess her offense, so that it might seem as if her majesty had wrongfully imprisoned her grace. Nay, replied Elizabeth, she may, if it please her, punish me as she thinketh good. Her majesty willeth me to tell you, retorted Gardiner, that you must tell another tale ere that you are set at liberty. Elizabeth replied, that she had as lief be in prison, with honesty, as to be abroad suspected of her majesty, adding, that which I have said I will stand to. Then, said Gardiner, your grace hath the advantage of me and these lords, for your long and wrongful imprisonment. What advantage I have you know, replied Elizabeth. I seek no vantage at your hands, for you're so dealing with me, but God forgive you and me also. They then, finding no concessions were to be obtained from her, withdrew, and Elizabeth was left in close confinement for a week, at the end of which time she was startled by receiving a summons to the queen's presence, one night at ten o'clock. Imagining herself in great danger, she bade her attendants, pray for her, for she could not tell whether she should ever see them again. She was conducted to the queen's bedchamber, where the interview that has been related in the memoir of Queen Mary took place. It has always been said that Philip of Spain was concealed behind a large screen, or the tapestry, to witness this meeting between the royal sisters, after their long estrangement. Historians have added that he was thus ambushed in order to protect Elizabeth from the violence of the queen, if necessary, but there was no warrant for such an interference. Mary was never addicted to the use of striking arguments, and Elizabeth, at that period of her life, knew how to restrain her lips from angry expletives and her fingers from fighting. Philip's object, therefore, in placing himself perdu, could scarcely have been for the purpose of seeing fair play between the ladies, in the event of their coming to blows, as gravely insinuated by Fox and others, but rather, we should surmise, with the jealous intention of making himself acquainted, with what passed between his consort and the heiress presumptive of England, against whose life he and his father had, for the first fifteen months, practiced with such determined malice, that Philip ought to have been, as it appeared he really was, ashamed to look upon her for the first time, face to face. Great confusion exists among historians, as to the year in which this memorable interview took place, but there can be no doubt that it was in the autumn of 1554, because of the presence of Philip of Spain, and his friend, Philibert of Savoy, who both graced the festivals of the English court, that Christmas and no other, and it is supposed that one object of bringing Elizabeth into the royal circle on this occasion was to afford the gallant Savoyard an opportunity of pleading his own cause to her in person. Philibert was not only invited to receive the hand of Elizabeth, but was actually inducted in her town residence, during his stay in London. The prince is expected in four days, writes Noel to his sovereign, and apartments are prepared for him in Somerset House, which now belongs to the Lady Elizabeth. When he arrived he was so very ill from seasickness, that he was obliged to stay at Dover fifteen days, to the great regret of the king and queen. At the brilliant Christmas Eve festival, Elizabeth appeared once more publicly in her sister's palace, 
as the second royal personage in the realm. As such, she took her place, both at feasts and tournaments, before the assembled chivalry of England, Spain, and Flanders, in the presence of Alva, Egmont, Rui Gomez, and other distinguished men, whose fame for good or evil expanded throughout Europe. Her own suitor, Philibert Emmanuel, the most illustrious for worth and valor, was also present. At this banquet, Elizabeth was seated at the queen's table, next the royal canopy or cloth of estate. After supper she was served by her former treacherous friend and cruel foe, Lord Paget, with a perfumed napkin and a plate of confits. She retired, however, to her ladies before the masking and dancing began, perhaps to avoid any communication with her suitor, in the rejection of whose addresses, after events fully manifested, the queen supported her. It would have been a more deadly blow to the Protestant interest of this country than all the persecutions with which it was visited in the succeeding years of Mary's reign, had Elizabeth, while yet her character was flexible, married this great man. In this case, as may be gathered from his matrimonial felicity with Margaret of Valois, the intellectual daughter of Francis I, the personal character and happiness of Elizabeth would have been improved, but England might have remained, if we may judge from the slavish devotion of the era to the religion of their monarch, a Roman Catholic country. The extreme beauty and grace of Courtney's person perhaps rendered Elizabeth indifferent to the addresses of Philibert Emmanuel. On St. Stephen's Day, Elizabeth heard matins in the Queen's closet, in the Chapel Royal, on which occasion she was attired in a style of almost bridal elegance, wearing a robe of rich white satin, passamented all over with large pearls. At the tournament, on the 29th of December, she sat with their majesties in the royal gallery to witness the grand, but long-delayed pageant of the jousting, in honor of her sister's nuptials. Two hundred spears were broken on this occasion, by the cavaliers of Spain and Flanders, attired in their national costumes. The great respect with which Elizabeth was treated at this period, by the principal personages in the realm, can scarcely be more satisfactorily proved than by the following account, which Fox narrates of a dispute between one of her servants and an ill-mannered tradesman about the court, who had said, That jilt! the Lady Elizabeth, was the real cause of Wyatt's rising. The princess's man cited the other before the ecclesiastical court to answer for his scandalous language, and there expressed himself as follows. I saw yesterday at court that my Lord Cardinal Pole, when meeting the princess in the presence chamber, kneeled down and kissed her hand, and I saw also that King Philip, meeting her, made her such obeisance that his knee touched the ground, and then methinketh it were too much to suffer such a varlet as this, to call her a jilt, and to wish them to hop headless, that shall wish her grace to enjoy possession of the crown, when God shall send it unto her in right of inheritance. Yea, quoth Bonner, who was then presiding, when God sendeth it unto her, let her enjoy it. However, the reviler of Elizabeth was sent for, and duly reproved for his misbehavior. Elizabeth failed not to avail herself of every opportunity of paying her court to her royal brother-in-law, with whom she was on very friendly terms, although she would not comply with his earnest wish of her becoming the wife of his friend and ally, Philibert of Savoy. The period of Elizabeth's return to Woodstock is doubtful, but it does not appear that she was under any particular restraint there, for she had all her own people about her, and early in the spring, 1555, some of the members of her household were accused of practicing, by enchantment, against the queen's life. Elizabeth had ventured to divert her lonely sojourn in the royal bowers of Woodstock, by secret consultations with a cunning clerk of Oxford, one John D, afterwards celebrated as an astrologer and mathematician throughout Europe, and who, by his pretended skill in divination, acquired an influence over the strong mind of that learned and clear-headed princess, which he retained as long as she lived. A curious letter of news from Thomas Martin of London to Edward Courtney, Earl of Devonshire, then traveling in Italy, was lately discovered at the state paper office, which was doubtless intercepted, 
and considering to whom it was written, and the facts in which Elizabeth's name is implicated, it must be regarded as a document of no common interest. In England, says he, all is quiet, such as wrote traitorous letters into Germany, be apprehended, as likewise others, that did calculate the king's, the queen's, and my lady Elizabeth's nativity, whereof one D, and Carey, and Butler, and one other of my lady Elizabeth's, are accused, that they should have a familiar spirit, which is the more suspected, for that fairies, one of their accusers, had, immediately on the accusation, both of his children stricken, the one with death, the other with blindness." Carey and Butler were both related to Elizabeth by her maternal lineage, and Dee had obtained access to her through his relationship and intimacy with her confidential servants, the Perrys. Elizabeth escaped a public implication in the charge of these occult practices. Her household were faithful to her, but it was probably the cause of her removal from Woodstock, and of her being once more conducted as a prisoner of state to Hampton Court, which, according to most authorities, she was, a second time, April 1555. It has been generally said that she was indebted for her liberation to the good offices of her brother-in-law, Philip of Spain, who, when he found himself disappointed in his hopes of an heir to England by Queen Mary, and perceived how precarious a threat her existence hung, became fully aware of the value of Elizabeth's life, as the sole barrier to the ultimate recognition of Mary, Queen of Scots, and Dauphiness of France, as Queen of Great Britain, to prevent so dangerous a preponderancy in the balance of power from falling to his political rival, the monarch of France. He wisely determined that Elizabeth's petty misdemeanors should be winked at, and the Queen finally gave her permission to reside once more in royal state at her favorite abode, Hatfield House in Hertfordshire. At parting, Mary placed a ring on the princess's finger, to the value of seven hundred crowns, as a pledge of amity. It was not, however, Mary's intention to restore Elizabeth so entirely to liberty, as to leave her the unrestrained mistress of her own actions, and Sir Thomas Pope was entrusted with the responsible office of residing in her house, for the purpose of restraining her from intriguing with suspected persons, either abroad or at home veiling the intimation of her sovereign will, under the semblance of a courteous recommendation, Mary presented this gentleman to Elizabeth, as an officer who was henceforth to reside in her family, and who would do his best to render her and her household comfortable. Elizabeth, to whom Sir Thomas Pope was already well known, had the tact to take this in good part. She had indeed reason to rejoice that her keeper, while she remained as a state prisoner at large, was a person of such honorable and friendly conditions, as this learned and worthy gentleman. The fetters in which he held her, were more like flowery wreaths, flung lightly around her, to attach her to a bower of royal pleasance, than aught which might remind her of the stern restraints, by which she was surrounded, during her incarceration in the tower, and her subsequent abode at Woodstock, in the summer and autumn of 1554. There is reason to believe that she did not take her final departure from the court till late in the autumn. It is certain that she came by water to meet the queen, her sister, and Philip, at Greenwich, for the purpose of taking a personal farewell of him, at his embarkation for Flanders. Elizabeth did not, however, make one in the royal procession, when Queen Mary went through the city in an open litter, in order to show herself to the people, who had long believed her to be dead. At this very time, Elizabeth passed to Greenwich by water, and shot London Bridge in a shabby barge, very ill-appointed, attended only by four damsels and three gentlemen. With all this, the people were much displeased, as they supposed it was contrived, that they might not see the princess, which they greatly desired. During King Philip's absence, he manifested a great interest in the welfare of Elizabeth. Whether personal or political, it is not so easy to ascertain. Her vanity led her to believe that her brother-in-law was in love with her, and much she boasted of the same in afterlife. Meantime, he wrote many letters to his wife, Queen Mary, and to some Spanish grandees, resident at the English court, commending Elizabeth to their kindness. 
she made many visits to the queen and went to mass every day besides fasting with her very sedulously in order to qualify themselves for the reception of the pope's pardon and to fit them for the benefits of the jubilee which he had granted altogether elizabeth appeared to be fairly in her sister's good graces nor did mary ever betray the least personal jealousy respecting king philip's regard for her sister yet contemporaries and even elizabeth herself after the queen's death had much to say on the subject attributing to him partiality beyond the due degree of brotherhood insomuch that many years subsequently thomas cecil the eldest son of lord burleigh repeated at elizabeth's court that king philip had been heard to say after his return to spain that whatever he suffered from queen elizabeth was the just judgment of god because being married to queen mary whom he thought to be a most virtuous and good lady yet in the fancy of love he could not affect her but as for the lady elizabeth he was enamoured of her being a fair and beautiful woman when elizabeth took her final departure from london to hatfield that autumn october eighteenth the people crowded to obtain a sight of her says noel followed her through the city and greeted her with acclamations and such vehement manifestations of affection that she was fearful it would expose her to the jealousy of the court and with her wanton exercise of caution she fell back behind some of the officers in her train as if unwilling to attract public attention and applause at hatfield she was permitted to surround herself with her old accustomed train of attached servants among whom were her beloved governess mrs catherine ashley her husband the perrys and last not least her learned preceptor roger ashcombe who had obtained the preferment of latin secretary to her sister the queen and was permitted to visit and resume his instructions to elizabeth who in her twenty-second year was better qualified than ever to make the most of the advantages she enjoyed under such an instructor on the fourteenth of september fifteen fifty five ashcombe wrote to his friend sturmius from metulus you will learn what my most noble elizabeth is he will tell you pursues ashcombe how much she excels in greek italian latin and french also her knowledge of things in general and with what a wise and accurate judgment she is endowed he added that metulus thought it more to have seen elizabeth than to have seen england the lady elizabeth and i pursues ashcombe are reading together in greek the orations of Ascanes and demosthenes she reads before me and at first sight she so learnedly comprehends not only the idiom of the language and the meaning of the orator but the whole grounds of contention the decrees and the customs and manners of the people as you would greatly wonder to hear again in a conversation with aylmer on the subject of the talents and attainments of the princess he said i teach her words and she me things i teach her the tongues to speak and her modest and maidenly looks teach me works to do for i think she is the best disposed of any in all europe castiglione an italian master added that elizabeth possessed two qualities that were seldom united in one woman namely a singular wit and a marvellous meek stomach he was however the only person who ever gave the royal lioness of the tudor line credit for the latter quality and very probably intended to speak of her affability but mistook the meaning of the word according to noel the queen paid elizabeth a visit at hatfield more than once this autumn and yet soon after it appears when elizabeth had removed to another of her houses in hertfordshire that two of her majesty's officers arrived with orders to take mrs catherine ashley and three of elizabeth's maids of honour into custody which they actually did and lodged mrs ashley in the fleet prison and the other ladies in the tower the cause of this extraordinary arrest has never been satisfactorily explained speed openly attributes it to the hostility of gardiner and miss aiken taking the same view observes that it was a last expiring effort of his indefatigable malice against elizabeth he died on the twelfth of november when however the intriguing disposition of mrs ashley is remembered and that it was on the eve of the abortive attempt of sir henry dudley to raise a fresh insurrection in england 
in favor of Elizabeth and Courtney, and that several of the princess's household were actually implicated in the plot. It is more natural to suppose that she and the other ladies had been accused of carrying on a treasonable correspondence with the Confederates. Elizabeth had the prospect of a new royal suitor at this period, for a report was prevalent when the Archduke of Austria came to visit his kinsman, Philip II, at Brussels, December 1555, that his intention was to propose for her hand. As for her former lover, Philibert Emmanuel of Savoy, he had committed himself both with Philip and Elizabeth, having been seen making love from his window to the fair Duchess of Lorraine, Christina of Denmark, and for the present the princess had a respite from his unwelcome addresses. The respectful and kind attention which Elizabeth received from Sir Thomas Pope during her residence under his friendly surveillance at Hatfield is testified by the following passage in a contemporary chronicle. At Strovetide, Sir Thomas Pope made for the Lady Elizabeth, all at his own cost, a grand and rich masking in the great hall at Hatfield, where the pageants were marvelously furnished. There were there twelve minstrels antiquely disguised, with forty-six or more gentlemen and ladies, many knights, nobles and ladies of honor, apparelled in crimson satin, embroidered with wreaths of gold, and garnished with borders of hanging pearl. There was the device of a castle, of cloth of gold, set with pomegranates about the battlements, with shields of knights hanging therefrom, and six knights in rich harness tourneyed. At night, the cupboard in the hall was of twelve stages, mainly furnished with garnish of gold and silver vessels, and a banquet of seventy dishes, and after a void of spices and subtleties, with thirty spice plates, all at the charge of Sir Thomas Pope, and the next day, the play of Holofernes but the queen, per case, misliked these follies, as by her letters to Sir Thomas Pope did appear, and so these disguisings were ceased. The reason of Mary's objection to these pageants and public entertainments was probably on account of the facility they afforded for the admission of strangers and emissaries from the King of France, or the foreign ambassadors, with whom Elizabeth and her partisans had been so frequently suspected of intriguing. The spring and summer of 1556 were agitated by a series of new plots by the indefatigable conspirators who made Elizabeth's name the rallying point of their schemes of insurrection, and this whether she consented or not. It was extremely dangerous for her that persons of her household were always involved in these attempts. In the conspiracy between the King of France and Sir Henry Dudley to depose Mary and raise Elizabeth to the throne, two of Elizabeth's chief officers were deeply engaged. These men, Peckham and Wern, were tried and executed. Their confessions, as usual, implicated Elizabeth, who, it is asserted, owed her life to the interposition of King Philip. Likewise, it is said that he obliged Mary to drop all inquiry into her guilt, and to give out that she believed Peckham and Wern had made use of the name of their mistress without her authority. Moreover, Mary sent her a ring in token of her amity. That Mary did so is probable, but that she acted on compulsion and against her inclination is scarcely consistent with a letter concerning the next insurrection, which took place in June, a few weeks after, in which Elizabeth was actually proclaimed queen. A young man named Cleobury, who was extremely like the Earl of Devonshire, landed on the coast of Sussex, as if that noble had returned from exile, and proclaimed Elizabeth queen and himself king, as Edward, Earl of Devonshire, and her husband. This scene took place in Yaxley Church, but the adventurer was immediately seized, and in September following, was executed for treason at Bury. This insurrection was communicated to Elizabeth by a letter from the hand of Queen Mary herself, a kind one it may be gathered from the following answer still extant, where, amidst Elizabeth's labored and contorted sentences, this fact may be elicited by the reader. Princess Elizabeth to Queen Mary, August 2nd, 1556. When I revolve in mind, most noble queen, the old love of Paynims to their princes, and the reverent fear of the Romans to their senate, I cannot but muse for my part, and blush for theirs, to see the rebellious hearts and devilish intents of Christians in name, 
but Jews indeed, towards their anointed king, which methinks if they had feared God, though they could not have loved the state, they should, for the dread of their own plague, have refrained that wickedness, which their bounden duty to their majesty had not restrained. But when I call to remembrance that devil, tanquam leo rugian circumvit, querens quem devorare potest, like a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour, I do the less marvel that he, the devil, have gotten such novices into his professed house, as vessels, without God's grace, more apt to serve his, the devil's palace, than me to inhabit English land. I am the bolder to call them Mary's rebels, his imps, for that St. Paul saith, Seditiosi sunt filii diaboli, the seditious are sons of the devil, and since I have so good a buckler, I fear less to enter into their judgment. Of this I assure your majesty, it had been my part, above the rest, to bewail such things, though my name had not been in them, yet much it vexed me, that the devil oweth me such a hate, as to put in any part of his mischievous instigations, whom, as I profess him my foe, that is, all Christians' enemy, so wish I he had some other way invented to spite me. But since it hath pleased God thus, to be right there, the insurgent's malice, I most humbly thank him, both that he has ever thus preserved your majesty through his aid, much like a lamb from the horns of this basson's bull, or the devil, and also stirred up the hearts of your loving subjects to resist them, and deliver you to his honor and there the insurgent's shame. The intelligence of which, proceeding from your majesty, deserves more humble thanks than with my pen I can render, which as infinite I will leave to number, for example, will not attempt to number. And amongst earthly things I chiefly wish this one, that there were as good surgeons for making anatomies of hearts, that I might show my thoughts to your majesty, as there are expert physicians of bodies, able to express the inward griefs of maladies to their patients. For then I doubt not, but know well, that whatever others should subject by malice, yet your majesty should be sure, by knowledge, that the more such myths render effuscate the clear light of my soul, the more my tired thoughts should listen to the dimming of there the insurgents' hidden malice. But since wishes are vain and desires oft fail, I must crave that my deeds may supply that which my thoughts cannot declare, and that they be not misdeemed, as the facts have been so well tried. And like as I have been your faithful subject from the beginning of your reign, so shall no wicked person cause me to change to the end of my life. And thus I commend your majesty to God's tuition, whom I beseech long time to preserve, ending with the new remembrance of my old suit, more than for that I should not be forgotten, than for I think it not remembered. From Hatfield, the 2nd of August, your majesty's obedient subject and humble sister, Elizabeth. Her majesty was happily satisfied with the painfully elaborate and metaphorical protestations of innocence and loyalty contained in this letter, and the princess continued in the gentle keeping of Sir Thomas Pope. He appears to have been really fond of his royal charge, who for her part well knew how to please him by her learned and agreeable conversation, and more especially by frequently talking with him on the subject nearest to his heart, Trinity College, which he had just founded at Oxford, for a president priest and twelve fellows. He mentions in one of his letters, with peculiar satisfaction, the interest she manifested in his college. The Princess Elizabeth, says he, often asketh me about the course I have devised for my scholars, and that part of my statutes respecting study I have shown her, she likes well. She is not only gracious, but most learned, ye right well know. Two of the fellows of this college were expelled by the president and society for violating one of the statutes. They repaired in great tribulation to their founder, and, acknowledging their fault, implored most humbly for readmittance to his college. Sir Thomas Pope, not liking by his own relentings, to countenance the infringements of the laws he had made for the good government of his college, yet willing to extend the pardon that was solicited, kindly referred the matter to the decision of the princess, who was pleased to intercede for the culprits, that they might be restored to their fellowships, on which the benevolent knight wrote to the president, that although the two offenders, Simpson and Rude, 
had well deserved their expulsion from his college, yet at the desire and commandment of the Lady Elizabeth's Grace, seconded by the request of his wife, he consented that they should, on making a public confession of their fault, and submitting to a fine, be again received, and that it should be recorded in a book, that they had been expelled, and that it was at the Lady Elizabeth's and his wife's desire that they were readmitted, and that he was fully resolved never to do the like again, to please any creature living, the Queen's Majesty alone excepted. This letter bears date, August 22nd, 1556. End of section 8. Section 9 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 3, Part 3. In the following November, Elizabeth, having been honored with an invitation to her sister's court, came to London in state. Her entrance and the dress of her retinue are thus quaintly recorded by a contemporary. The 28th of November came riding through Smithfield and Old Bailey, and through Fleet Street unto Somerset Place, my good Lady Elizabeth's Grace, the Queen's sister, with a great company of velvet coats and chains, her Grace's gentlemen, and after, a great company of her men, all in red coats, guarded with a broad guard of black velvet and cuts, or slashes. Elizabeth found herself treated with so many flattering marks of attention, by the nobility as well as the commons, whose darling she always had been, that she assembled a sort of court around her, and determined to settle herself in her town residence for the winter. She was, however, assailed by the council, at the insistence of her royal brother-in-law, with the renewal of the persecution she had undergone, in favor of her persevering suitor, Philibert of Savoy. The imperial ambassadors had been very urgent with the queen on the subject, and Elizabeth found that she had only been sent for in order to conclude the marriage treaty. The earnestness with which this was pushed on, immediately after the death of Courtney, naturally favors the idea that a positive contract of marriage had subsisted between that unfortunate nobleman and the princess, which had formed a legal impediment to her entering into any other matrimonial engagement during his life. She was, however, positive in her rejection of the Duke of Savoy's hand, though, as before, she protested her unalterable devotion to a maiden life, as the reason of her refusal. After this decision, she was compelled to give up the hope of spending a festive Christmas in London, and the Cottonian manuscript records her departure after the brief sojourn of one week in these words on the third day of september came riding from her place somerset house my lady elizabeth's grace from somerset place down fleet street and through old bailey and smithfield and so her grace took her way towards bishop hatfield such was the disgust that elizabeth had conceived during her late visit to court or the apprehensions that had been excited by the intimation used by the Spanish party, that she appears to have contemplated the very impolitic step of secretly withdrawing from the realm that was so soon to become her own and taking refuge in France. Henry the Second had never ceased urging her by his wily agent, Noel, to accept an asylum in his court, doubtless with the intention of securing the only person who, in the event of Queen Mary's death, would stand between his daughter-in-law and the crown of England. Noel had, however, interfered in so unseemly a manner in the intrigues and plots that agitated England that he had been recalled and superseded in his office by his brother, the Bishop of Auch, a man of better principles, and who scrupled to become a party in the iniquitous scheme of deluding a young and inexperienced princess to her own ruin. With equal kindness and sincerity, this worthy ecclesiastic told the Countess of Sussex, when she came to him secretly in disguise, to ask his assistance in conveying the Lady Elizabeth to France, that it was an unwise project, and that he would advise the princess to take example by the conduct of her sister, who, if she had listened to the counsels of those 
who would have persuaded her to take refuge with the emperor, would still have remained in exile. The countess returned again to him on the same errand, and he then plainly told her, that if ever Elizabeth hoped to ascend the throne of England, she must never leave the realm. A few years later, he declared, that Elizabeth was indebted to him for her crown. Whatever might be the cloud that had darkened the prospects of the princess, at the period when she had cherished intentions so fatal to her own interests, it quickly disappeared, and on the 25th of February, 1557, she came from her house at Hatfield to London, attended by a noble company of lords and gentlemen, to do her duty to the queen, and rested at Somerset House till the 28th, when she repaired to her majesty at Whitehall with many lords and ladies. Again, one morning in March, the Lady Elizabeth took her horse and rode to the palace of Sheen, with a goodly company of lords, ladies, knights, and gentlemen. These visits were probably on account of the return of Philip of Spain, which restored the queen to unwanted cheerfulness for a time, and caused a brief interval of gaiety in the lugubrious court. We are indebted to the lively pen of Giovanni Michel, the Venetian ambassador, for the following graphic sketch of the person and character of Elizabeth at this interesting period of her life. Milady Elizabeth, says he, is a lady of great elegance, both of body and mind, though her face may be called pleasing rather than beautiful. She is tall and well made, her complexion fine, though rather sallow. Her bloom must have been prematurely faded by sickness and anxiety, for Elizabeth could not have been more than three and twenty at this period. Her eyes, but above all, her hands, which she takes care not to conceal, are of superior beauty. In her knowledge of the Greek and Italian languages, she surpasses the queen, and takes so much pleasure in the latter, that she will converse with Italians in no other tongue. Her wit and understanding are admirable, as she has proved by her conduct, in the midst of suspicion and danger, when she concealed her religion, and comported herself like a good Catholic. Catherine Parr and Lady Jane Grey made no such compromise with conscience. Indeed, this dissimulation on the part of Elizabeth appears like a practical illustration of the text. The children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Michelle proceeds to describe Elizabeth as proud and dignified in her manners, for though she is well aware what sort of a mother she had, she is also aware that this mother of hers was united to the king in wedlock, with the sanction of the holy church, and the concurrence of the primate of the realm. This remark is important, as it proves that the marriage of Anne Boleyn was considered legal by the representative of the Catholic Republic of Venice. However, he goes on to say, The queen, though she hates her most sincerely, yet treats her in public with every outward sign of affection and regard, and never converses with her, but on pleasing and agreeable subjects. A proof, by the by, that Mary neither annoyed her sister by talking at her, nor endeavored to irritate her by introducing the elements of strife into their personal discussions when they were together. In this, the queen, at least, behaved with the courtesy of a gentlewoman. Michelle adds, that the princess had contrived to ingratiate herself with the king of Spain, through whose influence the queen was prevented from having her declared illegitimate, as she had it in her power to do, by an act of parliament, which would exclude her from the throne. It is believed, continues he, that but for this interference of the king, the queen would, without remorse, chastise her in the severest manner. For whatever plots against the queen are discovered, my lady Elizabeth, or some of her people, are always sure to be mentioned among the persons concerned in them. Michelle tells us, moreover, that Elizabeth would exceed her income and incur large debts, if she did not prudently, to avoid increasing the jealousy of the queen, limit her household and followers for, continues he, there is not a lord or gentleman in the realm, who has not sought to place himself, or a brother, or son, in her service. Her expenses are naturally increased, by her endeavors to maintain her popularity, although she opposes her poverty as an excuse, for avoiding the proposed enlargements of her establishment. 
This plea answered another purpose, by exciting the sympathy of her people and their indignation, that the heiress of the crown should suffer from straitened finances. Elizabeth was nevertheless, in the enjoyment of the income her father had provided for her maintenance, three thousand pounds a year, equal to twelve thousand per annum of the present currency, and presently the same allowance which Mary had before her extension to the crown. She is, pursues Michelle, to appearance, at liberty in her country residence, twelve miles from London, but really surrounded by spies and shut in with guards, so that no one comes or goes, and nothing is spoken or done without the queen's knowledge. Such is the testimony of the Venetian ambassador, of Elizabeth's position in her sister's court, but it should be remembered that he is the same man, who had intrigued with the conspirators, to supply them with arms, and that his information is avowedly only hearsay evidence. After this, it may not be amiss to enrich these pages, with the account given by an English contemporary, of one of the pageants that was devised for her pleasure, by the courteous dragon, by whom the captive princess was guarded, in her own fair mansion of Hatfield, and other dominions adjacent. In April, the same year, 1557, she was escorted from Hatfield to Enfield Chase, by a retinue of twelve ladies, clothed in white satin, on ambling palfreys, and twenty yeomen in green, all on horseback, that her grace might hunt the heart. At entering the chase or forest, she was met by fifty archers in scarlet boots and yellow caps, armed with gilded bows, one of whom presented her a silver-headed arrow, winged with peacock feathers. Sir Thomas Pope had the devising of this show. At the close of the sport, her grace was gratified with the privilege of cutting the buck's throat, a compliment of which Elizabeth, who delighted in bear baitings and other savage amusements of those semi-barbarous days, was not unlikely to avail herself. When her sister, Queen Mary, visited her at Hatfield, Elizabeth adorned her great state chamber for Her Majesty's reception, with a sumptuous suit of tapestry, representing the siege of Antioch. And after supper, a play was performed by the choir boys of St. Paul's, when it was over, one of the children sang, and was accompanied on the virginals by no meaner musician than the Princess Elizabeth herself. The account of Elizabeth's visit to the Queen at Richmond, and the splendid banquet and pageant which Mary, with the assistance of Sir Thomas Pope, with whom Her Majesty was long in consultation on the subject, devised for the entertainment of her sister, has been described in the life of Queen Mary. The pleasant and sisterly intercourse, which was for a brief time established between these royal ladies, was destined to be once more interrupted by the pertinacious interference of King Philip in favor of his friend's matrimonial suit for Elizabeth. Her hand was probably the reward with which that monarch had promised to garand his brave friend for his good services at St. Quentin, but the gallant Savoyard found it was easier to win a battle in the field under every disadvantage than to conquer the determination of an obdurate lady love. Elizabeth would not be disposed of in marriage to please any one, and as she made her refusal a matter of conscience, the queen ceased to importune her on the subject. Philip, as we have seen, endeavored to compel his reluctant wife to interpose her authority, to force Elizabeth to fulfill the engagement he had made for her, and Mary proved that she had, on occasion, a will of her own, as well as her sister. In short, the ladies made common cause, and quietly resisted his authority. He had sent his two noble kinswomen, the Duchesses of Parma and Lorraine, to persuade Elizabeth to comply with his desire, and to convey her to the continent, as the bride-elect of his friend. But Elizabeth, by her sister's advice, declined receiving these fair envoys, and they were compelled to return without fulfilling the object of their mission. Meantime, Elizabeth received several overtures from the ambassador of the great Gustavus Vasa, king of Sweden, who was desirous of obtaining her in marriage for his eldest son, Prince Eric. She declined listening to this proposal, because it was not made to her through the medium of the queen, her sister. The ambassador told her in reply, that the king of Sweden, his master, as a gentleman and a man of honor, thought it most proper to make the first application to herself, 
in order to ascertain whether it would be agreeable to her to enter into such an alliance and if she signified her consent he would then as a king propose it in due form to her majesty this delicacy of feeling was in unison with the chivalric character of gustavus vasa who having delivered his country from a foreign yoke had achieved the reformation of her church without persecution or bloodshed and regarding elizabeth as a protestant princess who was suffering for conscience sake was nobly desirous of making her his daughter-in-law elizabeth however who had previously rejected the heir of his neighbor christian of denmark desired the swedish envoy to inform his master that she could not listen to any proposals of the kind that were not conveyed to her through the queen's authority and at the same time declared that if left to her own free will she would always prefer a maiden life this affair reaching her majesty's ears she sent for sir thomas pope to court and having received from him a full account of this secret transaction she expressed herself well pleased with the wise and dutiful conduct of elizabeth and directed him to write a letter to her expressive of her approbation when sir thomas pope returned to hatfield mary commanded him to repeat her commendations to the princess and to inform her that an official communication had now been made to her from the king of sweden touching the match with his son on which she desired sir thomas to ascertain her sister's sentiments from her own lips and to communicate how her grace stood affected in this matter and also to marriage in general sir thomas pope in compliance with this injunction made the following report of what passed between himself and elizabeth on the subject first after i had declared to her grace how well the queen's majesty liked of her prudent and honourable answer made to the same messenger from the king of sweden i then opened unto her grace the effects of the said messenger's credence which after her grace had heard i said that the queen's highness had sent me to her grace not only to declare the same, but also to understand how her grace liked the said motion, whereunto, after a little pause, her grace answered in form following. Master Pope, I require you, after my most humble commendations unto the Queen's Majesty, to render unto the same like thanks, that it pleased her highness of her goodness, to conceive so well of my answer, made to the said messenger, and herewithal of her princely commendation, with such speed to command you by your letters to signify the same unto me who before remained wonderfully perplexed fearing that her majesty might mistake the same for which her goodness i acknowledge myself bound to honour serve love and obey her highness during my life requiring you also to say unto her majesty that in the king my brother's time there was offered me a very honourable marriage or two and ambassadors sent to treat with me touching the same whereunto i made my humble suit unto his highness as some of honour yet living can be testimonies that it would like the same king edward to give me leave with his grace's favour to remain in that estate i was which of all others best pleased me and in good faith i pray you say unto her highness i am even at this present of the same mind and so intend to continue with her majesty's favour assuring her highness i so well like this state as i persuade myself there is not any kind of life comparable to it and as concerning my liking the motion made by the said messenger i beseech you say unto her majesty that to my remembrance i never heard of his master before this time and that i so well like both the message and the messenger as i shall most humbly pray god upon my knees that from henceforth i may never hear of the one nor the other not the most civil way in the world it must be owned of dismissing a remarkably civil offer but elizabeth gives her reason in a manner artfully calculated to ingratiate herself with her royal sister and were there nothing else pursues she to move me to mislike the motion other than that his master would attempt the same without making the queen's majesty privy thereunto it were cause sufficient and when her grace had thus ended resumed sir thomas pope in conclusion i was so bold as of myself to say unto her grace her pardon first required that i thought few or none would believe but her grace would be right well contented to marry so there were some honourable marriage offered her by the queen's highness 
or with her majesty's assent whereunto her grace answered what i shall do hereafter i know not but i assure you upon my truth and fidelity and as god be merciful unto me i am not at this time otherwise minded than i have declared unto you no though i were offered the greatest prince in all europe sir thomas pope adds his own opinion of these protestations in the following sly comment and yet per case or perhaps the queen's majesty may conceive this rather to proceed from a maidenly shamefacedness than upon any such certain determination this important letter is among the harleian manuscripts and is endorsed the lady elizabeth her grace's answer made at hatfield the twenty sixth of april fifteen fifty eight to sir t pope knight being sent from the queen's majesty to understand how her grace liked the motion of marriage made by the king elect of switherland's messenger it affords unquestionable proof that elizabeth was allowed full liberty to decide for herself as to her acceptance or rejection of this protestant suitor for her hand her brother-in-law king philip not being so much as consulted on the subject camden asserts that after philip had given up the attempt of forcing her to wed his friend philibert of savoy he would fain have made up a marriage between her and his own son don carlos who was then a boy of sixteen but he finally when he became a widower offered himself to her acceptance instead of his heir elizabeth was so fortunate as to escape any implication in stafford's rebellion but among the spaniards a report was circulated that her hand was destined to reward the earl of westmoreland by whom the insurrection was quelled there were also rumors of an engagement between her and the earl of arundel these are mentioned in gonzales she is always called madame isabel in contemporary spanish memoirs though much has been asserted to the contrary the evidences of history prove that elizabeth was on amicable terms with queen mary at the time of her death and for some months previous to that event on the ninth of november the count de feria one of philip's most confidential counsellors brought the dying queen a letter from her absent consort who already embarrassed in a war with france and dreading the possibility of the queen of scots being placed on the throne requested mary to declare elizabeth her successor the queen had anticipated his desire by her previous appointment of elizabeth from whom she however exacted a profession of her adherence to the catholic creed elizabeth complained that the queen should doubt the sincerity of her faith and if we may credit the duchess of feria added that she prayed god that the earth might open and swallow her alive if she were not a true roman catholic although elizabeth never scrupled through her life to sacrifice truth to expediency it is difficult to believe that any one could to secure a temporal advantage utter so awful a perjury she afterwards told count feria that she acknowledged the real presence in the sacrament at least so the count affirmed in a letter he wrote to philip the second the day before queen mary died she likewise assured the lord lamar of her sincerity in this belief and added that she did now and then pray to the virgin mary stripe who quotes the documents in support of these words of elizabeth offers no contradiction to them edwin sandys in a letter to bollinger gives a very different report of the communication which passed between the royal sisters mary not long before her death says he sent two members of her council to her sister elizabeth and commanded them to let her know that it was her intention to bequeath to her the royal crown together with the dignity that she was then in possession of by right of inheritance in return however for this great favor conferred upon her she required of her three things first that she would not change her privy council secondly that she would make no alteration in religion and thirdly that she would discharge her debts and satisfy her creditors elizabeth replied in these terms i am very sorry to hear of the queen's illness but there is no reason why i should thank her for her intention of giving me the crown of this realm for she has neither the power of bestowing it upon me nor can i lawfully be deprived of it since it is my peculiar and hereditary right 
With respect to the council, I think myself as much at liberty to choose my counselors as she was to choose hers. As to religion, I promise thus much, that I will not change it, provided only, that it can be proved by the word of God, which shall be the only foundation and rule of my religion. Lastly, in requiring the payment of her debts, she seems to me to require nothing more than what is just, and I will take care that they shall be paid as far as may lie in my power. Such is the contradictory evidence given by two contemporaries, one of whom, Jane Dormer, afterwards Duchess of Feria, certainly had the surest means of information as to the real state of the case, as she was one of the most trusted of Queen Mary's ladies-in-waiting, and her subsequent marriage to the Spanish ambassador, the Conde de Feria, tended to enlighten her still more on the transactions between the dying queen and the princess. Dr. Sandys was not in England at the time, and merely quotes the statement of a nameless correspondent as to the affairs in England. The lofty tone of Elizabeth's reply suited not the deep dissimulation of her character, and appears inconsistent with the fact that she was at that time, in all outward observances, a member of the Church of Rome. She continued to attend the Mass, and all other Catholic observances, a full month after her sister's death, until she had clearly ascertained that the Protestant party was the most numerous, and likely to obtain the ascendancy. If she, therefore, judged that degree of caution, necessary after the sovereign authority was in her own hands, was it likely that she would declare her own opinion, while the Catholics, who surrounded the dying bed of Mary, were exercising the whole power of the crown? Her answer was probably comprised in language sufficiently mystified to conceal her real intentions from Mary and her counselors. On the 10th of November, Count Feria, in obedience to the directions of his royal master, went to pay his compliments to the princess, and to offer her the assurances of Don Philip's friendship and good will. Elizabeth was then at the house of Lord Clinton, about thirteen miles from London. There Feria sought and obtained an interview with her, which forms an important episode in the early personal annals of this great sovereign. The particulars are related by Feria himself, in a confidential letter to Philip. He says, The princess received him well, though not so cordially as on former occasions. He supped with her and Lady Clinton, and after supper, opened the discourse, according to the instructions he had received from the king his master. The princess had three of her ladies in attendance, but she told the count, they understood no other language than English, so he might speak before them. He replied, that he should be well pleased if the whole world heard what he had to say. Elizabeth expressed herself as much gratified by the count's visit, and the obliging message he had brought from his sovereign, of whom she spoke in friendly terms, and acknowledged that she had been under some obligations to him when she was in prison. But when the count endeavored to persuade her that she was indebted for the recognition of her right to the royal succession, neither to Queen Mary or her council, but solely to Don Philip, she exhibited some degree of incredulity. In the same conference, Elizabeth complained, that she had never been given more than three thousand pounds of maintenance, and that she knew the king had received large sums of money. The count contradicted this, because he knew it to be a fact, that Queen Mary had once given her seven thousand pounds, and some jewels of great value, to relieve her from debts in which she had involved herself, in consequence of indulging in some expensive entertainments, in the way of ballets. She then observed, that Philip had tried hard to induce her to enter into a matrimonial alliance with the Duke of Savoy, but that she knew how much favor the queen had lost by marrying a foreigner. The count probably felt the incivility of this remark, but only replied carelessly in general terms. Here the details of the conversation end, and Feria proceeds to communicate his own opinions of the princess. It appears to me, says he, that she is a woman of extreme vanity, but acute. She seems greatly to admire her father's system of government. I fear much that in religion she will not go right, as she seems inclined to favor men who are supposed to be heretics, and they tell me the ladies who are about her are all so. She appears highly indignant at the things that had been done against her during her sister's reign. She is much attached to the people, 
and is very confident that they are all on her side, which is indeed true. In fact, she says, it is they that have placed her in the position she at present holds, as the declared successor to the crown. On this point, Elizabeth, with great spirit, refused to acknowledge that she was under any obligation either to the King of Spain, his council, or even the nobles of England, though she said that they had all pledged themselves to remain faithful to her. Indeed, concludes the Count, there is not a heretic or traitor in all the realm who has not started, as if from the grave, to seek her and offer her their homage. Two or three days before her death, Queen Mary sent Jane Dormer to deliver the crown jewels to Elizabeth, together with her dying requests to that princess. First, that she would be good to her servants. Secondly, that she would repay the sums of money that had been lent on privy seals. And lastly, that she would continue the church as she had re-established it. Philip had directed his envoy to add to these jewels a valuable casket of his own, which he had left at Whitehall, and which Elizabeth had always greatly admired. In memory of the various civilities this monarch had shown to Elizabeth, she always kept his portrait in her bedchamber, even after they became deadly political foes. During the last few days of Mary's life, Hatfield became the resort of the time-serving courtiers, who sought to worship Elizabeth as the rising sun. The Conde de Feria readily penetrated the secret of those who were destined to hold a distinguished place in her councils, and predicted that Cecil would be her principal secretary. She did not conceal her dislike of her kinsman, Cardinal Pole, then on his deathbed. He had never, she said, paid her any attention, and had caused her great annoyance. There is, in Letty, a long controversial dialogue between Elizabeth and him, in which the princess appears to have the best of the argument, but, however widely he might differ with her on theological subjects, he always treated her with the respect due to her elevated rank, and opposed the murderous policy of her determined foe, Gardner. He wrote to her in his last illness, requesting her, to give credit to what the Dean of Worcester would say in his behalf, not doubting but his explanations would be satisfactory. But her pleasure or displeasure was of little moment to him in that hour, for the sands in the waning glass of life ebbed with him scarcely less quickly than with his departing sovereign and friend, Queen Mary. She died on the 17th of November, he on the 18th. Reports of the death of Mary were certainly circulated some hour before it took place, and Sir Nicholas Throckmorton, who was secretly employed by Elizabeth to give her the earliest possible intelligence of that event, rode off at fiery speed to Hatfield to communicate the tidings. The caution of Elizabeth taught her that it was dangerous to take any steps toward her own recognition till she could ascertain, to a certainty, the truth of a report that might only have been devised, to betray her into some act that might be construed into treason. She bade Throckmorton, hasten to the palace, and request one of the ladies of the bedchamber, who was in her confidence, if the queen were really dead, to send her as a token, the black enameled ring which her majesty wore night and day. The circumstances are quaintly versified, in the precious Throckmorton metrical chronicle, of the life of Sir Nicholas Throckmorton. Then I, who was misliked of the time, obscurely sought to live scant scene at all, so far was I from seeking up to climb, as that I thought it well to scape a fall. Elizabeth I visited by stealth, as one who wished her quietness with health. Repairing off to Hatfield, where she lay, my duty not to slack that I did owe, the queen fell very sick as we heard say, the truth whereof her sister ought to know, that her none might of malice undermine, a secret means herself did quickly find. She said, since not exceedeth woman's fear, who still do dread some baits of subtlety. Sir Nicholas, know a ring my sister wears, enameled black, a pledge of loyalty, the which the king of Spain in spousals gave. If aught fall out amiss, tis that I crave. But hark, Ope not your lips to any one, in hope as to obtain of courtesy, unless you know my sister first be gone, for grudging minds will soon coin treachery. So shall thyself be safe and us be sure, who takes no hurt shall need no care of cure. Her dying day shall thee such credit get, 
that all will forward be to pleasure thee and none at all shall seek thy suit to let or hinder but go and come and look here to find me thence to court i galloped in post where when i came the queen gave up the ghost the ring received my brethren which lay in london town with me to hatfield went and as we rode there met us by the way an old acquaintance hoping advancement a sugar bait that brought us to our bane but chiefly me who therewithal was tain i egged them on with promise of reward i thought if neither credit nor some gain fell to their share the world went very hard yet reckoned i without mine host in vain when to the court i and my brother came my news was stale but yet she knew them true but see how crossly things began to frame the cardinal died whose death my friends may rue for then lord gray and i were sent in hope to find some writings to or from the pope while throckmorton was on his road back to london mary expired and ere he could return with the ring to satisfy elizabeth of the truth of that event which busy rumour had antedated a deputation from the late queen's council had already arrived at hatfield to apprise her of the demise of her sister and to offer their homage to her as their rightful sovereign though well prepared for the intelligence she appeared at first amazed and overpowered at what she heard and drawing a deep respiration she sank upon her knees and exclaimed o domino factum est iliud et est mirable in oculos nostri it is the lord's doing it is marvellous in our eyes which says our authority sir robert naunton we find to this day on the stamp of her gold with this on her silver posui dominum adutorum meum i have chosen god for my helper eight and twenty years afterwards elizabeth in a conversation with the envoys of france castanoff and belliver spoke of the tears which she had shed on the death of her sister mary but she is the only person by whom they were ever recorded End of section 9section ten of lives of the queens of england volume six by agnes and elizabeth strickland this librivox recording is in the public domain elizabeth chapter four part one while queen mary lay on her deathbed the greatest alarm had prevailed regarding the expected crisis a contemporary who watched closely the temper of the public thus describes the anxieties of the responsible part of the community the rich were fearful the wise careful the honestly disposed doubtful and he adds emphatically the discontented and desperate were joyful wishing for strife as the door for plunder all persons therefore who had anything to lose whatever their religious bias might be must have felt relief at the peaceful extension of elizabeth on the morning of the seventeenth of november parliament which was then sitting assembled betimes for the dispatch of business the demise of the crown was however only known in the palace before noon dr heath the archbishop of york and lord chancellor of england sent a message to the speaker of the house of commons requesting that he with the knights and burgesses of the nether house would without delay adjourn to the upper house to give their assents in a matter of the utmost importance when the commons were assembled in the house of lords silence being proclaimed lord chancellor heath addressed the united senate in these words the cause of your summons hither at this time is to signify to you that all the lords here present are certainly certified that god this morning hath called to his mercy our late sovereign lady queen mary which hap as it is most heavy and grievous to us so we have no less cause otherwise to rejoice with praise to almighty god for leaving us a true lawful and right inheritrix to the crown of this realm which is the lady elizabeth second daughter to our late sovereign of noble memory henry the eighth and sister to our said late queen of whose most lawful right and title to the crown thanks be to god we need not doubt albeit the parliament that is the house of commons 
by the heavy accident of Queen Mary's death, did dissolve, yet as they had been elected to represent the common people of the realm, and to deal for them in matters of state, they could no way better discharge that trust than in joining with the lords in publishing the next succession to the crown. Wherefore the lords of this house have determined, with your assents and consents, to pass from hence into the palace, and there to proclaim the Lady Elizabeth, queen of this realm, without any further tract of time. God save Queen Elizabeth, was the response of the lords and commons to the speech of their lord chancellor. Long may Queen Elizabeth reign over us. And so, as our chronicle, was this parliament dissolved by the act of God. Thus, through the wisdom and patriotism of the Lord Chancellor of England, was the title of Queen Elizabeth rendered indisputable, for her first proclamation and recognition were rendered almost solemn acts of Parliament. It is scarcely possible, but that Heath must have foreseen his own doom and that of his religion, of which he was at that moment, with the exception of the expiring pole, the ostensible head in England, yet it is most evident that he preferred consulting the general good, by averting a civil war, to the benefit of his own particular class. It ought to be remembered that his conduct, at this crisis, secured the loyalty of the Catholics of England to Elizabeth. All the important acts of the United Houses of Parliament, respecting the recognition of Queen Elizabeth, were completed before the clock struck twelve, that 17th of November. The lords with the heralds then entered the palace of Westminster, and directly before its hall door, after several solemn soundings of trumpets, the new queen was proclaimed, Elizabeth, by the grace of God, Queen of England, France, and Ireland, and Defender of the Faith, etc. This, etc., hides an important historical fact, namely, that she was not then proclaimed Supreme Head of the Church. The young Duke of Norfolk, as Earl Marshal, accompanied by several bishops and nobles, then went into the city, where they met the Lord Mayor and civic authorities, and the heralds proclaimed Queen Elizabeth at the cross of Cheapside. In the afternoon, all the city bells rang, bonfires were lighted, ale and wine distributed, and the populace invited to feast at tables, put out at the doors of the rich citizens. All signs of mourning for the deceased queen, being entirely lost in the joy for the extension of her sister. So passed the first day of the reign of Elizabeth, a day which came to cheer with hope, a season of universal tribulation and misery. For, besides the inquisitorial cruelties of Bonner, which had proved plagues sufficient to the London citizens, it was a time of famine and of pestilence, more universal than the plague, which usually confined its ravages to great cities. Many thousands had, in the autumn of 1558, fallen victims to a fever called a quotidian ague, but which was, doubtless, a malignant typhus. It had broken out in the harvest, and carried off so many country people, that the harvest rotted on the ground, for want of hands. Great numbers of ecclesiastics had died of this fever. Thirteen bishops died in the course of four months, and to this circumstance, the facile change of religion, which took place directly, may partly be attributed. Cardinal Pole lay in the agonies of death. Christofferson, Bishop of Chichester, and Griffin, Bishop of Rochester, were either dying or dead. While these important scenes were transacting in her senate and metropolis, the new sovereign remained, probably out of respect to her sister's memory, in retirement at Hatfield, and the ceremony of her proclamation did not take place there till the 19th, when it was performed before the gates of Hatfield House. In the same day and hour, however, in which her extension to the regal office was announced to her, she entered upon the high and responsible duties of a vocation, for which few princes possessed such eminent qualifications as herself. The Privy Council repaired to the new Queen at Hatfield, and there she sat in council for the first time with them, November 20th. Sir Thomas Perry, the cofferer of her household, Cave, Rogers, and Sir William Cecil were sworn in as members. Her Majesty's address to Cecil on that occasion is a noble summary of the duties which he was expected to perform to his Queen and country. 
I give you this charge that you shall be of my privy council, and content yourself to take pains for me and my realm. This judgment I have of you, that you will not be corrupted by any manner of gift, and that you will be faithful to the state, and that, without respect to my private will, you will give me that counsel which you think best, and if you shall know anything necessary to be declared to me of secrecy, you shall show it to myself only, and assure yourself, I will not fail to keep taciturnity therein, and therefore herewith I charge you. Elizabeth left no room for doubt or speculation among the eager competitors for her favor, as to the minister whom she intended to guide the helm of state, for she accepted a note of advice from Sir William Cecil, on the most urgent matters that required her attention, that very day, and appointed him her principal secretary of state. The political tie that was then knit between Cecil and his royal mistress, though occasionally shaken, was only broken by the death of that great statesman, who was able to elevate or bend the powers of his acute intellect to all matters of government, from measures that rendered England the arbitress of Europe, to the petty details of the milliner and tailor in sumptuary laws. Elizabeth commenced her progress to her metropolis, November 23rd, attended by a magnificent retinue of lords, ladies, and gentlemen, and a prodigious concourse of people who poured out of London and its adjacent villages to behold and welcome her. On the road to Highgate, she met a procession of the bishops, who kneeled by the wayside and offered her their allegiance, which was very graciously accepted. She gave to every one of them her hand to kiss except Bonner, Bishop of London. This exception she made to mark her abhorrence of his cruelty. The Lord Mayor and Aldermen, in their scarlet robes, likewise met her, and conducted her in great state to the Charter House, then the town residence of Lord North. Lord Chancellor Heath and the Earls of Derby and Shrewsbury received her there. She stayed at the Charter House five days, and sat in council every day. The Queen left the Charter House on Monday, November 28th, to take formal possession of her royal fortress of the Tower. Immense crowds assembled to greet her, and to gaze on her, both without and within the city gates, and a mighty retinue of the nobility of both sexes surrounded her. She ascended a rich chariot, and rode from the Charter House along the Barbican, till she reached Cripplegate, where the Lord Mayor and city authorities received her. Then she mounted on horseback and entered the city in equestrian procession. She was attired in a riding dress of purple velvet, with a scarf tied over her shoulder. The sergeant at arms guarded her. Lord Robert Dudley, as master of the horse, rode next her. Thus early was this favorite exalted to the place he held so long. The Lord Mayor preceded her, carrying her scepter, and by his side rode garter king at arms. Lord Pembroke rode directly before Her Majesty, bearing the sword of state. The Queen rode along London Wall, then a regular fortification, which was richly hung with tapestry, and the city waits sounded loud music. She rode up Leadenhall Street to Grace Church Street, called by our citizen journalist, Grass Church Street, till she arrived at the Blanche Chapelton, at the entry of the Mart, or Market Lane, now the well-known Mark Lane, still the corn mart of England, though few who transact business there are aware of the extreme antiquity of their station. When the Queen arrived at the Blanche Chapelton, the tower guns began to herald her approach, and continued discharging all the while. She progressed down Mart Lane and Tower Street. She was greeted at various places by playing on regals, singing of children, and speeches from the scholars of St. Paul's School. The presence of the queen, says an eyewitness, gave life to all these solemnities. She promptly answered all speeches made to her. She graced every person either of dignity or office, and so cheerfully noticed and accepted everything, that in the judgment of the beholders, these great honors were esteemed too mean for her personal worth. Deeply had Elizabeth studied her métier du roi before she had an opportunity of rehearsing her part. Fortunately for her, the pride and presumption of youth had been a little tamed by early misfortune, and, stimulated by the inexorable necessity of self-defense, she had been forced to look into human character and adapt her manners to her interest. 
adversity had taught her the invaluable lesson embodied by wordsworth in these immortal words of friends however humble scorn not one as she entered the tower she majestically addressed those about her some said she have fallen from being princes of this land to be prisoners in this place i am raised from being a prisoner in this place to be prince of this land that dejection was a work of god's justice this advancement is a work of his mercy as they were to yield patience for the one so i must bear myself to god thankful and to men merciful for the other it is said that she immediately went to her former prison apartment where she fell on her knees and offered up a loud and extempore prayer in which she compared herself to daniel in the lion's den the words of which are in print but bear very strongly the tone of master fox's composition she remained at the tower till the fifth of december holding privy councils of mighty import whose chief tenor was to ascertain what members of the late queen's catholic council would coalesce with her own party which were the remnants of the administration of edward the sixth cecil bacon sadler parr russell and the dudleys likewise to produce a modification between the church of edward the sixth and the henrican or anti-papal church of her father which might claim to be a reformed church with herself for its supreme head on the fifth of december the queen removed from the tower by water and took up her abode at somerset house where a privy council was held daily for fifteen days meantime mass was said at the funerals of queen mary of cardinal pole and the two deceased bishops whose obsequies were observed with all the rites of the ancient church elizabeth attended in person at her sister's burial and listened attentively to her funeral sermon preached by dr white bishop of winchester which was in latin the proverb that comparisons are odious was truly illustrated in this celebrated discourse which sir john harrington calls a black sermon it contained a biographical sketch of the late queen in which he mentioned with great praise her renunciation of church supremacy and repeated her observation that as st paul forbade women to speak in the church it was not fitting for the church to have a dumb head this was not very pleasant to elizabeth who had either just required the oath of supremacy to be administered or was agitating that matter in the privy council had dr white preached in english his sermon might have done her much mischief when the bishop described the grievous suffering of queen mary he fell into such a fit of weeping that his voice was choked for a time when he recovered himself he added that queen mary had left a sister a lady of great worth also whom they were bound to obey for he said melior s canis vives leone mortuo elizabeth was too good a latinist not to fire at this elegant simile which declared that a living dog was better than a dead lion nor did the orator content himself with this currish comparison for he roundly asserted that the dead deserved more praise than the living for mary had chosen the better part as the bishop of winchester descended the pulpit stairs elizabeth ordered him under arrest he defied her majesty and threatened her with excommunication for which she cared not a rush he was a prelate of austere but irreproachable manners exceedingly desirous of testifying his opinions by a public martyrdom which he did and said all in his power to obtain but elizabeth was at that period of her life too wise to indulge the zealous professors of the ancient faith in any such wishes no author but the faithful and accurate stowe has noted the important result of the daily deliberations held by the queen and her privy council at somerset house at this epoch he says the queen began then to put in practice that oath of supremacy which her father first ordained and amongst the many that refused that oath was my lord chancellor dr heath the queen having a good respect for him would not deprive him of his title but committed the custody of the great seal to nicholas bacon attorney of the wards who from that time was called lord keeper and exercised the authority of lord chancellor as confirmed by act of parliament this oath of supremacy was the test which sifted the council from those to whom the ancient faith was matter of conscience 
and those to whom it was a matter of worldly business. The non-jurors withdrew either into captivity or country retirement. Of the Catholic members of the Privy Council who remained, Lord William Howard was Her Majesty's uncle and entire friend. Sackville was her cousin, the Earl of Arundel her lover. The Marquis of Winchester acted according to his characteristic description of his own policy, by playing the part of the willow, rather than the oak, and from one of the most cruel of Elizabeth's persecutors, became at once the supplest of her instruments. His example was imitated by others in this list, who for the most part appeared duly impressed with the spirit of the constitutional maxim, the crown takes away all defects. Elizabeth acted much as Mary did at her accession. She forbade any one to preach without her license, and ostensibly left the rites of religion as she found them, but she for a time wholly locked up the famous pulpit of political sermons, St. Paul's Cross. Meantime, Mass was daily celebrated in the chapel royal, and throughout the realm, and the Queen, though well known to be a Protestant, conformed outwardly to the ceremonial observances of the Church of Rome. It was desirable that the coronation of Elizabeth should take place speedily, in order that she might have the benefit of the oaths of allegiance, of that part of the aristocracy who regarded oaths. But a great obstacle arose. There was no one to crown her. The Archbishop of Canterbury was dead. Dr. Heath, the Archbishop of York, positively refused to crown her as supreme head of the church. There were but five or six Catholic bishops surviving the pestilence, and they all obstinately refused to perform the ceremony, neither would they consecrate any bishops, who were of a different way of thinking. Notwithstanding these signs and symptoms of approaching change, all ceremonies were preparing for celebrating the Christmas festival, according to the rites of the ancient church. It was on the morning of Christmas Day that Elizabeth took the important step of personal secession from the Mass. She appeared in her closet in great state at the celebration of the morning service, surrounded by her ladies and officers. Oglethorpe, Bishop of Carlisle, was at the altar, preparing to officiate at High Mass. But when the Gospel was concluded, and everyone expected that the Queen would have made the usual offering, she rose abruptly, and with her whole retinue withdrew from the closet into her privy chamber, which was strange to divers. God be blessed for all his gifts, as the narrator of this scene. This withdrawal was to signify her disapprobation of the mass, yet she proceeded softly and gradually, till she ascertained the tone of the new parliament, which had not yet met. Had her conduct on Christmas morning excited general reprobation, instead of approbation, she could have laid her retreat, and that of her personal attendance, on her sudden indisposition. When she found this step was well received, she took another, which was to issue a proclamation, ordering that from the approaching New Year's Day, the litany should, with the epistle and gospel, be said in English, in her chapel, and in all churches. Further alteration was not at this time effected, because it was determined that Elizabeth should be crowned with the religious ceremonials of the Catholic Church, but her mind was occupied with other thoughts than religion, relative to her coronation. She sent her favorite, Robert Dudley, to consult her pet conjurer, Dr. D, to fix a lucky day for the ceremony. Such was the occupations of the great Elizabeth, in the first exercise of her regal power, now dictating the mode of worship in her dominions, now holding a consultation with a conjurer. Elizabeth has been praised for her superiority to the superstitions of her age. Her frequent visits and close consultations with Dr. D, throughout the chief part of her life, are in lamentable contradiction to this panegyric. He had, as already noticed, been prosecuted for telling the fortunes of Elizabeth when princess, and casting the nativity of Queen Mary, to the infinite indignation of that queen. He had, it seems, made a lucky guess as to the short duration of Mary's life, and truly, it required no great powers of divination to do so. Such was the foundation of Queen Elizabeth's faith in this disreputable quack. Her confidential maid, too, Blanche Perry, who was in all the secrets of her royal mistress, before and after her accession, was an avowed disciple of Dr. D, and his pupil in alchemy and astrology. 
the queen her privy council and dr d having agreed that sunday the fifteenth of january would be the most suitable day for her coronation she likewise appointed the preceding day saturday the fourteenth for her grand recognition procession through the city of london as this procession always commenced from the royal fortress of the tower the queen went thither in a state barge on the twelfth of january from the palace of westminster by water the lord mayor and his city companies met her on the thames with their barges decked with banners of their crafts and mysteries the lord mayor's own company namely the mercers had a bachelor's barge and an attendant foist with artillery shooting off lustily as they went with great and pleasant melody of instruments which played in a sweet and heavenly manner her majesty shot the bridge about two o'clock at the still of the ebb the lord mayor with the other barges following her and she landed at the private stairs on tower wharf the queen was occupied the next day by making knights of the bath she likewise created or restored five peers among others she made her mother's nephew sir henry carey lord hunsdon the recognition procession through the city of london was one of peculiar character marked not by any striking difference of parade or ceremony but by the constant drama acted between the new queen and the populace the manner and precedence of the line of march much resembled that previously described in the life of her sister queen mary elizabeth left the tower about two in the afternoon seated royally attired in a chariot covered with crimson velvet which had a canopy borne over it by knights, one of whom was her illegitimate brother, Sir John Perrault. The queen, says George Ferrers, who was an officer in the procession, as she entered the city, was received by the people with prayers, welcomings, cries, and tender words, and all signs which argue an earnest love of subjects towards their sovereign, and the queen, by holding up her hands and glad countenance to such as stood afar off, and most tender language to those that stood nigh to her grace showed herself no less thankful to receive the people's good will than they to offer it to all that wished her well she gave thanks to such as bade god save her grace she said in return god save you all and added that she thanked them with all her heart wonderfully transported were the people with the loving answers and gestures of the queen the same she had displayed at her first progress from Hatfield. The city of London might, at that time, have been termed a stage, wherein was shown the spectacle of the noble-hearted queen's demeanor towards her most loving people, and the people's exceeding joy at beholding such a sovereign, and hearing so princely a voice. How many nosegays did her grace receive at poor women's hands? How often stayed she her chariot, when she saw any simple body approach to speak to her? a branch of rosemary given to her majesty with a supplication by a poor woman about fleet bridge was seen in her chariot when her grace came to westminster not without the wondering of such as knew the presenter and noted the queen's gracious reception and keeping the same an apt simile to the stage seems irresistibly to have taken possession of the brain of our worthy dramatist george ferrers in the midst of this pretty description of his liege lady's performance however her majesty adapted her part well to her audience a little coarsely in the matter of gesture perhaps as more casting up her eyes to heaven signing with her hands and moulding her features are described in the course of the narrative than are exactly consistent with the good taste of a gentlewoman in these days Nevertheless, her spectators were not very far advanced in civilization, and she dexterously adapted her style of performance to their appreciation. The pageants began in Fenchurch Street, where a fair child, in costly apparel, was placed on a stage to welcome Her Majesty to the city. The last verse of his greeting shall serve as a specimen of the rest. Welcome, O Queen, as much as heart can think. Welcome again, as much as tongue can tell welcome to joyous tongues and hearts that will not shrink god thee preserve we pray and wish thee ever well at the words of the last line the people gave a great shout repeating with one assent what the child had said and the queen's majesty thanked graciously both the city for her reception and the people for confirming the same here was noted the perpetual attentiveness in the queen's countenance while the child spake 
and a marvellous change in her look, as the words touched either her or the people, so that her rejoicing visage declared that the words took their place in her mind. Thus Elizabeth, who steered her way so skilfully, till she attained the highest worldly prosperity, appreciated the full influence of the mute angel of attention. It is evident she knew how to listen, as well as to speak. At the upper end of Grace Church Street, before the sign of the eagle, perhaps the spread eagle, the city had erected a gorgeous arch, beneath which was a stage, which stretched from one side of the street to the other. This was an historical pageant, representing the Queen's immediate progenitors. There sat Elizabeth of York, in the midst of an immense white rose, whose petals formed elaborate furbelows round her. By her side was Henry the Seventh, issuing out of a vast red rose, disposed in the same manner. The hands of the royal pair were locked together, and the wedding ring ostensibly displayed. From the red and white roses proceeded a stem, which reached up to a second stage, occupied by Henry the Eighth, issuing from a red and white rose, and for the first time since her disgrace and execution, was the effigy of the queen's mother, Anne Boleyn, represented by his side. One branch sprang from this pair, which mounted to a third stage, where sat the effigy of Queen Elizabeth herself, enthroned in royal majesty, and the whole pageant was framed with wreaths of roses, red and white. By the time the queen had arrived before this quaint spectacle, her loving lieges had become so outrageously noisy in their glee, that there were all talkers and no hearers, not a word that the child said, who was appointed to explain the whole puppet show, and repeat some verses, could be heard, and the queen was forced to command and entreat silence. Her chariot had passed so far forward that she could not well view the said kings and queens, but she ordered it to be backed, yet scarcely could she see, because the child who spoke was placed too much within. Besides, it is well known, Elizabeth was near-sighted, as well as her sister. As she entered Cornhill, one of the knights, who bore her canopy, observed that an ancient citizen turned away and wept. Yonder is an alderman, he said to the queen, which weepeth and averteth his face. I warrant it is for joy, replied the queen, a gracious interpretation, as the narrator, which makes the best of the doubtful. In Cheapside she smiled, and being asked the reason, she replied, because I have just overheard one say in the crowd, I remember old King Harry the Eighth. The scriptural pageant was placed on a stage, which spanned the entrance of Soper's Lane. It represented the eight Beatitudes, prettily personified by beautiful children. One of these little performers addressed to the queen the following lines, which are a more favorable specimen than usual pageant poetry. Thou hast been eight times blessed, O queen of worthy fame, by meekness thy sprite, when care did thee beset, by mourning in thy grief, by mildness in thy blame, by hunger and by thirst, when right thou couldst not get, by mercy showed, not proved, by pureness of thine heart, by seeking peace alway, by persecution wrong. Therefore trust thou in God, since he hath helped thy smart, that as his promise is, so he will make thee strong. The people all responded to the wishes the little spokesman had uttered, whom the queen most gently thanked for their loving good will. Many other pageants were displayed at all the old stations in Cornhill and Cheap, with which our readers are tolerably familiar in preceding biographies. These must we pass by unheeded, so did not Queen Elizabeth, who had some pertinent speech, or at least some appropriate gesture, ready for each. Thus, when she encountered the governors and boys of Christchurch Hospital, all the time she was listening to a speech from one of the scholars, she sat with her eyes and hands cast up to heaven, to the great edification of all beholders. Her reception of the grand allegory of time and truth, at the little conduit in Cheapside, was more natural and pleasing. She asked, Who an old man was who sat with his scythe and hourglass? She was told, Time. Time, she repeated, and time has brought me here. In this pageant she spied that truth held a Bible in English, ready for presentation to her, and she bade Sir John Perrault, the knight nearest to her, who held up her canopy, to step forward and receive it for her, 
but she was informed that it was not the regular manner of presentation, for it was to be let down into her chariot, by a silken string. She therefore told Sir John Perrault to stay, and at the proper crisis, in some verses recited by truth, the book descended, and the queen received it in both hands, kissed it, clasped it to her bosom, and thanked the city for this present, esteemed above all others. She promised to read it diligently to the great comfort of the bystanders. Throughout the whole of Cheapside, from every penthouse and window, hung banners and streamers, and the rich carpets, stuffs, and cloth of gold tapestried the streets, specimens of the great wealth of the stores within, for Cheapside was the principal location of the mercers and silk dealers in London. At the upper end of this splendid thoroughfare were collected the city authorities, in their gala dresses, headed by their recorder, Master Renolf Chomeli, who, in the name of the Lord Mayor and the City of London, begged Her Majesty's acceptance of a purse of crimson satin, containing a thousand marks in gold, and withal, beseeched her to continue good and gracious lady, and queen to them. The Queen's Majesty took the purse, with both hands, and readily answered, I thank my Lord Mayor, his brethren, and ye all, and whereas, Master Recorder, your request is, that I may continue your good lady and queen, be ye assured, that I will be as good unto ye, as ever queen was to a people. After pausing to behold a pageant of Deborah, who governed Israel in peace for forty years, she reached the temple bar, where Gog and Magog, and a concert of sweet-voiced children, were ready to bid her farewell, in the name of the whole city. The last verse of the song of farewell, gave a hint of the expected establishment of the Reformation. Farewell, O worthy queen, and as our hope is sure, that into error's place, thou wilt now truth restore, so trust we that thou wilt, our sovereign queen endure, and loving ladies stand from henceforth evermore. Allusions to the establishment of truth, and the extirpation of error, had been repeated in the previous parts of this song, and whenever they occurred, Elizabeth held up her hands and eyes to heaven, and at the conclusion, expressed her wish that all the people should respond, Amen. As she passed through Temple Bar, she said, as a farewell to the populace, be ye well assured, I will stand your good queen. The acclamations of the people in reply exceeded the thundering of the ordinance, at that moment shot off from the tower. Thus ended this celebrated procession, which certainly gave the tone of Elizabeth's public demeanor throughout the remainder of her life. End of section 10. Section 11 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 4, Part 2. The Queen's perplexity regarding the prelate, who was to crown her, must have continued till the last moment, because, had Dr. Oglethorpe, the Bishop of Carlisle, been earlier prevailed on, to perform the ceremony, it is certain proper vestments could have been prepared for him, instead of borrowing them from Bonner, which was actually done on the spur of the moment. Dr. Oglethorpe was the officiating bishop at the royal chapel. He might therefore consider that he owed more obedience to the sovereign's command than the rest of the Catholic prelates. The compromise appears to have been that if Elizabeth took the ancient oath administered to her Catholic predecessors, he would set the crown on her head that she took such oath, is universally agreed by historians. She passed the night preceding her coronation at Whitehall, and early in the morning came in her barge, in procession by water, to the old palace at Westminster. She assumed the same robes in which she afterwards opened Parliament, a mantle of crimson velvet, furred with ermine, with a cordon of silk and gold, with buttons and tassels of the same a train and surcoat of the same velvet, the train and skirt, furred with ermine, a cap of maintenance, striped with passaments of gold lace, and a tassel of gold to the same. This was by no means in accordance with the jeweled circlets usually worn by queens of England, whether consort or regnant, 
preparatory to their coronation. There is every reason to believe, from the utter exhaustion of the treasury, that the coronation of Elizabeth was in many instances abbreviated of its usual splendor. But one very scarce and imperfect detail exists of it. For it could not have given pleasure to any party, the Protestants must have been ashamed of the oath she took, and the Catholics enraged at her breaking it. Her procession from Westminster Hall was met by the one bishop, Oglethorpe. He wore his mitre and the borrowed vestments of Bonner. Three crosses were borne before him, and he walked at the head of the singers of the Queen's Chapel, who sang as they went, Salve Festa Deis. The path for the Queen's procession was railed in and spread with blue cloth. The Queen was conducted, with the usual ceremonies, to a chair of state at the high altar. She was then led by two noblemen to the platform for recognition, and presented by Bishop Oglethorpe as Queen, trumpets blowing between every proclamation. When she presented herself before the high altar, she knelt before Oglethorpe, and kissed the cover, or veil, of the paten and chalice, and made an offering in money. She returned to her chair while Bishop Oglethorpe preached the sermon and bade the beads, a service somewhat similar to our litany, and the queen kneeling, said the Lord's Prayer. Then being reseated, the bishop administered the coronation oath. The precise words of it are omitted, but it has been asserted that it was the same exacted for James I and the Stuart kings of England, who were required to take a similar oath, namely, to keep the church in the same state as did King Edward the Confessor. Some important points of difference certainly existed between the discipline of the Anglo-Saxon church of the 11th century and the Roman Catholic of the 16th century. What they were, it is the place of theologians to discuss. But it is our duty to our subject to suggest, as her defense from the horrid appearance of willful perjury, that it is possible she meant at that time to model the reformed church she projected, and for which she challenged the appellation of Catholic as near as possible to the Anglo-Saxon church. When Bishop Oglethorpe was kneeling before the altar, the queen gave a little book to a lord to deliver to him. The bishop refused to receive it, and read in other books. But immediately afterwards the bishop took the queen's book, and read it before her grace. It is supposed that the queen sent, with her little book, a request that Oglethorpe would read the gospel and epistle in English, which was done, and it constituted the sole difference between the former Catholic coronations and that of Elizabeth. Then the bishop sang, blank, here is an hiatus from the manuscript, the mass from a missal, which had been carried in procession before the queen. A carpet was spread before the high altar, and cushions of gold cloth, placed upon it, and the secretary Cecil delivered a book to the bishop, another bishop standing at the left of the altar. The queen now approached the altar, and leaned upon cushions, while her attendants spread a silken cloth over her, and the bishop anointed her. It seems she was displeased at this part of the ceremony, for when it was finished, and she retired behind her traverse, to change her dress, she observed to her maids, that the oil was grease and smelled ill. When she reappeared before the public in the abbey, she wore a train and mantle of cloth of gold furred with ermine. Then a sword with a girdle was put upon her, the belt going over one shoulder and under the other. Two garters were put on her arms. These were the armilla, or armlets, and were not connected with the order of the garter. Then the bishop put the crown upon her head, and delivered the scepter into her hand. She was then crowned with another crown, probably the crown of Ireland, the trumpets again sounding. The queen then offered the sword, laying it on the altar, and knelt with the scepter and cross in her hand, while the bishop read from a book. The queen then returned to her chair of state. The bishop put his hands into the queen's hands, and repeated certain words. This was the homage, the whole account being evidently given by an eyewitness, not previously acquainted with the ceremony. He asserts that the lords did homage to the queen, kneeling and kissing her. He adds, Then the rest of the bishops did homage. But this must be a mistake, because they would have preceded the nobles. Then the bishop began the mass, the epistle being read, first in Latin and then in English, the gospel the same, the book being sent to the queen, who kissed the gospel. She then went to the altar to make her second offering, 
three unsheathed swords being borne before her, and one in the scabbard. The queen kneeling, put money in the basin, and kissed the chalice, and then and there certain words were read to her grace. She retired to her seat again during the consecration, and kissed the pax. She likewise received the Eucharist, but did not receive from the cup. When mass was done, she retired behind the high altar, and as usual, offered her crown, robes and regalia, in St. Edward's Chapel, coming forth again with the state crown on her head, and robed in violet velvet and ermine, and so proceeded to the banquet in Westminster Hall. The champion of England, Sir Edward Dymock, performed his official duty by riding into the hall in fair complete armor upon a beautiful courser richly trapped with gold cloth he cast down his gauntlet in the midst of the hall as the queen sat at dinner with offer to fight him in the queen's rightful quarrel who should deny her to be the lawful queen of this realm the proclamation of the heralds on this occasion is a historical and literary curiosity the right the champion offered to defend was according to the proclamation of mr garter king at arms that of the most high and mighty princess our dread sovereign lady elizabeth by the grace of god queen of england france ireland defender of the true ancient and catholic faith most worthy empress from the orcade isles to the mountains pyrenee a largest a largest a largest thus the title of supreme head of the church was not then publicly challenged by Elizabeth, yet it might appear implied in the addition to her regal style, so strangely brought in after the phrase, defender of the true ancient and Catholic faith, as if she were empress of the faith of those who renounced the papal domination from the north of Scotland to the reformers in the south of France. For what but to mystify the listening ear with some such idea, could such a phrase be interpolated in such a ceremony? For if she meant to challenge the old claim of Bretwalda over Scotland, why was it not added to her temporal titles? Besides, by claiming the whole kingdom of France, in the preceding sentence, she had previously asserted her empire over that country to the Pyrenees. Labor dire and weary woe is the struggle for those to appear consistent, who are willfully acting a double part. It is withal useless. Elizabeth, far famed as she was for courage, personal and mental, and both have, perhaps, been overrated, had not at this juncture the moral intrepidity to assert what she had already assumed and acted on in private. One of the earliest regnal acts of Elizabeth was to send friendly and confidential assurances to the kings of Denmark and Sweden, and all the Protestant princes of Germany, of her attachment to the Reformed faith, and her wish to cement a bond of union between all its professors. At the same time, with a view of keeping fair with the Catholic powers of Europe, and obtaining a recognition that would ensure the obedience of her own subjects of that persuasion, she directed Carney, her late sister's resident minister at the court of Rome, to announce her accession to Pope Paul IV, and to assure him that it was not her intention to offer violence to the consciences of any denomination of her subjects on the score of religion. The aged pontiff, incensed at the new doctrine of liberty of conscience implied in this declaration and regarding with hostile feelings the offspring of a marriage which had involved the overthrow of the papal power in england replied that he was not able to comprehend the hereditary right of one not born in wedlock that the queen of scots claimed the crown as the nearest legitimate descendant of henry the seventh but that if elizabeth were willing to submit the controversy to his arbitration every indulgence should be shown to her which justice would permit. Elizabeth immediately recalled her minister. The Pope forbade his return, under peril of excommunication, and Carney, though he talked largely of his loyalty to his royal mistress, remained at Rome till his death. The bull issued by this haughty pontiff, on the 12th of January, 1558-59, to declaring heretical sovereigns incapable of reigning, though Elizabeth's name was not mentioned therein, was supposed to be peculiarly aimed at her. Yet it did not deprive her of the allegiance of her Catholic peers, all of whom paid their liege homage to her, as their undoubted sovereign at her coronation. The new sovereign received the flattering submissions of her late persecutors, 
with a graciousness of demeanor which proved that the queen had the magnanimity to forgive the injuries and even the insults that had been offered to the princess elizabeth one solitary instance is recorded in which she used an uncourteous expression to a person who had formerly treated her with disrespect and now sought her pardon a member of the late queen's household conscious that he had offered many petty affronts to elizabeth when she was under the cloud of her sister's displeasure came in a great fright to throw himself at her feet on her first triumphant assumption of the regal office and in the most abject language besought her not to punish him for his impertinences to her when princess fear not replied the queen we are of the nature of the lion and cannot descend to the destruction of mice and such small beasts to sir henry bedingfeld she archly observed when he came to pay his duty to her at her first court whenever i have a prisoner who requires to be safely and straightly kept i shall send him to you she was wont to tease him by calling him her jailer when in her mirthful mood but always treated him as a friend and honored him subsequently with a visit at his stately mansion oxburg hall norfolk elizabeth strengthened her interest in the upper house by adding and restoring five protestant statesmen to the peerage henry carey her mother's nephew she created lord hunsdon lord thomas howard brother to the duke of norfolk she made viscount bindon oliver st john also in connection of the boleyns baron of bletsoe she restored the brother of catherine parr william marquis of northampton to the honors he had forfeited in the late reign by espousing the cause of lady jane grey and also the son of the late protector somerset edward seymour to the title of earl of hertford the morning after her coronation she went to her chapel it being the custom to release prisoners at the inauguration of a sovereign perhaps there was some forgotten religious ceremony connected with this act of grace in her great chamber one of the courtiers presented her with a petition and before the whole court in a loud voice implored that four or five more prisoners might be released. On inquiry, he declared them to be the four evangelists and the apostle St. Paul, who had been long shut up in an unknown tongue, as it were, in prison, so they could not converse with the common people. Elizabeth answered very gravely, It is best first to inquire of them whether they approve of being released or not. The inquiry was soon after made in the convocation appointed by Parliament, the result of which was that the apostles did approve of their translation the translation of the scriptures was immediately published by authority which after several revisions became in the succeeding reign the basis of our present version the religious revolution effected by elizabeth was very gently and gradually brought to pass the queen writes jewel to peter martyr though she openly favors our cause is wonderfully afraid of allowing any innovations. This is owing partly to her own friends, by whose advice everything is carried on, and partly to the influence of Count Feria, a Spaniard, and Philip's ambassador. She is, however, prudently, piously, and firmly following up her purpose, though somewhat more slowly than we could wish. The queen, continues Jewel, regards you most highly. She made so much of your letter, that she read it over a second and third time, with the greatest eagerness. I doubt not but that your book, when it arrives, will be even more acceptable. Her charge to her judges, given about the same time, is noble in the simplicity of its language. It may be noticed, that when Elizabeth used perspicuous phraseology, in speaking or writing, she was usually sincere. Have a care over my people, you have my people, do you that which I ought to do. They are my people. Every man oppresseth and spoileth them without mercy. They cannot revenge their quarrel, nor help themselves. See unto them. See unto them, for they are my charge. I charge you, even as God hath charged me. I care not for myself. My life is not dear to me. My care is for my people. I pray God, whoever succeedeth me, be as careful as I am. They who know what cares I bear, would not think I took any great joy in wearing a crown. These ears, added Dr. Jewell, heard Her Majesty speak these words. 
the queen rode in her parliamentary robes on the twenty fifth of january with all her peers spiritual and temporal in their robes to westminster abbey where she attended a somewhat incongruous religious service high mass was celebrated at the altar before queen lords and commons the sermon was preached by dr cox edward the sixth calvinistic schoolmaster who had returned from geneva for the purpose the queen's supremacy was debated in this parliament dr heath the lord chancellor who took his seat with the rest of the catholic bishops spoke against this measure finally the oath of the queen's supremacy as confirmed by parliament being tendered to dr heath archbishop of york and the rest of the catholic bishops all refused it but landaff they were deprived of their sees with which the most illustrious of the protestant divines were endowed the learned dr parker the friend of anne boleyn was appointed by the queen archbishop of canterbury he had been in exile for conscience sake in the reign of queen mary under his auspices the church of england was established by authority of this session of parliament nearly in its present state the common prayer and articles of edward the sixth church being restored with some important modifications the translation of the scriptures in english was likewise restored to the people before the house of commons was dissolved sir thomas gargrave their speaker craved leave to bring up a petition to her majesty of vital importance to the realm it was to entreat that she would marry that the country might have her royal issue to reign over them elizabeth received the address presented by the speaker knights and burgesses of the lower house seated in state in her great gallery at whitehall palace she paused a short space after listening to the request of the commons and then made a long oration in reply which george ferrers who was present recorded as near as he could bring it away but whether the fault rests with the royal oratress or the reporter this task was not very perspicuously achieved in the course of her speech she alluded very mysteriously to her troubles in the former reign from my years of understanding she said knowing myself a servitor of almighty god i choose this kind of life in which i do yet live as a life most acceptable to him wherein i thought i could best serve him from which my choice if ambition of high estate offered me in marriage the displeasure of the prince the eschewing the danger of mine enemies or the avoiding the peril of death whose messenger the princess's indignation was continually present before mine eyes by whose means if i knew or do justly suspect i will not now utter them or if the whole cause were my sister herself i will not now charge the dead could all have drawn or dissuaded me i had not now remained in this virgin's estate wherein you see me but so constant have i always continued in this my determination that though my words and youth may seem hardly to agree together yet it is true that to this day i stand free from any other meaning towards the conclusion of her speech she made an observation which some years later would have seemed to imply the future advantages of the whole island being united by the succession of the heirs of stuart to the english throne yet as mary of scotland was then dauphiness of france and childless nothing of the kind could have been in the thoughts of elizabeth and albeit it doth please almighty god to continue me still in the mind to live out of the state of marriage it is not to be feared but he will so work in my heart and in my wisdoms that as good provision may be made in convenient time whereby the realm shall not remain destitute of an heir that may be a fit governor and perventure more beneficial to the realm than such offspring as may come of me for though i be never so careful for your well-doings yet may mine issue grow out of kind and become ungracious she then drew from her finger her coronation ring and showing it to the commons told them that when she received that ring she had solemnly bound herself in marriage to the realm and that it would be quite sufficient for the memorial of her name and for her glory if when she died an inscription were engraved on a marble tomb saying here lieth elizabeth which reigned a virgin and died a virgin in conclusion she dismissed the deputation with these words i take your coming to me in good part and give to you eftsoons my hearty thanks 
yet more for your good will and good meaning than for your message. Elizabeth, when she made this declaration, was in the flower of her age, having completed her twenty-fifth year in the preceding September, and according to the description given of her, at the period of her accession to the throne, by Sir Robert Naughton, she must have been possessed of no ordinary personal attractions. She was of person tall, of hair and complexion fair, and therewithal well favoured, but high-nosed, of limb and feature neat, and, which added to the luster of these external graces, of a stately and majestic comportment, participating more of her father than of her mother, who was of an inferior ally, plausible, or as the French have it, debonair and affable, which, descending as hereditary to the daughter, did render her of a more sweet temper, and endeared her to the love of the people. She had already refused the proffered hand of her sister's widower, Philip the Second of Spain, who had pressed his suit with earnestness, amounting to importunity, animated by the desire of regaining, with another regal English bride, a counterbalance to the allied powers of France and Scotland. It has also been asserted that the Spanish monarch had conceived a passion for Elizabeth during the life of her sister, which rendered his suit more lively, and assuredly he must have commenced his overtures before his deceased consort's obsequies were celebrated, in his eagerness to gain the start of other candidates. Elizabeth always attributed his political hostility to his personal pique at her declining to become his wife. According to Camden, Philip addressed many eloquent letters to Elizabeth during his short but eager courtship, and she took infinite pleasure and pride in publishing them among her courtiers. Philip endeavored also to overcome the scruples of his royal sister-in-law, whom on that occasion he certainly treated as a member of the Church of Rome, by assuring her that there would be no difficulty in obtaining a dispensation from the Pope for their marriage. Elizabeth felt, however, that it would be a marriage even more objectionable than that of her father, Henry the Eighth, with Catherine of Aragon, and that for her to become a party in matrimony, contracted under such circumstances, would at once, by virtually invalidating her own legitimacy, declare Mary Queen of Scots the rightful heiress of the late Queen, her sister, in succession to the throne of England, and Elizabeth had no inclination to risk the contingency of exchanging the regal garland of Plantagenet and Tudor for the crown matrimonial of Spain. Yet she had a difficult and a delicate game to play, for the friendship of Spain appeared to be her only bulwark against the combined forces of France and Scotland. She had succeeded to an empty exchequer, a realm dispirited by the loss of Calais, burdened with debt, embarrassed with a base coinage, and a starving population ready to break into a civil war, under the pretext of deciding the strength of rival creeds by the sword. Moreover, her title to the throne had already been impugned by the King of France, compelling his youthful daughter-in-law, the Queen of Scots, then in her sixteenth year, and entirely under his control, to assume the arms and regal style of England. On the 16th of January, 1559, the Dauphin of France and the Queen of Scotland, his wife, did, by the style and title of King and Queen of England and Ireland, grant to Lord Fleming certain things, notes Sir William Cecil in his diary, a brief and quiet entry of a debt incurred in the name of an irresponsible child, which was hereafter to be paid with heavy interest in tears and blood, by that ill-fated princess, whose name had, in the brief season of her morning splendor, filled the hearts of Elizabeth and her council with alarm. If Elizabeth had shared the feminine propensity of leaning on others for succor in the time of danger, she would have probably accepted inglorious protection with the nuptial ring of Philip. But she partook not of the nature of the ivy, but the oak, being formed and fitted to stand alone, and she met the crisis bravely. She was new to the cares of empire, but the study of history had given her experience and knowledge in the regnal science, beyond what can be acquired during years of personal attempts at governing by monarchs who have wasted their youthful energies in the pursuit of pleasure or mere finger-end accomplishments. The chart by which she steered was marked with the rocks, the quicksands, and the shoals, on which the barks of other princes had been wrecked and she knew that, of all the false beacons, that had allured the feeble mind to disgrace and ruin, 
the expedient of calling in foreign aid, the seasons of national distress was the most fatal. She knew the English character, and she had seen the evils and discontents that had sprung from her sister's Spanish marriage, and in her own case, these would have been aggravated by the invalidation of her title to the throne. She therefore firmly, but courteously, declined the proposal, under the plea of scruples of conscience, which were to her insuperable. This refusal preceded her coronation, for the Spanish ambassador, Count Feria, in consequence of the slight which he conceived had been put upon his master, by the maiden monarch declining the third reversion of his hand, feigned sickness as an excuse for not assisting at that ceremonial. The next month, Philip pledged himself to the beautiful Elizabeth of France, a perilous alliance for Elizabeth of England. It rendered Philip of Spain, and the husband of Mary, Queen of Scots, the formidable rival of her title, brothers-in-law. Elizabeth's first care was to procure an act for the recognition and declaring of her own title from her parliament, which was unanimously passed, and without any allusion to her mother's marriage, or the stigma which had previously been put on her own birth. The statute declares her to be rightly, lineally, and lawfully descended from the blood royal, and pronounces all sentences and acts of parliament derogatory to this declaration to be void. The latter clause is tantamount to a repeal of all those dishonoring statutes which had passed in the reign of Henry the Eighth against her mother and herself, and in addition, an act was passed which, without reversing the attainer of Anne Boleyn, rendered Elizabeth inheritable to her mother and to all her maternal ancestors. This was a prudential care for securing, malgré, all the chances and changes that might befall the crown, a share in the wealth of the citizen family of Boleyn, implying at the same time that she was the lawful representative of the elder co-heiress of that house, and, of course, born in lawful wedlock. But in a nobler spirit would it have been to have used the same influence for the vindication of her mother's honor, by causing the statutes which infamed her to be swept from the records. The want of moral courage on the part of Elizabeth, in leaving this duty unperformed, was injurious to her own royal dignity, and has been always regarded as a tacit admission of Anne Boleyn's guilt. Many writers have argued that it was a point of wisdom in Elizabeth, not to hazard calling attention to the validity of her father's marriage with Anne Boleyn, or the charges against that unfortunate queen. But inasmuch as it was impossible to prevent those subjects from continuing, as they always had been, points of acrimonious discussion, her cautious evasions of questions, so closely touching her own honor, gave rise to the very evils she was anxious to avoid, and we find that a gentleman named Le Bourne was executed at Preston, who died saying, Elizabeth was no queen of England, but only Elizabeth Bullen, and that Mary of Scotland was rightful sovereign. Notwithstanding the danger of her position, from the probable coalition of the powers of Catholic Europe against her, Elizabeth stood undaunted, and, though aware of the difficulty of maintaining a war, with such resources as she possessed, she assumed as high a tone, for the honor of England, as the mightiest of her predecessors, during the conferences at Chateau Cambresses, for the arrangement of a general treaty of pacification, and, declining the offered mediation of Philip the Second, she chose to treat alone. She demanded the restoration of Calais, as the prominent article, and that, in so bold and persevering a manner, that it was guaranteed to her, at the expiration of eight years, by the King of France, under a penalty of five hundred thousand crowns. With a view to the satisfaction of her subjects, she caused Lord Wentworth, the last Lord Deputy of Calais, and others of the late commanders there, to be arraigned, for the loss of a place more dear, than profitable to England, and also to show how firmly the reins of empire could be grasped, in the hand of a maiden monarch. Wentworth was acquitted by his peers, the others were found guilty and condemned, but the sentence was never carried into execution. End of section 11. Section 12 of Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 6, by
by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Elizabeth, Chapter 4, Part 3 During the whole of Lent, the Queen had kept the fast, heard sermons regularly, and apparelled herself in black, but the happy restoration of peace caused the Easter festival to be observed with unusual rejoicings. On St. George's Day, the Queen went about the hall, and all the knights of the garter, singing in procession. The same day in the afternoon were four knights elected, namely, the Duke of Norfolk, the Marquis of Northampton, the Earl of Rutland, and the Lord Robert Dudley, master of the Queen's horse. The following lines, from a contemporary poet, may not be displeasing to the reader. I saw a virgin queen, attired in white, leading with her a sort of goodly knights, with garters and with collars of St. George. Elizabeth, on a compartment of bice, in gold, was writ and hung askew upon her head, under a royal crown. She was the sovereign of the knights she led. Her face methink I knew, as if the same, the same great empress that we now enjoy, had climbed the clouds, and been in person there, to whom the earth, the sea, and elements, auspicious are. When Elizabeth came to the throne, she found herself in a novel position, as regarded the order of the garter, for her brother-in-law, Philip of Spain, had, in consequence of his marriage with her late sister, Queen Mary, been constituted, by the authority of Parliament, joint sovereign of the order with his royal consort. Elizabeth, having no wish to hold any dignity in partnership with him, yet desiring to do all things with proper courtesy, caused his banner to be removed to the second stall on the prince's side, intimating that he continued a knight companion of the order, though he had, by the death of the queen his wife, lost the joint sovereignty. Philip, however, returned the garter by the hands of the queen's ambassador, Lord Montague, who had been sent to negotiate a peace. But Elizabeth did not accept his resignation, and he continued a companion of the order till his death, notwithstanding the hostile character of his subsequent proceedings towards England. Elizabeth's first chapter of the order was certainly held in St. George's Hall at Greenwich, for we find that the same afternoon she went to Baynard's Castle, the Earl of Pembroke's place, and supped with him, and after supper she took boat and was rowed up and down on the River Thames, hundreds of boats and barges rowing about her, and thousands of people thronging the banks of the river to look upon her majesty, rejoicing to see her, and partaking of the music and sights on the Thames. It seems there was an aquatic festival in honor of the welcome appearance of their new and comely liege lady on the river, for the trumpets blew, drums beat, flutes played, guns were discharged, and fireworks played off as she moved from place to place. This continued till ten o'clock at night, when the queen departed home. By thus showing herself so freely and condescendingly to her people, she made herself dear and acceptable unto them. Well, indeed, had nature qualified Elizabeth to play her part, with eclat, in the imposing drama of royalty, by the endowments of wit, eloquence, penetration, and self-possession, joined to the advantages of commanding features and a majestic presence, she had, from childhood upwards, studied the art of courting popularity, and perfectly understood how to please the great body of the people. The honest-hearted mechanical classes, won by the frank manner, in which she dispensed the cheap, but dearly prized favors of gracious words and smiles, regarded her with feelings approaching to idolatry, and as for the younger nobles and gentlemen of England, who attended her court, they were, almost to a man, eager for the opportunity of risking their lives in her service, and she knew how to improve the love and loyalty of all ranks of her subjects, to the advancement of her power and the defense of her realm. The pecuniary aids granted by her first parliament to Queen Elizabeth, though only proportioned to the extreme necessity of the crown at that period, were enormous, for, besides the tenths, first fruits, and impropriations of church property, which had been declined by Mary, and the grant of tonnage and poundage for life, they voted a subsidy of two and eight pence in the pound, on all movable goods, and four shillings on land, to be paid in two several payments. 
how such a property tax was ever gathered after a year of famine and pestilence must indeed appear a marvel to those who witnessed the irritation and inconvenience caused to the needy portion of the middle classes by the infliction of a comparatively trivial impost at present it is always easy to convince the wealthy of the expediency of sacrificing a part to save the whole therefore elizabeth and her acute premier cecil laid a heavier burden on the lords of the soil and those who derive their living from ecclesiastical property than on those whose possessions were limited to personals which at that time were chiefly the mercantile and mechanical classes the destitution of the crown having been thus relieved a series of pageants and festivities were wisely ordained by the queen as a sure means of diverting the attention of the good people of london and its neighbourhood from past troubles and present changes stowe gives a quaint account of her majesty coming in great state to st mary's spittle to hear a sermon delivered from the cross on which occasion she was attended by one thousand men in harness with shirts of mail pikes and field pieces with drums and trumpets sounding the procession was closed by morris dancers and two white bears in a cart these luckless animals were of course to furnish a cruel pageant for the recreation of the queen and her loving citizens after the sermon was ended in a letter of the fourteenth of april that eminent reformer jewel laments that the queen continued the celebration of mass in her private chapel it was not till the twelfth of may that the service was changed and the use of latin discontinued the queen observes jewel declines being styled the head of the church at which i certainly am not much displeased elizabeth assumed the title of governess of the church but she finally asserted her supremacy in a scarcely less authoritative manner than her father had done and many catholics were put to death for denying it touching the suitors of elizabeth's hand jewel tells his zurich correspondent that nothing is yet talked about the queen's marriage yet there are now courting her the king of sweden the saxon son of john frederick duke of saxony and charles the son of the emperor ferdinand to say nothing of the englishman sir william pickering i know however what i should prefer but matters of this kind as you are aware are rather mysterious and we have a common proverb that marriages are made in heaven in another letter dated may twenty second fifteen fifty nine he says that public opinion inclines towards sir william pickering a wise and religious man and highly gifted as to personal qualities jewel is the first person who mentions pickering among the aspirants for the hand of queen elizabeth he had been employed on diplomatic missions to germany and france with some credit to himself and the queen bestowed so many marks of attention upon him that the spanish ambassador as well as our good bishop and others fancied that he had as fair a chance of success as the sons of reigning princes he is also mentioned by camden as a gentleman of moderate fortune but comely person it is possible that pickering had performed some secret service for elizabeth in the season of her distress which entitled him to the delusive honor of her smiles as there is undoubtedly some mystery in the circumstance of a man scarcely of equestrian rank encouraging hope so much above his condition be this as it may he quickly vanished from the scene and was forgotten on the twenty third of may a splendid embassy from france headed by the duc de montmorency arrived for the purpose of receiving the queen's ratification of the treaty of cambresses they landed at the tower wharf and were conducted to the bishop of london's palace where they were lodged on the following day they were brought in great state by a deputation of the principal nobles of the court through fleet street to a supper banquet with the queen at her palace at westminster where they were entertained with sumptuous cheer and music till after midnight on the following day they came gorgeously apparelled to dine with her majesty and were recreated afterwards with the baiting of bears and bulls the queen's grace herself and the ambassador stood in the gallery looking on the pastime till six in the evening on the twenty sixth another bull and bear baiting was provided for the amusement of the noble envoys at paris garden and on the twenty eighth when they departed they were presented with many mastiffs for the nobler purpose of hunting their wolves 
On the 11th of June, at eight o'clock at night, the queen and her court embarked in their barges at Whitehall, and took their pleasure on the river, by rowing along the bank, and crossing over to the other side, with drums beating and trumpets sounding, and so to Whitehall again. The Londoners were so lovingly disposed to their maiden sovereign, that when she withdrew to her summer bowers at Greenwich, they were fain to devise all sorts of gallant shows, to furnish excuses for following her there, to enjoy, from time to time, the sunshine of her presence. They prepared a sort of civic tournament in honor of her majesty, July 2nd, each company supplying a certain number of men-at-arms, fourteen hundred in all, all clad in velvet and chains of gold, with guns, morris pikes, halberds and flags, and so marched they over London Bridge, into the Duke of Suffolk's Park at Southwark, where they mustered before the Lord Mayor, and in order to initiate themselves into the hardships of a campaign. They lay abroad in St. George's Field all that night. The next morning they set forward in a goodly array, and entered Greenwich Park at an early hour, where they reposed themselves to eight o'clock, and then marched down into the lawn, and mustered in their arms, all the gunners being in shirts of mail. It was not, however, till eventide that her majesty deigned to make herself visible to the doughty bands of cockaine chivalry they cannot properly be called for they had discreetly avoided exposing civic horsemanship to the mockery of the gallant equestrians of the court and trusted no other legs than their own with the weight of their valor and warlike accoutrements in addition to their velvet gabardines and chains of gold in which this midsummer bevy had bivouacked in st george's field on the preceding night. At five o'clock, the queen came into the gallery of Greenwich Park Gate, with the ambassadors, lords, and ladies, a fair and numerous company. Then the Lord Marquis of Northampton, Queen Catherine Parr's brother, whom, like Edward the Sixth, Elizabeth ever treated as an uncle. Her great uncle, Lord William Howard, Lord Admiral of England, and Lord Robert Dudley, her master of the horse, undertook to review the city muster, and to set their battles in array, to skirmish before the queen, with flourish of trumpets, alarum of drums, and melody of flutes, to encourage the counter-champions to the fray. Three onsets were given, the guns discharged on one another, the Moorish pikes encountered together with great alarm, each ran to his weapon again, and then they fell together as fast as they could, in imitation of close fight, while the queen and her ladies looked on. After all this, Mr. Chamberlain, and divers of the commons of the city, and whifflers, came before her grace, who thanked them heartily, and all the city, whereupon was given the greatest shout ever heard, with hurling up of caps, and the queen showed herself very merry. After this was a running at tilt, and lastly all departed home to London." as numerous if not as valiantly disposed a company poured down from the metropolis to woolwich on the morrow for on that day july third the queen went in state to witness the launch of a fine new ship of war which in her honor was called the elizabeth the gallantry of the city muster inspired the gentlemen of the court with loyal emulation and they determined to tilt on foot with spears before the queen also in greenwich park the challengers were three the Earl of Ormond, Sir John Perrault, and Mr. North, and there were defendants of equal prowess with lances and swords. The whole of the Queen's band of pensioners were, however, to run with spears, and preparations were made for a royal and military feat champetre, such as might be imitated with admirable effect in Windsor Park even now. It was both the policy and pleasure of the last of the Tudor sovereigns, to keep her loving metropolis in good humor, by allowing the people to participate, as far at least as looking on went, in her princely recreation. Half the popularity of Elizabeth proceeded from the care she took, that the holidays of her subjects should be merry days. If ever any person had either the gift or the style to win the hearts of the people, says Hayward, it was this queen. But to return to her July evening pageant, in the green glades of Greenwich Park. A goodly banqueting house was built up for her grace with fir poles, and decked with birch branches, and all manner of flowers, both of the field and garden, as roses, July flowers, lavender, marigolds, and all manner of strewing herbs and rushes, 
there were also tents set up for providing refreshments and a space made for the tilting about five in the afternoon came the queen with the ambassadors and the lords and ladies of her train and stood over the park gate to see the exercise of arms and afterwards the combatants chasing one another then the queen took her horse and accompanied by three ambassadors and her retinue rode to the sylvan pavilion where a costly banquet was provided for her this was succeeded by a mask and the entertainment closed with fireworks and firing of guns about midnight but while elizabeth appeared to enter into these gay scenes of festive pageantry with all the zest of a young sprightly and handsome woman who emerging suddenly from restraint retirement and neglect finds herself the delight of every eye and the idol of all hearts her mind was intent on matters of high import and she knew that the flowers with which her path was strewn concealed many a dangerous quicksand from those who looked not below the surface within one little month of the solemn ratification of the treaty of chateau cambresis by the plenipotentiaries of france in her court her right to the crown she wore had been boldly impugned by henry the second's principal minister of state the constable de montmorency who when the duc de nemours a prince nearly allied to the throne of france informed him of his intention of seeking the queen of england in marriage exclaimed do you not know that the queen dolphin has right and title to england a public demonstration of this claim was made at the jousts in honor of the espousals of the french king's sister with the duke of savoy elizabeth's oft-rejected suitor when the scotch heralds displayed the escutcheon of their royal mistress the queen of scots quartered with those of france and england which was afterwards protested against by the english ambassador throckmorton it was retorted that elizabeth had assumed the title of queen of france at her coronation a pretension too absurd as the operation of the salic law had always incapacitated females from inheriting the sceptre of that realm even when born as in the case of the daughter of louis Houtan, sole issue of a reigning monarch representing the ancient royal line of france calais the last relic of the conquests of edward the third and henry the fifth was now in the hands of the french government and although henry the second had virtually acknowledged the right of elizabeth to that town by binding himself to restore it at the end of eight years and a chimerical proposition had also been made to settle all disputes for its possession by both claimants ceding it as a marriage portion to an imaginary first-born son of elizabeth and daughter of mary stuart by francis of valois or otherwise to the son of mary and daughter of elizabeth it was mere temporizing diplomacy the mighty plan of uniting the gallic and britannic empires beneath the sceptres of francis of valois and mary of scotland had never ceased to occupy the attention of henry the second from the death of edward the sixth till his own course was suddenly cut short by the accidental wound he had received from a splinter of his opponent's lance while tilting in honor of his daughter's nuptials that event produced an important change in the fortunes of england's elizabeth she was at once delivered from the most dangerous and insidious of her foes and the consequences of the formidable alliance between france and spain for although the rival claims of his consort to the throne of england were asserted by francis the second he was a sickly youth inheriting neither the talents nor the judgment of his father the nominal power of france and scotland both passed into the hands of mary stuart's uncles the princes of lorraine and guise but the rival factions both political and religious by which they were opposed and impeded on every side deprived them of the means of injuring elizabeth who on her part actively employed agents as numerous as the arms of briarius in sowing the seeds of discord and nursing every root of bitterness that sprang up in those unhappy realms the fulminations of john knox against female government had incited the reform party to resist the authority of the queen dowager mary of lorraine to whom the regent arran had in 1555 reluctantly resigned his office the queen regent after an ill-judged fruitless struggle to crush the progress of the reformation summoned the earl of arran who had recently accepted the french dukedom of chatel harrow 
to her aid as the most powerful peer in scotland and the next in succession to the throne on which in fact he had from the first cast a longing regard he was the head of the potent house of hamilton but his designs had been checked by the rival faction of the earl of lennox and subsequently by the more popular and able party of the young queen's illegitimate brother the earl of murray and now although he gave his lukewarm succor to the queen regent in her need he suffered himself to be deluded by the english cabinet with the idea that the crown might be transferred from the brows of his absentee sovereign to his own or rather to those of his heir the earl of arran to whom queen elizabeth had been offered in her childhood by her father henry the eighth there is every reason to believe that cecil seriously meditating uniting the island crowns by a marriage between his royal mistress and young arran if the hamilton party in scotland had succeeded in deposing queen mary and placing him on the throne the young earl who had been colonel of the scotch guards at paris had in anticipation of a more brilliant destiny embraced the reform religion and as it is supposed at the suggestion and with the aid of throckmorton elizabeth's ambassador at paris absconded from the french service and after visiting geneva to arrange his plans with the leaders of that church he came privately to england the secret and confidential conference which he held with queen elizabeth on the sixth of august must have taken place at the ancient palace of eltham where she arrived on the preceding day arran was young and handsome but weak-minded at times indeed subject to the dire malady which clouded the mental perceptions of his father and brothers just the subject for the royal coquette and her wily premier to render a ready tool in any scheme connected with hopes of aggrandizement for himself as the plan and limits of this work will not admit of launching into the broad stream of general history the events of the scotch campaign which commenced with elizabeth sending an army and a fleet to aid the insurgent lords of the congregation in defending themselves against the french forces called in by the queen regent and ended by giving her a predominant power in the councils of that distracted realm cannot be detailed here the manuscripts in the state paper office attest the fact that the lord james mary's illegitimate brother afterwards so celebrated as the regent murray and the principal leaders of the popular party were the pensioners of elizabeth the treaty of edinburgh was framed according to her interest and proved of course unsatisfactory to the queen of scots and her consort i will tell you freely said mary's uncle the cardinal of lorraine to the english ambassador throckmorton the scots do perform no part of their duties the king and queen have the names of their sovereigns and your mistress hath the effect and obedience the congregational parliament had dispatched a solemn embassy to elizabeth consisting of lethington and the earls of morton and glencairn to entreat her to join in marriage with the earl of arran the cardinal lorraine in allusion to the errand of these nobles said to throckmorton this great legation goeth for the marriage of your queen with the earl of arran what shall she have with him i think her heart too great to marry with such a one as he is and one of the queen's subjects it was not in elizabeth's nature to return an immediate or direct answer in any matter of state policy especially if involving a proposal of marriage the unexpected death of the royal husband of the queen of scots probably hastened elizabeth's decision with regard to her scottish suitor and she declined the offer in terms of courtesy thanking the nobles at the same time for their good will in offering her the choicest person they had arran immediately afterwards became as doubtless elizabeth was aware he would the suitor of his own fair sovereign the widowed mary stuart it will now be necessary to return to the chronological order of the personal history of elizabeth which we have a little antedated in putting the reader in possession of the result of the earl of arran's courtship the queen had many wooers in the interim both among foreign princes and her subjects of these henry fitz Allen, earl of arundel claims the first mention as the foremost in rank and consequence he was the premier earl of england and at that time there was but one peer of the ducal order his son-in-law thomas howard duke of norfolk 
as the last male of the illustrious house of Fitzalan, he boasted the blood of the plantagenets and of the ancient royal line of charlemagne and saint louis and he was nearly allied in blood to the queen as a descendant of woodville earl of rivers his possessions were proportioned at his high rank and proud descent he had been materially instrumental in placing the crown on the head of the rightful heiress queen mary at the time of the brief usurpation of the hapless lady jane grey and though his ardent loyalty to the late queen and his zeal for the old religion had induced him at first to take part against elizabeth at the time of the wyatt rebellion we have shown how soon his manly heart revolted in her favor and that she was in all probability indebted to his powerful protection for the preservation of her life from the malignant and lawless practices of gardiner and his party it is certain that he forfeited the favor of mary by the boldness with which he afterwards stood forth in the court the council and the senate as the advocate of the captive princess and that he was employed in embassies to foreign courts to keep him from dangerous enterprises at home his only son whom he had offered to contract to elizabeth in marriage in the time of her great adversity was no more and the stout earl who had not exceeded his forty-seventh year recalling perchance some of the artful compliments to himself with which the royal maid had declined to enter into an engagement with his heir hastened home from brussels on the death of her sister and presented himself as a candidate for her hand of all the lovers of elizabeth his attachment was probably the most sincere as it commenced in the season of persecution he now as lord steward of the royal household enjoyed many opportunities of preferring his suit and albeit the maiden majesty of england had no intention of becoming the third wife of one of her subjects old enough to be her father she gave him sufficient encouragement to excite the jealousy of the other courtiers if not to afford himself reasonable hopes of success about the eighth of august fifteen fifty nine the queen honored him with a visit at nonsuch one of the royal residences of which he appears to have obtained a lease from queen mary here on the sunday night he entertained her majesty with a sumptuous banquet and a mask accompanied with military music till midnight on monday a splendid supper was provided for the royal guest who previously from a stand erected for her in the further park witnessed a course at night the children of st paul's school under the direction of their music master sebastian performed a play which was succeeded by a costly banquet with music the queen was served on richly gilded plate the entertainment lasted till the unusual late hour of three in the morning and the earl presented her majesty with a cupboard of plate which was the first of those expensive offerings elizabeth habitually accustomed herself to receive and sometimes almost extorted from her nobles by feeding the hopes of arundel elizabeth obtained his vote and influence in the council and senate whenever she had a point to carry even with regard to the peaceful establishment of the reformed church the royal weapon of coquetry was also exercised though in a playful and gracious manner towards her former cruel foe paulet marquis of winchester the lord treasurer by whom she was splendidly entertained at his house at basing soon after her accession to the throne at her departure her majesty merrily bemoaned herself that he was so old for else by my troth said she if my lord treasurer were but a young man i would find it in my heart to have him for my husband before any man in england when the announcement of the marriage of her former suitor philip the second with her fair namesake of france was made to elizabeth she pretended to feel mortified and complained to the ambassador of the inconstancy of his master who could not she said wait four short months to see if she would change her mind she always kept the portrait of this prince by her bedside it has been said as a token of regard but the probability is that she found it there when she took possession of the state apartments occupied by the late queen her sister the person however who held the most conspicuous place in her majesty's favor and through whose hands the chief performance and patronage of her government flowed was lord robert dudley at that period a married man he was born in the same auspicious hour with the queen 
with whom his destiny became inseparably connected from the time they were both prisoners in the tower from the first month of her accession to the throne elizabeth so remarkable for her frugal distribution of rewards and honors showered wealth and distinctions on him she conferred the office of master of horse on him in the first instance with the fee of one hundred marks per annum and the lucrative employment of head commissioner for compounding the fines of such as were desirous of declining the order of knighthood and he was soon after invested with the garter and made constable of windsor castle and forest and keeper of the great park during life his wife amy robsart a wealthy heiress whom he had wedded with great pomp and publicity during the reign of edward the sixth was not allowed by him to appear among the noble matronage of elizabeth's court lest she should mar the sunshine of his favour by reminding his royal mistress of the existence of so inconvenient a personage elizabeth's undisguised partiality for the handsome dudley excited the jealousy of the other members of her council and even the politic cecil could not forbear hazarding a biting jest to elizabeth on the subject when he told her of the misalliance of her cousin francis duchess of suffolk with her equerry adrian stokes what exclaimed her majesty has she married her horse-keeper yea madam replied the premier and she says you would like to do the same with yours cecil's innuendo was undoubtedly meant to warn the queen that her intimacy with dudley was likely to prove injurious to her reputation and derogatory to the dignity of the crown sir thomas challoner her majesty's representative at the court of spain had in a private postscript to one of his dispatches addressed the following intimation to the premier on this delicate subject i assure you sir these folks are broad-minded where i spoke of one too much in favour as they esteem i think ye guess whom they named if ye do not i will upon my next letter write further to tell you what i conceive as i count the slander most false so a young princess cannot be too wary what countenance or familiar demonstration she maketh more to one than another i grudge no man's service in the realm worth the entertainment with such a tale of obloquy or occasion of speech to such men of evil will are ready to find faults challoner goes on to express the vexation he as an attached servant of the queen feels at the impediment such reports are likely to cause in her majesty's marriage to the detriment of her whole realm ministering matter for lewd tongues to discant upon and breeding contempt all this he states is written in strict confidence to his friend cecil and entreats him to keep it to himself he then alludes to an overture of marriage which had been made to the queen by the king of spain in behalf of his cousin the archduke charles the emperor ferdinand's second son a prince of noble qualities and stainless reputation he was a catholic and elizabeth on that account probably or mistrusting the quarter whence the proposal came had returned an evasive and unsatisfactory answer challoner evidently considered that the indifference of the queen proceeded from her predilection in favour of the person to whom he had just alluded and appears anxious lest the honourable alliance should be lost consider says he how ye deal now in the emperor's matter much dependeth on it here they hang in expectation as men desirous it should go forward but as yet they have small hope in mine opinion be it said to you only the affinity is great and honourable the amity necessary to stop and cool many enterprises ye need not fear his greatness should overrule you he is not a philip but better for us than a philip the suit of this accomplished prince was afterwards preferred in due form to elizabeth by count elphinstone the emperor's ambassador and she protested openly that of all the illustrious marriages that had been offered to her there was not one greater or that she affected more than that of the archduke charles and expressed a desire to see him in england it was generally expected that the prince would come under an assumed character to visit the court of england and obtain a first sight of his royal lady by stealth but this chivalric project well worthy of the poetic age which gave birth to spencer shakespeare and sir philip sidney was never carried into effect their differences as to their jarring creeds 
as elizabeth demanded conformity to the protestant form of worship appeared insuperable and for a time put an end to the negotiations though they were subsequently renewed as will be related in due course meantime the suit of a royal candidate of the reformed religion for her hand was renewed by the king of sweden in behalf of his heir prince eric the ambassador chosen to plead his cause was john duke of finland the second son of the swedish monarch a prince of singular talents and address and possessed of great personal attractions on the twenty seventh of september this distinguished envoy landed at harwich and on the fifth of october he was met and welcomed at colchester in the name of the queen by the earl of oxford and lord robert dudley by whom he was conducted to london at the corner of grace church street leaden hall he was received by the marquis of northampton lord ambrose dudley and a fair company of ladies as well as gentlemen in rich array with the escort of one hundred yeomen on horseback with trumpets sounding he proceeded over london bridge to the bishop of winchester's palace which was appointed for his abode it being the custom in the good old times to quarter any foreigner of distinguished rank and his train on some wealthy noble or prelate for board and entertainment seven days after the prince of sweden came by water to the court with his guard and was honorably received by many noble personages at the hall door where the guard stood in their rich coats in a line which extended to the presence chamber where the queen received him with the honors due to a royal visitor and welcomed him with great cordiality whenever he went in state to court he threw handfuls of money among the populace saying he gave silver but his brother would give gold the swede and charles the son of the emperor observes bishop jewel are courting at a most marvellous rate but the swede is most in earnest for he promises mountains of silver in case of success the lady however is probably thinking of an alliance nearer home in november there were great jousts at the queen's palace the lord robert and lord hunston were the challengers who wore scarves of white and black the defendants were lord ambrose dudley and others wearing scarves of red and yellow sarcenet on the last day of the merry year of fifteen fifty nine a play was acted in court before the queen but we learn that the license usually showed on such occasions being abused in this instance they acted something so distasteful to her majesty that they were commanded to break off and were superseded by a mask and dancing on the first of january prince john of sweden came gorgeously apparelled to the court to offer the new year's greeting to her majesty his retinue wore velvet jerkins and rich gold chains it was an equestrian procession and his guards carried halberts in their hands that day her majesty's silk woman mistress montague brought her for her new year's gift a pair of knit black silk stockings the queen after wearing them a few days was so much pleased with them that she sent for mistress montague and asked her from whence she had them and if she could help her to any more i made them very carefully on purpose only for your majesty said she and seeing these please you so well i will presently set more in hand do so replied the queen for indeed i like silk stockings well because they are pleasant fine and delicate and henceforth i will wear no more cloth stockings and from that time to her death the queen never more wore cloth hose but only silk stockings these knit silk stockings were imitations of some which had been previously sent from spain perhaps manufactured by the moors it may be observed that elizabeth on her accession to the throne considering it no longer expedient to mortify her inordinate love of dress by conforming to the self-denying costume of the more rigid order of reformers who then began to be known by the name of puritans passed from one extreme to the other and indulged in a greater excess of finery and elaborate decoration than was ever paralleled by any other queen of england regnant or consort horace walpole speaking of her portraits observes that there is not one that can be called beautiful the profusion of ornaments with which they are loaded are marks of her continual fondness for dress while they entirely exclude all grace and leave no more room for a painter's genius than if he had been employed to copy an indian idol completely composed of bands and necklaces 
a pale roman nose a head of hair loaded with crowns and powdered with diamonds a stiff ruff a vaster fardingale and a bushel of pearls are the features by which everybody knows at once the pictures of elizabeth it is observable that her majesty thought enormity of dress a royal prerogative for in fifteen seventy nine an order was made in the star chamber that no person should use or wear excessive long cloaks as of late be used and before two years past hath not been used in this realm no persons to wear such great ruffs about their necks to be left off such monstrous undecent attiring in her father's reign who dictated everything from religion to fashions he made an act prohibiting the use of cloth of gold silver or tinsel satin silk or cloth mixed with gold any sable fur velvet embroidery in gowns or outermost garments except for persons of distinction dukes marquises earls or gentlemen and knights that had two hundred and fifty pounds per annum this act was renewed second of elizabeth no one who had less than a hundred pounds per annum was to wear satin or damask or fur of conies none not worth twenty pounds per annum or two hundred pounds capital to wear any fur save lamb nor cloth above ten shillings the yard the record of presents made by elizabeth to the ladies of her court is scanty especially at the early part of her reign but in a curious manuscript wardrobe book of that queen in the possession of sir thomas phillips baronet appears this item delivered the thirtieth of april anno quatuor regina elizabeth to the lady wodehouse one loose gown of black velvet embroidered overwarth and cut between the borders with a lozenge cut lined with sarcenet and fustian and edged with luzarnes and one french kirtle of purple satin raised lined with purple taffeta belonging to the late queen mary End of section 12.